If you're watching this video, you're probably aware of the YouTube content that we've been producing on this channel for the past five years. And what you may not know is we actually produce way more content every year on our Instagram and our social media than we do on our YouTube. So that what this video is, is a compilation of the majority of our content that we've produced on social media in the year 2021, all slapped together into one long 10 plus hour video. Hope you guys enjoy. Scan around. Through one, we've been at the far car. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, my footing a little bit there we've got one delta three charlies three alphas and we'll be able to throw all this kit on pretty quick this is the eagle industries little active shooter bag stayed in place up front where i need it not flying all around with the strap and then running this wolf upper the only thing i should have done is attack mag All right, cold start pistol drill. Bunch of movement, running some walls. This far guy, two elf. Definitely uh, saw some my dot go to the right. A couple of targets with this guy. They had a makeup. This guy was static on the line of the Charlie. Guy with the walls running the wall, two alphas, and then jumping out, keeping my position open, two alphas. 
in the time of 9.92. So we're getting a little further away. The height over bore will matter, matter less. Um, that's gonna be the same thing, three rounds. So I'm gonna shoot, 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 turn, high ready, get to there, and uh, here we get. Stand by. of it is if you take two tenths of a second longer on basically any shot it's a hit the hit probability goes up to like 95 percent if you take that two tenths of a second longer which i should have done uh, my optic was like right there and i just flinched it up so that two tenths all right that's good um the only thing all that's good the only thing you can work on and that just takes time He's like leaving as soon as like faster, less hesitation. Yeah. But you're also I'll try to get the safety. The safety, on the yeah, free move, and so that's fine. Um, so that's good. Now let's do uh, back to front. So now you're starting slow, right? And you, and you run up there, and you're gonna want to shoot really fast because you're closer. But that circle's still eh, kind of small. You'll want to still shoot it nice. All right. All right. Three. Uh, middle right. Three. Uh, middle right. Shoot ready. Stand by. I dropped one here and I think I dropped one over there too. Yeah. Uh, All right. hold on. Not too bad. But this is just 10 rounds, watching the dot, pulling the gun. Oh, yeah, I didn't talk about that. Are you pulling the gun tight in your body? Okay. Sometimes I think you but are. I kind of, some, uh, sometimes a little loose. Sometimes down. you're taking what you get. You're running from high ready and you're just like, whatever you have, you take it yeah. and then the gun jumps more. Um, but we want to have that good positive pressure into my shoulder because that helps keep any of the wobbling from back here right. from happening. So 10 rounds, nice and consistent and smooth. All right. Should be ready. Yep. Stand by. Are you ready? Stand by. Shot that, nine, shot that. Do 11. What? I thought it might you have been nine, but it didn't You shot be 11. that like pretty quick, but what, what did your reticle look like? It looked pretty decent except for the one I dipped and drove it. Dipped and drove it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But your reticle, like for the most part, is it going straight up or is it like up off to the right? Oh, pretty much straight up. Pretty much straight up. That's pretty good. Yeah, generally because you have like a hair, more. A hair right ish. A hair right ish. Yeah. And, and that's because I have all this stuff, you know, holding the gun on the left that it wants to go to what they say path of least resistance because right. they want to get all fancy but um it's going off to the right because i got stuff on this side i don't have stuff on this side um so what i like to do just like we do with the mouse or like bringing it to recoil down i do the same thing as soon as i fire i'm like bringing the gun back i fire and i bring the gun back and it, i bring it back is a little like it goes up i bring down and i bring left slightly so it looks like this basically okay i don't same know thing that i'm mouse. actively pushing down Firing. With the mouse or with the, or with you them. know exactly how much you're doing <laughs> okay, with the mouse. Now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This. I'm, I'm this, I'm yeah. this yeah. run. Yeah, no, and, and then for every gun, it's a little different. Some of my guns I don't have to, and then some guns like like 308s, so I'm like no, really I definitely, muscling it. I could definitely drive it more, and that's what I tried to do, and I just pushed it. It's good. Head foot placement. Gonna make up on this guy. Huh, interesting. That was there before. It's these. It's weird. No, what? No, no, no. Those were from that target. So I've got him, him, and him. That makes sense. So you were zinging him. It's like, there's no way. Oh, yeah, it's him. So it's this guy, this guy, because I did a makeup. And those were from earlier. Oh boy. Uh, got two A's on the move. 
Uh, uh. Uh, should be A's. Alpha, alpha. Um. What was the time? Uh, eight, five, eight, five. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. Two alphas. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not getting my arm set, so I'm not controlling my recoil. All right, is there anything else? Well, I'm just missing, you know, that too. Alpha, alpha, you did three and a few. Right, you, all, you had some, some, you forgot a little bit what your course of fire was. Uh, you sprinted into certain positions, uh, arm shot, body shot. You fired an extra. Yeah, because I knew, I knew I hit a body. Yeah, wait on here. You may have doubled up. I'm not sure. I don't see that one. But, um, and then this guy. Body. <sighs> this guy's kind of shot up. He'll be a little hard to track. Miss. And then, uh, I think I only tried two. So some of it, well, some of what it was. There. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I put it Right. Head. I completely lost my uh, optic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just take that takes some time. So, and you were doing a little bit of a, you were doubling it. So you were getting a good sight picture. And then doubles happen. And then yeah, and then doubles happen. Uh, so you're not seeing a consistent like sight picture, 4K image. You were seeing like 320p, Alpha, Charlie. That one's not bad. Uh, this is the other far guy. Alpha. Oh, no. I already marked him. No, no, no. Uh, I already marked him. Uh, it could, could be one of those. I think it is. So two ways like him. Body way over here, alpha. That's the double tap and find him out. Yeah. And no. then the same thing here. A little foot, foot cross back there, not great. Two Bravo. I mean, oh. an alpha Bravo here. Uh, Charlie, technically, but yes. Oh, you know what else? Just... Right, this guy. Uh, alpha Charlie. What was the time with that? Nine. So about the same as a rifle. Yeah. Uh, Take it more. Yep. And that's because this force of fire is so close range, and I can move faster with just the pistol out, uh, out the, on the line, off of Charlie, and then add the rest.
All right, so what we have is the BNT USW Glock frame. And basically what I did is engage at about 45, 50 meters on a single target. We're gonna check that out, see what's going on. I did go for it really fast as part of the experiment. But what we have zipping on in, alpha, 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 into that position. Got the endpoint acro on here. So five rounds, real fast, back there at 50. Way faster than I shoot with this normal handgun. Charlie, alpha, headshot, headshot. Uh, probably one up here. Not exactly sure which one it would have been. So four on paper at 50, quick, in 4.7 seconds. Half second splits. Three, Charlie, Charlie, alpha. Uh, on the move, alpha, alpha, alpha. I think I had to make up. Delta. Then this guy running on in real fast. Charlie, Charlie, alpha, alpha. That might have been from earlier. Or maybe I did put four. So, pretty cool little setup. There's a lot of misconceptions on the market to what a PCC is what it should do and where it fits in for the average prepared citizen and i just want to talk about pdws versus pccs and kind of what's going on so right now there's a lot of people who are wanting to get smaller weapons or different kinds of weapons that are not traditional m4s and what a lot of people are seeing from the uspsa you know three gun community are the pccs so pistol caliber carbine rifles and there's a lot of companies that have started to make them now the problem with the competition community creating this thing is it's creating all these weapons that people are thinking are useful defensive uh, weapons that somehow fit into some sort of mission or operation or whatever the reality is a 14 and a half inch pinned pcc is so big you may as well run a rifle caliber with a standard AR. And if you're gonna do a nine mil style smaller gun, you don't wanna get something large that was made for USPSA, you actually want something that was designed as a PDW. Not designed for competition, but actually designed to be as small as possible while still giving more capability than a standard handgun. And a lot of people have forgotten the term PDW and what a PDW is. So what is a PDW? It stands for personal defense weapon. But essentially what a PDW is, is a weapon that is a step up from a handgun that is still small enough you can conceal it in lots of you know different kinds of bags or having to get something specialized. Uh, but it gives you, generally speaking, a stock for an extra point of contact that allows you to be a little bit more accurate. Uh, this is especially effective for a shooter who's not real experienced on handguns. You can hand something like this to most people. They can hit a target much easier than actually running a handgun where there's a lot more variables uh, that are occurring. So a PDW is basically something that's a little bit bigger than a handgun, gives you a stock, gives you the ability to run some different attachments or maybe a suppressor a little easier, but is not going into the realm of a carbine of a 10 and a half inch or even a 300 blackout. Uh, you're still something nice and small with the reason being I can conceal it in backpacks, regular bags and have something nice and small. So this is not designed for competition. I mean, this is a tiny barrel. It's not super optimized, but what this is optimized for is carrying it in bags. And it gives me some extra capability over a handgun. So these are what are considered PDWs, proper PDWs, proper pistol cal caliber carbines, not 16 inch guns, because if I wanna run a 16 inch gun, I'm gonna run 5.56, I'm gonna run an actual rifle. So there's a lot of good options out there on the market. There's a couple things to take into consideration. Uh, K model guns like this, like this MP5K or the MPXK or something like uh, the Glock chassis out there are going to get you really the smallest package uh, as far as a PDW goes. Um, like a full size MP5 is a little bit bigger. There's some other like Scorpions and other stuff out there uh, that are starting to get a little bit larger. But K model weapons, Glock chassis, um, any uh, weapon that is mag fed into the pistol grip is going to give you basically a minimal size to fit into bags. This is a TP9, a BNT, uh, mag fed through the grip. So if I remove this massive suppressor, I'm down to about uh, this long right here. And that's actually about as long as this BNT uh, USW. So this will fit in pretty much everything. If I want to run 20 round mags, I can fit that into bags a little bit easier. Once the gun comes out, I can transition to a 30 rounder, uh, like with this BNT mag, 30 rounder MP5, 30 round Glock mag, and I'm set. 
suppressors, uh, th these weapons can be great suppressor hosts, a lot better than handguns. Uh, that's one, one area where the MP5K really shines. Uh, so I do prefer running, if I'm running a pistol suppressor, not running it on a handgun, but trying to run it on something like this. Uh, not relying on a pistol with like a swing length system and all that good stuff. So, with all that said, if you're looking into PDWs, there's a lot of cool options on the market, but if you truly want a real PDW, Stick to PDW class weapons, small, tiny, K, not weird competition 14.5s with like folding stocks. That's not a PDW. That's a PCC, but it's not a PDW. Not bad for a first bag deployment with the Glock USW by BNT. Kind of checked them all a little bit left. That's sort of a weird grip on the gun, kind of grabbing the X300. But we're going to clean that up. Could be zero, but I don't think so. Two, one, three. And I shifted them all to the left on that guy. And then we have three alphas. -hoo -hoo. Holy cow. This thing's sick. Yeah, that's a whole lot faster. That's a one, five, nine. And then let's check our splits. This is a stock Glock. So a one, eight, a one, six, a one, eight, a one, seven. Not bad. Could be better. Uh, but we've got three alphas. And then uh, three alphas. Look at his split. Nice. Nice. It's a little too wobbly when you're running it in pistol form. Because uh, you have all this extra weight, so it flops too much. Then a standard Glock.
All right. That's probably one of the most fun guns I've shot in a while. The BNT USW Glock chassis. It is an SBR, unconstitutional and all that. But I've got an X300 Surefire Rider, Gen 3 Glock 17, whatever size magazines that I want, and an Aimpoint Acro. Can support a sling as well. So I've got a Ballistic Advantage 16 inch upper right here. It's a pretty inexpensive budget option. I've got a, a BCM handguard that I threw on here. Normally these can come with like Magpul handguards and stuff like that. So a fairly inexpensive upgrade that gives you some key mod, a little more slim, a little more modern. A Surefire on a light bar. And then this ACOG is actually pretty cool. Uh, this is the non-fiber optic, non-battery powered. It's just straight up a fixed four and that's it. And these can be had for, I think I paid about 750 for these. So for a grade A optic, uh, with really good durability, really good glass clarity. Uh, that's pretty cheap for a fixed four power optic. I know some of y'all are like, oh, that's not budget at all. My budget's $100. Well, budget is also a little bit relative, but as far as, you know, Trigicon products go, this is a very budget product. So, a uh, pretty, you know, basic gun, basic setup, 16 inch front sight post, A2 flash hider, a compensator. Uh, let's run a drill with this and see what happens. Stand by. Little running and gunning with the SACOG. The bend and aiming concept does not work for me as I'm left eye dominant, so I am having to shut one eye to get that four by on these targets, but you still run it pretty fast. Fundamentals are key. If you suck, you suck. Green. Let's talk about drawing the pistol. So there's a lot of different people out there that do different things when it comes down to drawing a pistol. But it's a lot simpler than people like to make it sound. Basically, I got my gun in my holster, here outside the waistband in a rag rock holster. I have where my arms are gonna end up when I'm at full extension, looking through my optic, able to shoot. I need this gun to start from the holster here and end up in this position right here where I'm at my extension, where I have my sight picture and I can start shooting. So I'm not going to draw the pistol and dip low. I'm not going to come up and scoop over the top. I'm not going to draw all the way up to here and then press out because all of that is excess motion. I wanna take this pistol from this location as soon as I've cleared the holster and take it straight to where I need to be where I'm at extension and can actually shoot. So it's a straight line from here to the holster. So basically what it looks like going nice and slow, I draw the pistol straight to where my head is, straight to where the optic will align with the target. And that's what I'm trying to do 99% of the time. So as soon as the gun is at extension, the optic is right where I want it. And I'm having to finesse the sight picture as minimally as possible. I'm trying not to deviate the pistol in any way, adding any extra motion, because that's going to affect my sight picture as soon as it lands right here when I'm finished with my draw. So it looks something like this.
just like that straight line right to here where my extension is where i have my good form my good grip my good sight picture i'm taking my shots so a lot of people ask how can i control recoil on a pistol well well it's relatively simple although it is a little bit tricky to master and it takes a little bit of time Recoil on the handgun is really based on two things. I want to have good leverage and friction on the weapon. Since the recoil and the uh, basically all the movement in the gun is due to the slide reciprocating, I want to take my right hand, my dominant hand, or my left hand if I'm left-handed, wrong-handed, and I want to put that up as high as I can in the beaver tail of the pistol, the tang of the pistol, which will vary per manufacturer, model, all that good stuff, to counteract all this movement with the slide. Now what I want my support hand to do, my opposite hand, is to fill as many gaps on this side of the gun as possible. Now there are a couple of nuances here. Some people think, oh, well the more aggressive I grip my pistol and do something crazy, the better, better I'll control recoil. I used to do this early on when I was shooting, but what I realized is, and what I learned is, by having basically extra pressure on one side of the gun, uh, it was causing me to actually push the pistol too aggressively to one side. So I didn't have consistent sight rise and fall. So what I ended up doing later on was actually bringing my hand back into a more neutral position that equaled more of what my, my dominant hand was actually doing. So that allowed the pistol to actually rise and fall consistently versus getting pushed off to one side. So basically what that looks like for me, I have this thumb nice and high uh, into the beaver tail, the pistol. That leaves good room for this hand to come in. Me to this thumb, the drumstick of my thumb, ends up filling in right here where all this uh, sort of gap is. My thumb is running alongside the frame and the slide. If you touch the slide, that's fine. You're not going to cause a malfunction. You're not going to lose your thumb. It's not a revolver. You're not going to like gone. And that's what my grip looks like. My uh, index finger on my support hand does kind of curve around here, kind of like a little velociraptor claw, but it actually does not get in the way of being off the trigger or then getting on the trigger. I should go over this side. So this is exactly what my grip looks like, and that allows me to have consistent side rise and fall. Just like that. And then, later on, and this is something I'll occasionally do, there's varying opinions on it, because my sight rise and fall is consistent, and the recoil, and I know the recoil of this pistol is consistent with this 124 grain ammo, I actually will take my shot and actually kind of force the gun back on target so I can keep that gun a little bit flatter and speed up the whole process of the gun firing and then the dot slowly coming down and returning to where it initially started. That takes some time, that takes some training. There's varied opinions on it. Do it, don't do it, let the dot do its own thing. Don't force it, force it, whatever. That's something you can figure out, you can decide on your own, you can play with. But for the most part, what we're looking for is consistent sight rise and fall. Come straight up, come straight down. Straight up, straight down. Not off to the right, not off to the left, not dipping right after the shot where you fire and then dip the pistol. We just want it to fire and come back down. Some of those walls a little funky. There's a little better. Go off, I made it up. Made it up faster for some matter. Waffles. Arriving into position. Charlie. Two waffles. Not bad. Not bad.
396. Malfunction there, 599. 80 meter, one reload one with the EOTech G33 aim point on a lower third. And that is in a 465. Seven reload six at ten yards with this CTSFO MCX build. That was in an eight twenty-two. Small circle, big circle. Two six one. Seven six seven. One make up two nine four. So I've got the new EOTech 3x magnifier and by looking, comparing it to the older G33, it is basically a shorter, thicker boy. Uh, it's just a little more condensed, a little bit fatter. And this, I haven't shot with this yet, so we're gonna run some rounds here at about, uh, we're about 180 yards on a C zone uh, with this little MCX build. Uh, I'm gonna start off with this, uh, this guy first, the G33. We're gonna do a few rounds. Super simple, throw it onto the gun. I have a T2 on here. Uh, you don't have to run EOTech optics with an EOTech magnifier. You can run anything. I actually really like this combo right here. You've got your windage and elevation little turrets here. They are a little exposed. I hit them all the time and then I get the red dot uh, not centered within the magnifier. So we can compare the G4, uh, whatever model this is, three by against this one. G33, eye relief is about two inches, something like that. All right, so there's four hits right there. Not too bad, eye relief is nice. Rip that apart. And I'm not measuring like objective, field of view, all that rubbish. Fat boy. Now my concern here is because this is a shorter, more condensed magnifier, the eye relief is gonna be sucked up forward. Uh, it should still be about two inches on this guy. And that could potentially be a problem. All right, so that's perfect right there. Wow, that's actually more like three inches. So a little more eye relief. Glass is clear, but this isn't a good comparison. Turrets. Turrets are more recessed, which is good, so you don't bump them by accident. And this is a little stiffer, but it also hasn't been used. Hmm. So that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, it comes with a spacer that can go up underneath it to get it a little taller. Uh, when I mounted it with the spacer, it was super tall, like more like for a 193 which is similar uh, for the spacer for the older G33. Uh, so I don't run the spacer at all, even with a lower third. Uh, it can still get hits, uh, obviously. It can still work. So, uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm going to have to play with these to see which I prefer. Glass clarity, I'll have to compare this against a new one because uh, this one's like older and more 
uh, more crazy as far as dirt and scratch. And this one's actually cracked slightly up in the top uh, for one of the shoots that I went on. But they're very similar. Uh, they're very similar as far as you know everything going on. And then it, uh, I'm not sure about the weight. They feel about the same though. So, hmm. interesting. Thick boy. Very thick. So this is a pretty cool setup right here. This is actually my first Polymer 80. This is their retro Glock 17 that they did with Lipsies. And it is in fact feels very similar to a authentic vintage uh, Gen 1 Glock 17. Uh, the cool thing about the Gen 1 Glock 17s, at least from a sort of a retro perspective, is they did not have a rail on the frame. Uh, so there were a few companies out there that actually made some light adapters, uh, Surefire being one of them with this ancient giant piece of equipment that's like five lumens, attaches to the frame here in the front with some little screws, is extremely flimsy as you can see, and runs a tape switch all the way here to the grip, which is pretty rad, and then there's a constant on button here on the side. So what I'm going to do is shoot uh, five rounds, this, these will be the first rounds I've shot with this pistol, do a little reload, another five rounds uh, into the circle target, and we'll see what happens. Stand by. With a retro fanny pack. Okay, not really. It's a uh, Imdom USA, but you know. So what I have here is my 416 and an Eberly stock cherry bomb bag. Now what's cool about this bag is it's uh, just about the right length to fit most of my shorty guns, 10.3s, this is a 10.4, uh, with a shorter stock or a folding stock, NCX and stuff like that, um, without the bag looking super tactical. So I kind of want to show you how it works. So I've got my 416 here with the Charlie uh, retracting stock, which is not proving to be great, um, but it does make everything a little shorter. So I've got our sling, I bind it up like so. I set the gun up, if I'm doing a dedicated like bag gun, I try to leave my accessories on top and bottom. What this does is it keeps everything streamlined for bag use. I'm not fattening up one side of the gun or I'm putting a light on you know this side of the gun. The stock folds on this side, so now I've got fat, fat, and then obviously the gun itself. Uh, so this keeps everything real streamlined. So when I insert it into the bag, into the rifle pocket, it's just nice and flat inside the pocket itself. This bag has a lot of compartments here in the inside, which eh, I like and I don't like. But uh, I can have I have two mag carriers right here, so I can run a P mag or regular stain mag or whatever. Uh, what these mags actually do uh, that I was noticing is they add some weight to the flap. So as soon as you open this up, it kind of spills open, allowing you to grab the weapon, slide it on out and you're good to go. So this will just zip straight up like this. And this gun, if I changed out the muzzle device, it's a little bit long to like an A2, the stock would be fully covered. Right now I have a little bit of the stock poking out and I'm set. Not too shabby.
All right. So, I pulled this little MCX out of that Everly Sock Cherry Bomb bag. Put rounds in him on the move. I know that was one of them. Moving in. They're in the arm here. To Charlie's. Mike, Mike. And this guy, handgun, we've got hand, alpha, alpha, Charlie, arm, Mike. That amount of speed, it's not bad. I was thinking about that the whole time, like, no, my rain! So I'm gonna do a real quick down and dirty on how to use a sling. So I've got our T-Rex sling right here. It is bound to the weapon using one of the included shot cord little retainers that I have positioned here on the handguard. So once the sling is deployed, uh, just like so, what I'm going to do is put it on around my neck. Now from here, the sling is being held to you. Sling holds the rifles to the body. Um, it's not bad. I can shoot. I can transition with it simply on my neck. Although it does mean that the rifle is a little more loose to spin around and have a mind of its own while I'm going and doing things or going hands-free trying to do something with the hands. So if I want to keep the rifle held to me a little more effectively, I will simply take my support arm, swim it on through. So now the sling is being retained more on my back, not off of my neck. What this allows me to do is when I transition to a handgun, the rifle is being much more held back here on my back versus being able to slide around in the front and do all kinds of stuff. If I wanna actually put this on my back, it's quite simple. My left arm will come through, my support arm, and back to my neck. My dominant arm now comes through, I grab the rail, move it around to my back, at which point I can tighten or loosen. I'm already tightened and I am set. And this is where you can adjust your sling to be uh, really tight once you're in this position, and then you loosen it uh, once you go back to your firing position. Uh, now, as far as where the sling should be attached, I like attaching the sling here near the pistol grip and here closer to the upper receiver and the mag well. There's a couple reasons for that. If you attach your sling here to the end of the stock, which is very traditional, um, the issue that you start to run into is as you're shooting and uh, collapsing your stock over your shoulder in a confined space, as soon as I go to punch out, look what the sling is doing. It's not real mobile for real fast, high speed, dynamic type stuff. If I jerk my rifle to a high ready, I am now pulling the sling against my body or my kit. There's a lot of friction and I can get all bound up in the sling. So that's why I like having the sling positioned here. I normally actually attach it to this side of the gun. Uh, so that I have free movement of my stock, retracting the gun over my shoulder, coming back onto the stock, and my sling is always staying on my actual shoulder. It's not slipping down onto my plate carrier or onto my back. As far as attaching the sling here closer to the magwell, there's pros and cons to doing this versus this. I like keeping the sling here closer to the magwell so my hand out here is not getting caught by the sling itself when I'm manipulating my light, my laser, doing my reloads and all that good stuff. So this is how I have it uh, positioned. I kind of get the best of both worlds of a single point, which I don't recommend unless you're using a sub gun, but it does give you freedom of movement and a two point where I can actually secure the rifle to my body a little more effectively than a one point. So there's the down and dirty around your neck, support arm goes through. Now it's actually held to my body. If I go to my back, like so.
Well, one of them blew down. So, just a little chameleon drill, a little target identification, generally, depending on the target. This one was a pretty easy one. But sometimes these targets are a little hard to see, you know, what kind of weapons they have and where they are. If they're aiming a gun and that's contrasted against their clothing and their body, it makes it very hard to actually properly identify that target, which is where something like this, an LPVO, comes in handy. Even at a short distance like this, 30 meters, 40 meters, where I can power up four by, then actually see what's going on and take shots a little more accurately if need be. On this guy though, I didn't need it too much, but I did run it on him because I was scoping through a car to see where his hands were because I, all I could see, I could see this hand, I could not see this hand. So I just moved a little bit, powered up, and then I could see everything clear as day. This guy blew down. I would have definitely needed magnification. Granted, his posture indicates a phone. So, a little easier. Although the magnification would have seen that. My hits on this guy are as follows. We have three Charlies, neck, in outside vital zone, although still it would be a good hit. And then uh, in the arm right here. So not too bad. I have no chin on the gun, so the gun basically can do a little more of this action back in my shoulder. Uh, but these are my hits right here. Those are my headshots. One up top. My head of her bore uh, is a little higher. Uh, so I'm gonna have to jamie here. <laughs> I was doing that. It's pretty wild. So let's go headshot. Standard five yards. towards the top of the head, but uh, he's good. Three times in a row. Center, four, seven. Oh, no, actually, no. The one I called center, I was holding here. It's actually down here. But we have two good hits. That was the first one. And that last one, ooh. Five one. All right, so I want to talk a couple things about target transitioning real quick. First off, if you have a transition that is in the same width of your shoulders, it's not really target transitioning. When you cram a bunch of targets together like this, and it's just bang, 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 and you're not actually having to move your entire body, reorient your hips, or having to lead with your eyes significantly, in my opinion, it's not really a target transition. This what we have right here, I have a pretty wide target transition right here where it's definitely outside the width of my shoulders where if I'm transitioning from my far left target to the far right, I barely see in my peripheral. I'm really having to get my head and my eyes over there while the gun drives. So eyes lead gun follows for the first one. Second is I wanna to try to keep my hips oriented to the target that I'm going to. So in this case, I have a middle target, which makes it a little bit easier. As I hit this guy right here, one of my feet is facing him. My hips are facing one, two, transition. My hips are still facing the center target right here. And then when I transition to my far right target, head goes first. And then I sometimes will pivot on my foot instead of doing like, I reset my entire base. I will simply just pivot this foot, which helps drive my hips to that target. And as long as I'm facing it, that's able to get on the target a little faster with the gun. When you start dealing with a wide transition, like a 180, that's where I may have to actually reset my base. But if I can help it, I wanna to try to not take too many steps because that's wasted time. I wanna be able to pivot on my feet, keep my base nice and wide. If I try this transition uh, with a narrow base like this, I obviously have lots of problems, but I, I can start nice and wide like so. I can actually transition effectively all the way to about where you're at a good 150 degrees without having to adjust my base too much. So keep your hips oriented to the target, eyes lead gun follows, and that's pretty much all there is to it.
right, so that is my one, 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 one drill. I do this with a lot of my offset mounts and scopes just to get reps in on finding my sight picture. So with this particular setup, I haven't run these a ton with like piggybacked optics. I've done it on ACOGs and LCANs and stuff like that. But I'm getting a sight picture on one power with the scope, shifting to the RMR, back to the scope, and so on. I'm at about 25, 30 meters. And what I'm trying to have is a consistent sight picture for every shot. I don't want to be like, oh, I found it, bang, oh, oh where is it, bang, oh, where is it, bang. No, I want it to be bang, 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 and I have a consistent sight picture for every rep. So what I have here is alpha, 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 alpha. So I am all clean, and that was in 4.97. I can't remember what my standard is for this. I think it's, I don't know if I have one. It's probably like six seconds or something, or five or something like that. Uh, but not too bad with a setup that I have not trained with a ton. This is a EOTech Voodoo 1-8, to which I have used for a while, uh, with the Reptilla little uh, setup right here with an armor on top. Although I did substitute the spacer from our offset mount underneath to get it up over the turret. So, uh, and it worked flawlessly. So, pretty cool. So over the past few years shooting, there's been a lot of different drills that I've put emphasis on. Paper targets that you shoot from a static position, transitioning to a handgun, speed reloading, emphasis on all kinds of things. And during the course of that and working with beginners, whether they were, well, beginners is in people who've never shot a gun before or people that just aren't real experienced, and that's uh, law enforcement, SWAT guys, including some military guys in special operations because shooting is only 1% of the job, but working with people of varied skill levels, what I've come to the conclusion of over a few years of doing this is, the drills that I focus on the most and that I think are the most important for new shooters to be doing and getting used to a bunch of different stuff, is not just standing still and shooting stuff, but it's taking two positions or three if you want, three or two static positions, having a shooter start, engage, find a side picture, dismount the gun, make a movement forward, backwards to the side, doesn't matter, arrive into position, get on the gun in static and engage super simple what this does is this makes the shooter especially a newer shooter more comfortable moving with the gun it starts getting them competent at safely manipulating the weapon especially if you start doing uh, forwards to rear uh, movement uh, on a range with other people i mean you got to go uh, high muzzle uh, low muzzle be very conscious of where you're pointing starting to get used to running full sprints with a firearm which a lot of people treat as like scissors oh don't run with scissors or don't run with a gun it's dangerous well yes guns are dangerous that's kind of the point of it but we want to be able to comfortably move with that uh safely of course where it's not like oh i'm gonna somehow discharge it and kill myself by moving with the gun too fast uh, so what these drills are good for is getting people nice and comfortable uh, but also building proficiency at dismounting mounting the gun uh, safety on off as the eyes are going into the optic and then also getting used to just moving so uh, for starters this is a side to side movement i use sticks to indicate uh, my position rather than having a cone where it's kind of arbitrary where you are i basically have to be one foot on one side one foot on the other so i can work on my footwork and my positioning real simple low round count drill great for times like these when ammo is hard to get i'm going to do two rounds so it'll require a little bit of recoil management i'm going to move to that stick try to get on the gun as i roll into position two rounds on steel and i'm done let's do this stand by And I'm set. Footwork's good, off the safety. Uh, off safety as I arrive in position, getting out on the optic, and then uh, hitting the safety as I am obviously uh, coming off of the gun. So, then, rearward movement. So it's somewhere over there. Same thing. This time it'll be two from the front, two to the rear. I've got to think about my muzzle awareness, and all I'm doing is sprinting with the gun, getting nice and comfortable. Stand by. Just like that. Eyes lead, gun follows. There's another great drill to work on that. As I'm arriving in position, watching my muzzle, my eyes go to the target first. As my feet land into position, safety comes off. And I'm set. So I run people through these drills right off the bat. As soon as we do some static stuff, up drill, safety, basics, I go straight into getting them comfortable moving.
And I've been doing that now for a while, and I'm going to keep doing it. Transitioning to the side is so much better. More mobile, less in the way, Just slap an inboard, then do your stuff. So I actually throw my thumb literally, so my left hand goes in between gun and the magazine to draw. My hand then lands right on top of the slide like this. Draw, hands, and I'm set with my good grip that I need every time. And then the other thing that a lot of people make the mistake of, and I'm gonna watch this, we're gonna work on it, is a lot of people when they go to grab their shirt, they flick it and they release. The problem with that is as they flick and release, that's when they can usually drop your shirt back onto your drawing hand and get your thumb caught like this. So what I try to do is I hold the shirt up until the pistol is out enough that I can then actually build my grip, which that takes some practice. I didn't used to do that. I used to you know, release the shirt immediately and I was catching my thumb, catching my thumb and I realized, oh, I need to actually pin the shirt and like hold on to it until the gun's actually fully out of the holster. Or it's like out of the holster and I'm shooting from here. And then I'm definitely gonna keep my hand here so I don't shoot myself. But we're not gonna be going over retention shooting. You guys can do all that. I'm not gonna worry about that. So we got this is on my last run this is pretty good not too bad we're in the aim point cs swedish origin I'm gonna bother marking.
Ready rig, ready to go. So I want to show something that's pretty cool about the ready rig. So I've had some mountain warfare dudes reach out to me when the ready rig got launched and said, hey, this is a really cool chest rig for using with our overwhites because we can keep everything on the inside nice and warm and tucked away from the elements like our radios, our batteries, and all sorts of other mission essential gear that we don't want exposed to the elements. So what I have right now is one of our ready rigs with all my ammo, batteries. I can have my radio, my PTT up under here. I can have it rigged up to my uh, ear pro if I had a boom mic and all my comms and I don't have that piece of gear exposed to the elements or breaking up my snow camouflage so got my little rig right here I can either with this particular M80 jacket I can zip it shut or I can simply do the velcro so when I need to go do a reload all I have to do is basically rip my jacket open grab my magazine and I'm set and there I go so the ready rig is not just a low vis type of piece of a, a piece of kit, but can also be used for this kind of thing. So that's pretty cool. All right, so we're going to talk about shooting off of obstacles and barriers. So just like in Call of Duty, basically you come up to the barrier instead of just shooting around it uh, freehand like this. If I have opportunity to actually get extra support off the side of the barrier, I will simply take this hand, jump right on there. Grab the uh, handguard. I don't obviously want to grab near the barrel or anything like that. Grab the handguard so now I have a point of contact between this stable object, provided it doesn't wobble, and that also allows it to recoil a little faster, just like in Call of Duty. I wonder where they got that from. Uh, and there's a couple little techniques there. If you have like vertical grips, you can get behind those pull the gun into the vertical grip, which you uh, do have. So in this case, you can actually run the vertical grip in front and then actually pull the gun into that vertical grip and shoot from here. What we're gonna be doing is working all four of these barriers. You're basically gonna shoot on one side of the barrier, bring the gun around. So you're gonna basically mount to this side of the barrier, hit a steel, safety the gun because you're bringing your eyes out of the optic. Other side of the barrier, I like to bring the stock up over my shoulder so I can like clear the space of this barrier. Otherwise I'd have to go down and that's slow or go up and that's slow. So all I'm gonna do is break the stock, get up on here, take my shot, break stock safety, come back out, hit a new piece of steel, and then move to the next barrier. And I will then get on one side, get a hit, one side, get a hit, safety, move to the next barrier. We'll do all four. You can switch up standing and kneeling. When I kneel around a barrier, what I try to do is have, it feels more natural to do this right here and have this leg, like your left side, your, depending on which side of the barrier you're on, basically you drop the knee on the side you're shooting on. But the problem with doing this is, if you come up behind me and push me, I'm gonna roll out outside of this cover or concealment, whatever it is. So what I try to do is have my strong leg or my leg that's going to match up with this side of the barrier. So in this case, right side will be my right leg, left side will be my left leg. This allows me to get back into cover or swap to this side a little easier and I can push off of it. So we will do some standing on the side, kneeling on the side. We won't bother with any prone or anything like that. But when I kneel on this side or in general, I can get an extra point of contact. So I can have one hand on the barrier to do my, my uh, bracing, mounting on the barrier. And then I can do my other elbow on the inside of my knee right here. Then I have very good recoil control and accuracy and marksmanship in general. Any questions on that? Just like that, go ahead and send a couple rounds. Yeah, 
Yep, and then go ahead and uh, kneel down on this side. So it'll be, so right here, so if you feel this, you have a floating elbow. There right. you go, drop a little lower, one extra point of contact. So lower than this, or? So what I like to do is actually try to, instead of doing elbow to so bone to bone, which right. is you know tip of your elbow, right. tip of your knee, I actually try to get on the inside. Uh, this works too, but I actually usually go to the inside of my leg like this, versus uh -huh. being on top. Yeah. That works as well. So push again. Yep. Not even remotely fair. We're gonna work. Well, I have a red dot too. About my ADS speed slower because no, of it. no, you that was crap. All right. Uh, yep, you're good. So two center, two left, two right. Just follow your sights. I, I don't care how long this takes, but we're gonna work on this next time. Uh, we got here. Okay. Are you ready? Sure. Stand by. You also have irons. You also have irons. As yeah, long as, 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 long as you're left. getting Alpha Charlies, I'm happy with where, what left. we're doing. I may. I think I missed the second one on this one. Okay. Well, I think I hit a Delta. Oh, okay, gotcha. Stand by. Nice. Three, four, five. Very consistent. Your stock was not fully uh, yeah. like tucked in. It, some, some of it's the sling. I hate tying off the sling to the these stocks. You can't push it if you want. Loosen that. Loosen that. Loosen that. Loosen that. Loosen that. Even if I sling it, it seems too low. There we go. Well, you gotta run. That's true. But you're not transitioning to an angle, so it's alright. Yeah, but that's not fair to practice the way you're not gonna actually yeah, run it. Yeah, nobody knows that. Alright, shooter ready. Sure. Stand by. Yeah! What do you think that time was? Maybe three even. 298. Not bad. Now let me do it again. Shooter ready. Ready. Stand by. So, reloads. You've done the last one you did was really good. Uh, but basically, there's a couple of principles. I'll have the gun up when I go to bolt lock, most likely, because I'm in the process of seeing my sight and engaging. Upon bolt lock, I want to try to keep the gun up here to do my reload. I don't want to come down. I want to stay as close to the target with the gun facing the target as much as possible. So what that's going to look like, got my magazine here on my belt. Gun comes up. I fire. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's a little loud. <laughs> I have a war comp on here. Uh, I feel bolt lock because there's only half of the recoil because the bolt is still stuck here in the rear. At which point I'm going to dump the magazine with the gun straight up and down. Set the mag. Well, normally the mag will fall out. Let's say it's right here. My left hand will go down, grab my new magazine. In this case, because the magazine is not falling all the way forward, because I'm doing a beer can grip, I will then open these fingers, slide that magazine out, insert the new magazine, hit the bolt release with my thumb, you came up over the top, that works too. It was really clean and awesome looking. With my thumb, I can hit the bolt release, or in this case, I have a bad lever, which allows me to do that with this finger. Now I uh, drop the bolt with the gun out here, 
Gun comes up. One shot. I will then safety the weapon. Grab my empty magazine. Do my little L tack mag. Throw this mag back into the pouch. So now I'll go all the way through. Drop magazine, strip, insert, bad lover. Normally the mags drop free. If they don't, I just strip it out that I wasn't way. Having mine the other day drop free at all. But you can also do, I do this if I'm like changing elevations. So I'm doing a stem. I drop, strip. So I'll actually assist the magazine, strip it out. That's a, especially uh, appropriate in the prone position because you'll be shooting, generally monopotting off the mag. So you'll fold, you'll bolt, strip magazine. Just like that. So, you're up. So you got uh, empty mag, one in the chamber. Is there an appropriate height you want to grab this at? Yeah, so, uh, you can? great question. Most people never ask that. You're like the first person I've ever heard ask that. So what I try to do is actually grab the very end of the magazine. The problem with grabbing the middle of the magazine is when I actually go to insert into the mag, it you hits my hand. Away pinches, I may think, it's in all the way. I come up, fire one, mag falls right out. I may have done that before. You might have. Um, so yes, I want to grab at the base of the magazine so that I'm not going to pinch my hand and or not seat the magazine fully into the gun. Or that. Yep, yep, yep. And then safety. Go ahead and... Uh, Tack reload. Tack reload first. Yep, yep, yep. Insert the magazine. Beer can, beer can, beer can, beer can. The other way, the other way, the other way. Okay, yeah. That's how I put it in back. Yeah. Here. All right. Let's do it again. Okay. This time, uh, this time, let's try to use the ping pong paddle. The uh, bolt release. Right. Okay. Coming over the top works now, too, but you're having to pull it out. I was originally the told not to do that because you can miss it. Well, only it's more reliable. Well, yeah, if you don't train. Okay. Then, you know, I don't generally miss All it. All right. On you. so bad. I think that was like your fifth reload ever. It's, it's not good. Way too slow. Uh, no comment. Way too slow. No comment. All right, let's do it again. Not bad, not bad. So then squat down, grab it, L shape, tap man. There you go. Your can, excellent, good to go. Now that's good. You're, the only thing you're working through, and it's because it's early on, is your hesitation of bang, am I empty? Oh yeah, I am. What am I doing? Oh yeah, I'm going down here. Bolt. So there's a lot of stuff going on. You'll get rid of the hesitation as you get more comfortable with it. No, I'm thinking too much. Uh, sure, but you'll stop. But the thing is, as you do this more, you'll stop thinking, which is what we want. Right. Subconscious. Ooh. Nice. Good, 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 good. good. I like it. That's actually super good for like a eighth reload ever. That's not bad at all. Why did you tap the mag at the end? Because I've been having trouble with the not. So it's not so, and that's fine. You felt, and that, and that's fine. You felt like you didn't slime it in hard enough that you were like, I'm gonna tap for good measure and get it back on. No, that's actually good. I'll do that occasionally where I'll feel like I don't have a good seat, but rather than sit there and think through it, you literally just went and did it. You were just like, ah, it didn't feel good enough. S snap it in, bolt release, and you were set. Let's do it again. Uh, so, because I'm grabbing lower, I'm sometimes missing. You're not, uh, you're not wrapping your hand fully around the magazine when you're grabbing it. So I need you're kind of like this, okay. which does mean when you go to slam, your hand can slip. Right. If you do get a full wrap with your thumb, you'll just you, have you more control. You your thumb in like that for a reason, just so you don't hit it? I, I do what? So you check your thumb in like that for a reason, uh, just so you don't well, hit I just have more, more contact? More surface area. I don't know. Yeah, right. I guess that's why I do it. I don't flare. You know, fine wine. Thank you. Yeah. I did it again. And the guard sealed pistol. No, it's fine. So this time, we're going to go uh, 50%. So go ahead and do a little swap -a uh, That's fine. Just however you want to juggle the mask. I forget about uh, that's okay. it. That's okay. Uh, this time, I want you to go 50% speed, and when you send this hand back, I want you to be really deliberate. Really deliberate on you're at the base of the mag and you're curving your thumb behind the magazine. So I'm getting down here and grabbing, and this is what I got. 
It's also just because of the training. Alright. All right. Slow-mo. 50%. 50%. Gun comes up. Shot. Hand. Oh, too low. Yep, there you go. Thumb. Back on the grip. Yep. And you're starting. So what you're doing, and this is just this just takes time. You're going down, sweeping your pistol mags, you're grabbing the middle, and then you're like, oh yeah, I need to go up. With training, it comes down to, I know exactly what height my arm needs to be at, exactly what height my grip has to be at, my hand needs to be at to get a good grip on it. That just takes time. Yep, so you went middle, and then you shifted, and then yep. you forgot the bolt release. But that was everything else was super smooth and awesome. Why did it not lock back on me? It's not actually locked back. Um, That's because it occasionally will do that. And that's when you'll get a click, you do a tap rack, then you realize it's locked back, you reload, hit the bolt release, and you're done. Right. You just gotta re-rack it then. Not bad though, not bad. All right, all right, all right, you ready? Yeah, yeah, I am ready. On a scale of one to 10, how do you think that went? I was good for a little bit, and then I had a big hesitation halfway through. And then I okay. thought about whether I should actually be aiming at my target. So then I hesitated um, a little bit longer to make sure I was dead. You know you did all that through. in like under three seconds with all those hesitations you just said. Well, it's too many. It is, but you're thinking through them very fast, which is good. All right, one more. Is my sling too tight, or is it just... Uh, no. Very good recovery. Uh, you're picking your head up just enough to hit the charging handle back on. It's really clean. Okay. Why did why did it not lock back to you? Um, could be that magazine. Okay. That's that's yeah. That's solid. Get in, get in, get in. I do not have that kind of right. Window? Quick, get in, quick! Get, 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 get in, get in! On this corner! Reloading! I got us, I got us! They're on this wall. You good? Yeah. I'm 38. They're holding 35 and 37. We're supposed to get down here. Our only option really is to zip Back. behind. And Hope not to right. get shot. I then loop all the way around the sunken town and come in. That's, that's, a, that's a nifty sprint. Yes. Yeah. If you need to, that subway tunnel is breachable almost every 30 feet, and this yeah. structure here is access to it. You can go into this building and get down there. We're up here on this top well, corner, yeah. and my guys are in this blue dive. So, so all right, you last man? Yeah. Okay. All right. Here, someone bump past, get my back, yep, get my back. Yep. Take that. All right, you're gonna go left, I'm gonna go right. Yep. Here we go, right. Luke, opening on the left, opening on the left. I got right, I got right. You good? He needs a medic. He can't move, so you medic. This is a kill box, so pull back. Push up, push up.
Oh, no, I'm good. Trust me. This okay. Is super. Oh, how heavy is that? My shoulders are fucking. 180 pounds, they said. Fuck the football over there. I need a person. Okay, Carrie, just get. We gotta stop. And they're gassing it. Who's in your squad? Are you a part of their element? Yeah. All right. Hey, Lucas. Yeah. You're pretty good at carrying bodies, right? Oh, shit. <laughs> okay, well. Oh, no. oh, my gosh. No. Come on, girl. Let's go. So now we gotta get it back hey, fast. Hey, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. Drop, put it, put it down. Put it down. Grab the legs. I had the legs. No, Drew, Drew's got me. Damn, boy, he's thick. I was like, he just Luke, you got all the legs, dude. I it's fine. So this is my EDC right here. I have a Glock 19 with an RMR and a Streamlight TLR7, which I have recently switched to using quite a lot. I still use the X300, but I like the TLR7 a lot. It's a little more comfortable. Uh, I have the Surefire EDLC2 as my handheld, and I'm a big proponent of uh, people carrying handhelds because seeing is pretty rad. Um, I'm not going to pull my pistol out to use the flashlight just to find something or look for things, although I know we've all done that at some point in our lives around our house or something like that. But I, I use this sucker every day, all the time, and I can legally use this in public without committing misdemeanors, pulling my pistol out to use the flashlight. So, I highly recommend a handheld. However, there are some considerations. Even though I have a pistol light uh, on this weapon, um, I st I'm still going to carry a handheld. Just because I have a handheld, I'm not going to ditch my pistol light on my pistol. I want to do a little demo for you guys, speed and marksmanship, running the light on my pistol versus just running my handheld. We'll start with the handheld. This is five rounds at right about uh, 16, 17 yards, something like that. So it's not too bad on a Safalc target. From the draw, I'm going to drop both my handheld and my pistol. So one hand on this, one hand on the gun. I can either do a Harry's grip, which is actually the best for uh, maintaining uh, consistent rise and fall of my optic, at least in my opinion, or I can go umbrella over the top. Uh, for this, I'll go umbrella over the top, and we'll see what happens. Five rounds, then we'll go up and check it. Oh, flashlight good to go, pistol good to go, stand by. All right, so, and I won't tack my this one's all pinky. So, that was in a very conservative time of 5.32. Nice and slow, and what we got here, Sharpie. We have Charlie, Alpha, 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 Delta. Ooh. So three Alphas, three Alphas, a Charlie, and a Delta in 5.32. Now, let's do pistol light. And my first shot, let's check out the first shot, because that, that is important, 205. So from draw to shot, uh, we're looking at a 205. Not great, not great at all. So now I'm just gonna draw and run the TLR7. Same distance. Let's do this, stand by. All right, I have one Charlie on the left and possibly could be a Delta, it was my second round. That was in a time of 3.03 with a first shot in a 148. So I'm six tenths faster going straight to my pistol and my light. Let's check these heats. Where's my Sharpie? Here it is. We have, oh, looky there. Uh, alpha, 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 Alpha. Because I ain't seeing nothing else in here. So it's a nice little group right here. That's actually too nice for how fast I was shooting, I should be, well, I should be shooting faster is what I really should be doing. So, I hope this is a useful demo for you guys who are like, oh man, just because I have a handheld, I don't need to carry a pistol light. The answer is, you should definitely consider it. Um, whether you're, you know, carrying a handheld and then you don't have a pistol light, or maybe you have a pistol light, you don't have a handheld. Uh, having both options is great. I can see things without committing a misdemeanor. If I have to shoot, I can then run my pistol light, which is, Totally awesome and a whole lot faster and more effective. Charlie. Oh my Charlie, Alpha, Alpha, Alpha. 
shortly. Two Charlies. Two. Stand by. This probably looks pretty familiar to those of you who have seen the pictures of Operation Nimrod, where the SAS guys stormed the Iranian embassy with MP5s that had the stream lights attached uh, right on top. Uh, they had pressure pads that allowed them to activate uh, a very dim white light. Um, and a lot of people thought this was like an optical system, sort of, sort of like red dot. Uh, well, it's in fact basically a large mag light. Now the cool thing is, uh, they had some that would have a reticled crosshair shadowed on the front, kind of like uh, some of the x-ray machines out there. Uh, they, when they aim the like little x-ray thing on you, I recently had a doctor appointment and they did it. And I saw that they had the little crosshair that was shadowed on the front of the lens, which gave the appearance of a red dot or a reticle sight. Uh, this one is just a straight up beam, but the cool part is because this is a HK uh, clamp mount, you actually can see the iron sights uh, straight through the mount itself. So I'm here at about... Oh, 35 meters to a C-zone steel with this super dim old uh, stream light, but I can still... I'll wait for it to dim, a little flasher. So we're at about 25 meters or so. Very dim light, but I can still get some hits with it. I can still get down there and see my sights. Now with a gas mask, with a respirator, uh, that is not gonna happen. Um, but for with that, I'm gonna have to hit fire uh, with the light itself. And just shoot based on the light. And there are five A-zone hits, just like that. Oh, come on. Basically treating the light like a optic. So if we take this beam, 
and we go to, let's say 10 yards, right here. 10 yards, center of the beam there. And we have a headshot. So that's pretty rad. You can do that with most normal rifle lights. And if you're wearing a gas mask, that's really all you got. So, pretty cool little setup. You don't see a lot of these floating around these days, but it's just super rad. So I've got one of my standard 14.5 block twos here, but I have it kitted out for a little bit of night vision, longer range type shooting. So I have the Tango 6T here, which is a standard one to six scope. Um, but what I have in front is a PVS 24LR. Uh, this is a white phosphor clip-on uh, for long range shooting. Uh, but what I found is it's actually quite awesome on lower powered magnifications. So in this case, it's a one to six. Uh, so I can run this optic from about two and a quarter X up to six power, uh, getting a full visual, full FOV uh, through this particular clip-on. Now, what's the most weird thing about this build, because everyone's familiar with night vision clip-ons, is this laser all the way on top. And they say, wow, that's a lot of height over bore. Well, this is not actually for shooting. I'm not using this as an aiming device to actually engage, you know, from the shoulder. All this is doing is giving me illumination um, with the IR laser and or illuminator uh, when I need a little bit of illumination to uh, get down range, get a little bit further, which is why this is an LA-5, not a standard civilian class laser. Uh, if you are wanting to build out a long range night vision setup, I highly recommend you go and source a full power or ultra power laser so you can punch that IR light even further uh, than what a standard civilian class laser will do because the FDA and all of their wisdom don't think a civilian should be able to have high power lasers. So get yourself a ultra high power laser like an LA-5, get your clip on, then you can run, you know, depending on which clip on you get, a two to 10 scope, a three to 16. Uh, in this case, I'm just running a one to six and I'll shoot this out to five, 600 meters, uh, which is about where this gun is going to be going anyway, being a 14.5. So I don't really need a whole lot more magnification than that in general. Got a Harris bipod, uh, mod light, OKW, so I can shoot with white light out to 200 if I need to. Suppressor, offset RMR for shooting this offhand, which is very doable with this setup. Um, it does look big and heavy, but it's not too bad. It's still lighter than a saw. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna shoot some steel out there in the darkness at about 200. So my pressure pad for the LA-5 is running all the way here to my index finger. So when I need illumination, I can double tap that for constant, get my illumination, or just hold for momentary to see if I get some shadow off of a target, and then I can engage. So I have a piece of steel about 200 away. I'm at two and a half power. I'm gonna dial in. It looks like I am on illumination. There we go. And we're gonna find this guy. There we go, three hits. So that's without illumination. I use the illumination to see him. He kind of casts a little shadow and then. That's a reduced C zone TA targets that I'm smacking out in the darkness, no problem. I can scan around. And I'm set, pretty legit build, a great rooftop gun, rooftop defense gun. All right, so it's my cold start drill using a M&P 2.0 in one of our sidecars. If I didn't carry a Glock, I would probably carry one of these. So four alphas up close at a pretty conservative pace. I'm trying to be a little careful. You guys a little further away. We got three Charlies, one alpha, and our far target. And I was gonna reload on him, but I ended up just going back to the close target. That was at an 8.81. And we've got three alphas, one Charlie. Decent transitions for a cold start. 
And yeah, not too bad. All right. So one-handed tack mag, draw, shot, plus a uh, wall bang on a piece of steel, two Charlies, two Alphas. Really uh, didn't have the best side picture on that first guy, but I uh, cleaned it up on these. Alpha Charlie, and that was all one-handed, MP 2.0 from our sidecar, and a 492. Not too bad. Draw, but uh, decent shooting. 2.20. Bad. 3 4. Charlie, Charlie, Alpha, 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 Alpha. So two Charlies total. So two little build drills there 2.2 and then a 3.4 one handed. Not too bad. First shot on a 1 8. Run, run. Missing the little bitty slide release. The slide lock's getting me a little bit. That was in eight one three. Vehicle bailout with seat belt, with a sidecar, Glock 19 with an RMR. It's working some targets that are hidden behind vehicles. This first guy, double Charlie's Alpha. This guy, my grip was a little loosey goosey on him. They came up, so I gave an extra online Charlie Alpha Alpha Delta. This low guy, based on my angle, Char uh, Alpha Charlie Delta. We've got Alpha Alpha Charlie Charlie. Total time of, don't know, power to the car. I had a failure to fire on that. I was aware that that mag was having issues, so I was just done with that mag. Let's drop it, gas up a new one. Okay, so let's see here. Charlie, Alpha, Alpha, Alpha. I really only had two headshots available. I took that, I believe I only took two. I may have thrown a mic, but Alpha, Bravo, yikes, Delta. Those are all, looks like two, two, three, so Alpha, Alpha, and a Charlie. Okay, not too bad. Take a look here. One, two, three, four. Broke the line into Charlie. Center mass, this side was what was available to me. Alpha, worked my way up. Actually, excuse me, those are nine mils. So three, I may have thrown one here. Slowing down and really finding my sights. Making noise with your gun is fun, but it doesn't actually work when you're shooting stuff. That's me, Alpha, Alpha, 
Uh, those were all, oh, wow. Okay, that's yikes. I gotta clean that up a little bit. <sighs> when you get into those drills, when you're bailing out of a car, transitioning, reloading, it's super fun to just keep moving fast, move on to the next thing, but sometimes finding your sights, making sure you're on the wall of that trigger and actually hitting the stuff that you're shooting at, that matters a lot more. Okay, uh, I shot nine here, so I should have marked my last run. Uh, well, I threw possibly these Ds, unless that was someone previously. There's a Charlie. I did feel good with my red dot. I know that I was accountable. I can tell you where that red dot was. Yes, it was on the right side of the target, but all things considered, I got some good hits. So I want to show a couple little techniques for shooting a PDW such as this, or a little submachine gun set up as a pistol, so there's no stock, no nothing. Uh, so the first technique is generally people just grab it, whether they have a foregrip or just uh, four end, and they just push the gun out and they find the sight and they shoot. So I have a USPSA target here at 10 yards. We're gonna do five rounds, we're gonna see what happens. Stand by. Using my dominant eye, because I'm cross-eye dominant, so I am still pushing my head over to center my left eye with my body, and then I'm taking my shots. That was a three, one, four. Looks like we have an alpha, an alpha, an alpha, an alpha, and an alpha. Sweet. All alphas, nice and smooth and consistent in three seconds. Now, the recoil management is not great because I have no point of contact with my body. I have no stock. I have nothing of that nature. It's just the gun in my hands doing a whole lot of this. So, if you take a one-point sling such as this, and this is where one-point slings are great on guns like this MP5K, this SP89. I take, uh, this is our T-Rex sling, and it's just QD'd here to the rear. I'm going to tighten this down. I know kind of roughly where I need to be. And what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to be pushing the gun to the point where the sling is going to be tight against my neck. And I have the inside pad of the sling itself riding against my actual jawbone and my cheek. So I'm kind of getting a cheek weld, uh, as it were, as if I was shooting a rifle. So I'm literally just driving the gun out to where it's tight. So I have basically one extra point of contact to my body, to my core, as if it were a stock. It's not as good, but it, it works. So that time was a 314 all alphas. Uh, now let's do it with the slang uh, tension. Stand by. Alrighty, that was a 187 cooking with gas. And we've got, it's a nice little group. I did drop one down here, but alpha, 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 and alpha. So. We have a very good group comparable to what I had before, um, but that was in uh, 187 as opposed to a 315, or was a 314. Uh, so little things like this, running a small gun can be very helpful, can act sort of kind of like a stock uh, versus just holding the gun out there and letting it do its thing. So I'm gonna be doing a little experiment here. I have this Mark 18 with an Aimpoint T2 and the new EOTech G43. A 3x magnifier. I'm here at 100 yards on two plate racks, one plate rack uh, from right here, and then I have another plate rack over there where there is a 1 to 8 voodoo awaiting me on a similar, exactly the same gun down to light laser weight, all that good stuff. Uh, so we're just gonna run a little uh, drill on these, clearing the whole rack left to right uh, with both guns, see which is faster, which is better. It might actually surprise you at this distance, which of these setups might be a little quicker. Some of it could also just be shooter error on my part. But let's do this. 100 yards, plate rack, T target's plate rack. Stand by. All right, 2518, not great, not my best work. 25 seconds, well, let's see what this does. Also weaving the round between two cars. That's on 3X over there. So, there we go. From here, we'll try six power. I won't dial all the way to eight because I like seeing the entire target in one sight picture. Uh, so six power will do that for me with this. So 25 there with a bunch of misses, bunch of stuff. Stand by. Done. 
and that was in 12 14. I kind of want to rematch with the EOTech and the Magnifier. It should have been better, and that was a lot of that was on my end. But it is a lot easier to shoot consistently with this on magnification and a range like that on a target of that size. So Voodoo wins in this case at a staggering 12 second versus 25. <sighs> but that 25, a lot of that was just me sucking. So uh, probably be a little bit lower than that, but this would still win. And that's on six power, not eight power. Not too bad. And then here's one, a 180. Two hits right there. Rode the uh, slide release a little high, which is an issue with the high power, at least in my opinion. You run your thumb up high, you actually push down on the uh, slide release, uh, which drives it up, and then you're locked. All right, I shot this with the Scorpion earlier, so all these, these, these little 32 ACP holes. But we have Alpha, 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 Charlie, Alpha, Alpha, Charlie, 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 and Delta. Charlie, Alpha. So, not too bad.
my eyes off target for running the wall. Worked pretty well. Two alphas, Charlie. Three alphas. And three alphas. All kind of off to the side. What was that? 9.5. Tempo five star. That's, that's a very hard lane. I made it insanely hard on purpose. Charlie, Alpha, Alpha. On the move. Alpha, Charlie. Wood, high right. That? That's all I see. Yeah. Delta, Charlie, Charlie. I took it really fast, too fast. All right. I, I had too much momentum going in. Alpha, Alpha. I think I threw one. Probably as you were falling out. Probably. Yeah. Yep. So my three on the move. Nice controlling, controllable pace. Yikes. Alpha, Alpha, Delta. Okay. Two more alphas than I did. Uh, it was 11.33, mine was a 12. All right, so all that was done with the new M&P Shield Plus. With this extended mag that helps fill the grip, which is great, it's my favorite for sure. Holds 13 plus one, so 14 rounds. One shy of a standard compact 15 round mag gun. That's not too bad, I like it. Side lock doesn't really work though. One left shoulder. Situational awareness required. All alphas. 
And then you wait, and you take your three. Yep, left shoulder, called. <laughs> and so I had one out, two try, two alpha. A little slower. I feel like my gun recovered too much. Well, I have one on left. Like second to second shot. Laser. Yep, one on the left. left side. This is where we get to the shot calling. This is what makes or breaks shooters. Two on left side, one slightly low, one high, one center. The high, low, center, A. Two on left, Charlie. Yeah, I feel like this would be a good target to shoot at 50. Yep, called it. Well, kind of. There's one called one left Charlie, but the rest looks like I pulled the gun on, back onto the target just fine. So he's clean. This is where we get to talk about your group is too good. It should be bigger. We need silver sharpies. I'm having a hard time seeing him. Right.
alpha next shot. These are the far guys on the move. Alpha, alpha. Those are flex too. And then this guy, Charlie, Charlie. Not bad. Threw me off the target for alphas. Weird, weird type picture on him. This is standing through a car. So, two Charlie, three Charlie, and one alpha. Alright, so this is a Sight Spectre with an authentic stock, which some folks out there will understand is incredibly rare as they only imported 130 of these into the States for the 3,000 or so pistols they imported. So we're at a nice little 25 yards or so, so two Alphas and a Charlie. Getting a side picture sucks, so I'm shooting low. I was kind of holding low, I don't know, I was holding a little low on purpose. Now let's shoot this a little faster. Let's do all three. Stand by. Stock's a little loose. Build drill. This is A, not two Charlies.
through that. One shot. And that was on this past one. So the first run of a 169 or six whatever was clean. Uh, that was a 169. We'll see what the splits are. This trigger is not incredible as far as reset goes. So first shot in a 61, 17, 16, 15, 15, 15. Okay, so one fives. One fives and one sixes. Not too bad. Probably should have taken a little more time. I have a lot of Charlies. Two Charlies Delta, two A's. Do the barrel. Ooh, Charlie Delta. Alpha, Charlie. Two Alphas in the move. Like did three, so two A's. Yep. And then last target, our first transition over. Ooh, Charlie Alpha. So it's on 25-11. Let's do steel shots at like 35. Actually, the far away. Yeah, 35. All right, all these on the move at about 15 to 18 meters. So I like pushing the distance a little bit with some movement. Smashed the barrel, one shot, did a makeup. That gave me an Alpha Charlie. Two Alphas. Got some disappearing targets, targets of opportunity, Charlie. Two Alphas. So all on the move, not bad. Then to there, to the back. Fire an extra because I hit down right. Yep, right there. D zone, two ways, one makeup. Total time of a 12.56. Not super duper duper fast, but accurate. So we'll take it. Cold start, super simple. Shooting and moving, move, should move a little quicker on this guy. It's two alphas, one on the line. 675. Two alphas. Charlie. Alpha Charlie. Alpha Charlie. Three Char uh, on the line, three Charlies. Four, four. Four, four. That's a high four, we're out. I failed. Reason why is I came up too high, I had to come back down. So four, 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 and a five, four. Could have brightened the U-tick a little bit for that. But I think we got it working out. Two through the barrels. Alphas. 
two alphas. Two Charlie. Charlie, Alpha, or oh, two Charlie actually. Two Alpha. Two Alpha. Alpha. Delta. Ouchies. Two Alpha. Did it make up? Not bad. Super. It's getting a little better. So 294, I'm here at about 18 or so meters. Running the LMT AMB bolt release right here. So you have to move your finger, obviously from the trigger or outside the trigger guard, magazine release, all the way to here. It's forcing me to break my grip. It's not as intuitive, in my opinion, compared to a bad lever, which is right here. That's how much movement I'm doing to a bad lever. Time will tell. It's also a little stiff. Break-in should help. You do have to push it decently. Wonder if hitting a pouch will set it off. Oh boy, I'm rusty. Didn't seem to set it off that time. So as you guys know, it has been very difficult for us to stock enough chest rigs and plate carriers and some of our other kit in order to meet the demand that we have hitting our site and just coming by in general. However, if you're in need of kit, especially with the way things are going right now, uh, there's this really awesome store you can go to where everything's in stock, if you find it, and that's called eBay. Uh, that's where I actually picked up this first spear chest rig. This is a 7.62 uh, chest rig that I just picked up a few days ago. Uh, it was in stock on eBay. It shipped the next day. Uh, some of these sellers only have a few items and they're able to just turn them around super fast. This plate carrier is from LBT. Uh, now they're not always in stock, but this particular colorway, uh, Coyote Tan, has been in stock now for a couple weeks and I decided to pick one up to play with. So if you're in need of a plate carrier, slick armor, a chest rig, and your favorite vendor, you know, whether it's T-Rex or Spiritus or Cry, or, you know, if you go to some of these websites and you order, you won't get it for months, even though technically they allow you to order and put it in the cart. Uh, go to eBay. Check eBay. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff you can get there. You get set up with kit, especially if you aren't prepared and you think you really should be prepared for stuff that's going on. Uh, don't think, man, I love T-Rex arms. I just have to buy T-Rex arms stuff. No, don't do that. We would much rather you have stuff like this from other people that achieves the same objectives and the same goals than you guys waiting for us to, you know, put something in stock. And then even when we do have stock, there's just so many people that, you know, want that particular piece of gear that it's going to take a year on some of these products to get everyone, you know, happy to a point where we can actually keep it stocked just due to the demand right now. So this is a first spear chest rig. There's lots like it. Uh, just simple straps that go around in the back, in my opinion, and they're not as 
I don't like them quite as much as like the ready rig and you know that kind of chest rig. Uh, but this works. As you can see, it just fastens here in the back, goes up on top of the slick armor. If I need to drop this, I can. If I need want to wear the chest rig without the slick armor, I can. You know, nothing's going to move around too much if I'm wearing it tight with my plate carrier. Um, so it's actually quite effective. And this is just an LBT uh, 6094 slick, which is quite expensive. Also, 900,000 rubles. You know what I'm talking about. Um, so I don't necessarily recommend this one for the price. It's about $250, um, but it's kind of cool. It's also a little dated. But if you need stuff, eBay's your friend. Check it out. And uh, everything's in stock if you find it there. Oh shoot, that's right, I'm not, I'm not supposed to have that. Oh man. You can grab that guy, just call it. Should be an Alpha 2 Charlie. Charlie, one left, one right. That's a total of four Charlies. All right, felt pretty good, stayed in my optic pretty much the whole time. There were no crazy transitions except the first one. That was a 733, this MCX 300. Got Charlie and Charlie on the line. Took three on this guy. So my first was kind of off to the left as I was arriving in position. Called it. And finished up with two alphas. That called shot. And over here we've got Charlie. Charlie took this guy right after I smashed the headshot. Got Bravo. Bravo. The heads. We got two alphas. The total time of 
right. A little slow on the Glock. We've got neck to Alphas Charlie or Alphas. Total time of 3117. Charlie, Alpha. Two mic, I guess. Just about on the move. Uh, we got a mic. Oh no, we don't. No, we're good. All ice. Alpha, 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 Alpha. Or no, it's a trailer. Oh, I fired an extra. Yeah, extra pistol round. So yeah. For those of you running bagged guns, PDWs, MCXs, 300 blackouts, whatever it is, and you're trying to create a weapon that can fit into a wide variety of bags, something you might want to consider doing is getting this accessory from Reptilla. All it is is a shorter grip. So I can still get my entire hand on the weapon, as you can see, uh, but it's not a traditional, you know, AR grip that's a little bit longer and ends up being flush with a 20 round magazine. So that means I can get this particular gun, this uh, 6.75 inch 300 blackout MCX, it's Gen 1, uh, to fit in more kinds of bags on the market. I'm not going to be restricted to bags that are super long. Um, I could just have it be, you know, a little smaller overall footprint. So if you're someone who wants to build out a small gun like this, that can then fit into lots of different bags out there. Uh, definitely check the Soul Sucker out. We added two to our armory. I think it's actually pretty cool. Downside uh, right off the bat is uh, it's super slick. So I would recommend skate tape or even stippling it or something just to give it a little more aggressiveness because it is pretty slick, but it's super cool. Flush with the 20 rounder. Still time of 59. Two alphas. Two alphas. Four alphas. Two alpha two headshots. Alpha Charlie. Two alphas. There's a lot of cool companies out there making low vis tactical bags to hold your rifles and your other kit and whatnot. The problem with the majority of them though is people in the know recognize them pretty easily. There's a lot of distinguishing features on those bags and they're not that covert because of it. So what I prefer to do is I prefer to get actual mainstream bags such as this Puma bag. I think I bought this on Amazon for like 30 bucks. And depending on the size of the bag, that's gonna allow me to carry a lot of different weapons. So what I'm wearing right now, I have a Mark 18 with a Eagle Industries active shooter response bag. I can fit all this into that bag, plus a bunch of other stuff. So let's go over it. I'll show you how I pack it in. So this little satchel, which has two rifle mags, medical, pistol mag, and I can have another item. This goes in the front pocket. So it is separate from the rifle. So that just slots in right here. The waist strap goes at the bottom, shoulder strap goes at the top. Kind of hook this around, zip it up, have the zippers. The zipper will be favored to one side. The Mark 18, we're good to go. I leave the magazine in, makes the assembly process just the, everything a little quicker. QD comes off. I've tried uh, putting guns together with a sling attached to each half and it's kind of a pain. So what I'm actually gonna do it's usually better if you leave it on the actual lower, is I'm just gonna fold this sling up, and then have that attached 
secure the rail with the bungee that we provide with our sling. So now the sling and the upper are together. Goes right in, lower goes on top. So the magazine's already in the lower of the gun. Uh, it makes just building the whole gun out a little easier, a little faster. Shove that in, collapse the stock, or leave it uncollapsed if you wanna go a little quicker. I have it collapsed. And then all I have to do is take this zipper. Uh, uh, uh. Favor it to one side, so you're gonna pick one side for it to basically be on. Actually, I need to turn the entire upper. So the sling is facing out. And there we go. Normal backpack with a Mark 18, extra ammo, medical, all that good stuff. I have a spare tourniquet on the side. I could add other things if I wanted, but for the sake of this demo, just a rifle. Set the stock, make sure the pins are out, upper, index. Chamber the weapon so I can start shooting if I need to. One zipper, sling bag. Up over, waist strap, comes around, fastens, and now have all my ammo. If I have time, I can take the sling, just pull it apart, as you all saw. QD into the rear, over the top. I'm set. All that from that bag, pretty quick. That whole thing was in 40 seconds. From right here, four rounds of the reload. Out of a normal, non-covert, non-tactical, special cool bag. I think it cost me about 30 bucks. Twelve thirteen. Seventy five. Do it again. It's not as smooth as uh.
R69. I don't need to fight it really too much. Two Charlies on the right. Wasn't pulling the stock in enough. This is a new little MC external blackout setup. 6.75 inch barrel. Just doing some tests, see what I can get away with with this gun. So I wasn't pulling tight enough in the stock, so I called it two in the Charlies on the right. The rest are good. He's on the line. No, no, he's not. That was a different one. So yeah, three A's center and then two Charlies. That was in, oh, doesn't know. Uh oh. Now five up close. See it splits. Do seven. See what happens. Stand by. All right, so five rounds at seven yards. 300 blackout subs. It's 107. So a 1 4 split, a 1 5 split, a 1 4 split, a 1 4 split. I like it. 1 4 splits. And these are all alphas. Yep, all A's. Yes, yes, yes. Let's see if we can do five in under a second. Actually, no. Screw that. Three row three. Got a little uh, caught in my pocket, but looks like we're all A's again. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Three reload three in a four two eight at seven, seven to ten somewhere in there. First shot in a six eight. It's not bad. And my splits again. Two nine. Uh, one four one five. Okay. Seven three. Ooh, close. Six eight. A box and a six six. All right. So there's three headshots at five yards, and it's ranging from a seven two to like a six something. And then we're gonna do low ready, which at this range should be under half. From low ready, weapon aimed at the feet of the target. Just running this drill in standards with the new gun, new setup. Five one. All right. That is a four seven. One more. And now it's up at the top. Oh, skeletal stock did me in. So that was a five one. That was a four four. Am I over the top right here? It's a four seven. This 6.7 300 blackout. Conservative. That's an A1019. Two Charlies. Alpha Charlie here. No, I'm good. Oh, shoot. Just barely. And Alpha Charlie. We've got, ooh, Alpha Delta. Now, Alright, 
So that's a full course of fire three on everything. Running our sidecar for a stock Glock 19 with an X300. So I had to make up here, called it as I was arriving into position, wasn't fully settled. So I'm happy about that. We have three alphas on him. Took this guy on the exit. So we've got two A's on the line, Charlie slash Delta. Not great. Two alphas, Delta. I have to stop for this guy. It's a low percentage. I uh, went for headshots. I've got B off on the side. And that's probably it. So I got a mic. And on this guy entering, I've got on the line Alpha so 3As. And this guy didn't really have a sight picture on him because he's super close. And but got Alpha Charlie Delta. Yeah. idea what the time is because the timer flew off but that's running this little nine inch bcm 300 blackout no suppressor and um with the law folder it can fit in that pretty standard backpack easily let's see what we got two alphas and at least they're both on the side kind of on the side of the target we had alpha and neck shot two headshots a zone solid two a's Two alphas, two alphas. This is six alphas. Six inch 300 blackout MCX. Hit. The other one must have gone over the top. It's possible I doubled up, but I kind of doubt it. These are solid in the same hole, practically. We got Alpha Charlie. Alpha Charlie. Alpha Alpha. Alpha 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 Alpha. alpha. Charlie, Alpha Charlie. alphas right next to each other running this BCM 9 inch 3 in a blackout the Magpul CTR stock which uh, increases accuracy and split times your overall lethality having this sucker your rate of fire strafing speed pretty much everything it just, it just does everything headshot so I put a hundred meters zero with these subs well actually no this gun's totally like unzeroed I don't know exactly what's going on well, zero with the suppressor, not zero with the uh, unsuppressed. I probably need to hold under based on uh, not having the can. I'm not holding under enough. So Alpha, Charlie on the move, just sliding through here, slide canceling like a, like a twitchy streamer on five different energy drinks. Some of you 
all may have seen the video I just did where I deployed a Mark 18 split in half out of a $30 Puma bag, a very standard backpack, and people were remarking on how slow it was, how the gun isn't optimized, the bag isn't optimized. You know, why on earth would you even do that in the first place? Well, the reality is loft folders happen to be one of the hardest to get items right now, uh, and rifles with good folding stocks like MCXs are also insanely hard to get right now, and they're uh, being sold for exorbitant prices on GunBroker, $4,000. So the reality is, yes, there's always optimized equipment out there for Whatever the thing is you're trying to do, long range, precision, concealment, like, yes, there's always better stuff. But if you don't have that stuff, you have a basic gun, what can you do to fit that into a bag? Uh, what kind of bags, you know, if you don't have access to a $200 tactical bag with someone's signature name on it, what can you do? And that's why I wanted to demo, you can simply take these two pins out, because AR-15s are pretty awesome, and you can make this gun quite a bit smaller. Yes, it means building out is going to take longer, but hey, at least I have something, you know, if I have to run my pistol because that's a little quicker, cool, but if I want a rifle, now I at least have a way of putting it into a bag and it's pretty small. The reality is, though, if I have a loft folder on a standard upper like this, even once I fold the entire uh, stock or, you know, brace, it actually still ends up being longer than a rifle that I split in half like so. So even if you have a law folder, that doesn't necessarily turn the whole gun into a tiny thing. Sometimes splitting it in half is still going to be a little bit more um, space savings. So I have an example here. This is a 6.75 300 blackout MCX with a, a 762 Surefire Suppressor. Uh, but as you can see, by splitting my AR in half here, a 10 and a half, um, it ends up being actually a little shorter. Uh, then this weapon right here, which is optimized for putting into a bag. It is optimized for low viz, you know, tactical operations and asymmetric warfare and all that good stuff. Uh, but this right here is a combined package. Uh, this M4 with this 10 and a half barrel actually ends up being shorter. If we take this nine inch 300 blackout BCM unsuppressed with a law folder, uh, even with this folded, this 10 and a half barrel ends up being about the same length uh, once you put it up against this gun. So while law folders are super cool, if I did do a law folder with this uh, particular upper, so I'm gonna move that to here, now the entire thing is about two inches longer than if I split the entire gun in half. And unfortunately, that two inches can make or break what kind of bags you use. It's kind of unfortunate because you'll go and buy a bag, it's like 21.5 inches or whatever, and your gun's 22 inches, and it won't fit because of that. So splitting your gun in half, regardless of whether you have a law folder or not, um, actually will save you a little bit of space in the long run. So there is a time and a place, I believe, to practice putting a rifle together quickly that you do split in half, um, especially if it's a longer weapon, you know, maybe a 14.5, a 16, an SPR, something like that, because you do get to save quite a bit of space in doing something like this. Are there cool optimized guns on the market and cool bags that are really expensive with people's names on them that have all sorts of cool features that people can recognize in public or people in the know? Yes, that there are. Um, but that's why I wanted to demo a $30 basic backpack and how you could take a basic rifle and you can get it to fit without buying a bunch of expensive stuff. All right, 282. <whistles> 294. <whistles> 287. <whistles> that is in a 273. So 273 to a 2.9 sling. Deployment, target at 25 meters. All right. My first group was absolute trash. My second group was Quite decent. Two headshots. Wow, that's uh, nice.
magazine release is a little odd for sure. Got two Charlies wide, probably my third shot. Okay, side release is a little stiff. This is a brand new MP 2.0 compact. because I'm pushing the mag up too much. It's catching. Let's try one more time. Yeah, so that time I released the mag and it was fine. All right, all good? Boom, 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 boom. Huh, interesting. All right, not bad, not bad. rounds total. We have two alphas. We've got alpha, 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 Charlie. So one Charlie so far with two more Charlies. In three, four, three, provided I get this clip off of my pocket. There we go. Three, four, three. And that is with an MMP 2.0 compact, which I have not had a lot of time on, but uh, it is one of my more favorite pistols. That picture is a little off to the left. Oh, ouchies. All right, all right. Good. Uh, not so good. Why is my second shot? Whiffed it. Came right off the target. All right. So I am holding left somehow. Or pulling left, it's always possible. On the move, you know, I felt that one. Alpha, alpha, delta, two deltas, ouch. Charlie, 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 alpha. All right, one more time. better still seem to be holding the sights on the move three ace one Charlie and then from there I've got alpha or, yeah alpha alpha and Delta First three felt real awkward. They had two in under a second and nine and nine. And this guy up close, we got alpha. Looks like a delta, this range. Wow, yeah, I do suck. But I also didn't see sights alpha. So alpha, alpha, delta maybe? Charlie, alpha, delta, huh. Yeah, I need to go back to 25 and see what's going on. It's probably me. But these are all very consistent. Yeah, let's go back to 25. Felt like consistent trigger breaks. My sight was kind of... Where's center? Oh yeah, it's all off to the left. Well, actually no, hang on. Yeah, there's not there's one, two. Oh, three. Do this. Okay. 
yeah, it's shooting way left. Yeah. Guys, I aimed here yep. for that one. Had a few bankups in there. We'll see if they paid off. This guy got three alphas. I knew I was like, oh, I didn't reload coming into position. Gonna have a non side lock reload. Didn't lock to the rear. Charlie, two alphas. Shot this guy twice. Yep, so two Charlies. Four A's. Then this guy coming in. I see just a straight forward movement. I've got, I fired an extra. I didn't need to, they're all A's. Not bad for a first run with this particular MP, MP Core, the Delta Point Pro. Fired three shots to confirm zero, and off I went using our X300 Ragnarok in, uh, oh, uh, in a new color. Working tac mags, changing position, standing, crouching around a high wall. Pretty simple stuff. I want those tac mags to be nice and quick. We're gonna have a total of eight shots where we should. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're good at about 16 meters. And a total time, that's four different tac mags. That's in 1543. Not too shabby. As some of you know, the Steiner D-Ball series of lasers generally come with their own proprietary pressure switch. It has a very similar hookup from a PEC-15 L3 Insight type uh, pressure pad, but it's not in exactly the same. It stays hooked into the D-Ball much better than if you take a PEC-15 pressure pad. However, this mod button, PEC-15 Insight uh, pressure pad right here, actually has a much more positive hookup in the D-Ball uh, than a standard PEC-15 pressure pad. It's much harder for it to come out. Uh, I don't think I would need to run tape over it or do the super glue trick, which I've also done in the past uh, with a PEC-15 pressure pad going into a D-ball. Uh, but this little guy right here actually works really well. So if you have a D-ball, an I-squared, an A3 like this one, or any of the other ones, and you're looking for a good pressure pad, uh, you know, not relying on one of the Surefire ones for PEC-15 or an actual PEC-15 pressure pad, uh, definitely check out the Mod Light Mod Button uh, PEC-15 pressure pad because it actually works quite well. Uh, with the D-Ball series of lasers. All right, so that's full power D-Ball. We're gonna do a little experiment. In the day, it is overcast, but people are like, hey, Viz lasers are awesome, which at night or at dusk or whatever, yes. Now these are probably a little high because I've uh, it's not fully zeroed. So well, that's a next shot. Looks like our accuracy is good though. Yeah, 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 we're good. All, all A is minus one next shot. In a time of 541. So on one target transition there, I totally lost my laser. And with the distance I am from these targets, I was losing the laser as well. It was bouncing up off of the target. And then I kind of got to bring the laser back to it. Whereas with the red dot, I get to see that sighting system at all times as it rises and falls. Uh, and you know, it doesn't matter what distance I'm shooting targets. I always can see where my sight is. So now I'll shoot the same drill with the T2 and we'll see what happens. Stand by. All right, I was in 381. I feel pretty good about that run. Two alphas up close, way faster. And it's overcast. You can actually see a high vis laser right now, but they are not faster when you start dealing with target transitions and uh, two A's. Target transitions, high speed marksmanship, they are not faster at all. Now night vision's a little different because you can see it at all times. You can see a positive beam. But with a vis laser in the day, all I'm seeing is the, you know, the point at which it's, you know, omitting onto the target. So 
That was the total time. So 541 with the laser, with one neck shot, all alphas. And this was an all alpha run in 381 with an aim point T2. Quite a bit better. The first two shots in a 7-3 at five yards uh, and with a 1-5 split. Not bad. A box, 4-8. Laser. Five five. Red dot. A box. Four six. Laser. Lost it. Was off on the right side. All right. So that's my half second headshot and your half a second uh, standard. So first uh, T two shot, laser shot, T two shot. Those were both under 0.5, which is my standard. This was a five five, and this because I threw the laser up to here. Had no point of reference where I'm actually aiming because, well, I don't get to see a consistent laser beam like Star Wars. I had to then bring the gun back to where I thought it would be on the target. That's when I saw the laser, took my shot, and it flashed uh, downwards. And that was at an 8-0. So, in the day, even when it's overcast like this and I'm running a high-powered laser like this uh, D-Ball A2, uh, Red Dot is still faster than running this Viz laser. Uh, if I come off target with that Viz laser, you know, I'm in the shoulder. I don't necessarily know exactly where I'm aiming. So... That's why a red dot uh, is superior. Although if I had to, if this all of a sudden died and I had to run this sucker and it was overcast, it can, it can still work. But uh, not great, not great. All right, 579, all A's. I had one Charlie on the left side calling it a success a lovely success it's okay to miss if you call it if you don't call it you suck two one zero so I'm good I gotta be sub seven for this part So sub three is at 10 yards, sub three for the transition, which is a very comfortable amount of time. And then sub seven uh, to get your mag stowed properly, reload your rifle, which this is, it should probably be eight to be a little more considerable, but I have all A's, rifle shot, rifle shot, pistol shot, and we're good to go. So sub three and sub eight. Sub seven is cooking, and sub three is not. So eight and three. Yeah, that mag does want to catch. Okay, let's check our hits here. What's our time? Two headshots. Again, we're doing the same thing. Awesome, right on. Six, eight, eight. Six, eight, eight. Awesome, so we'll take a headshot. Headshot. A little bit low and a good headshot. Two pistol shots. Again, one a little low and a good decent A. Working every mag on my, this Haley. I can't remember the model number for this thing, but it holds four rifle mags, I had three. 
pistol mags in the front up to four. I had two. And I'm just working from about 25 meters. Changing position every time. Pulling behind cover, obstacle, concealment. We've got, these are probably the shots I'm around on the left edge. So we got Charlie, 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 Delta, Alpha, 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 Alpha. That's already marked. May have some doubles. There's a pistol shot. Uh, and that goes over to there. Not great, but not too bad. But I am happy about the gear manipulation and the movement. That's cool. Just because you have a modern slick plate carrier like the AC-1 or like other carriers on the market, it doesn't mean you can take a traditional chest rig like this Haley, I, I don't know what the model number is on these, there's so many now, uh, but a larger, more traditional chest rig that comes with a harness and be able to attach this directly to the plate carrier. Uh, so most of these more modern chest rigs out there have the swift clip buckles. So what that means is I can take this Clip it right into my swift clip buckles, like on this AC-1. Get that one. Just gotta make sure the Velcro behaves. But the downside is, on uh, some carriers, is I have a lot of weight on here and the sides are going to flap around if they're not being able to adhere to the Velcro uh, with the cummerbund. So, what I like to do to fix some of that, this is particularly helpful. It's particularly helpful if you have a plate carrier that has a rear flap like the AC-1. You open the flap up. You take the standard little side strap that you normally use to attach the chest rig uh, behind you. I actually move it from the bottom. Normally it'd be on the bottom. I move it up to the top. I route this through the top channel. So I have the cummerbund right here. I uh, route this here on the top of the plate carrier to keep the chest rig pulled nice and tight into the chest rig into the plate carrier. I just drop my flap on top. So now this is trapped. It's really not going to go anywhere uh, now that it is trapped. So there it is, ready to go. I keep this attached to one side of the chest rig placard. So as you can see, I'm going to have it fastened on this side with the cummerbund. And now I have it, you know, open on this side. So then I go to put it on. Always gets my sunglasses. Attach the cummerbund. So I have the strap, chest rig strap. There's the tourniquet. So cummerbund, put that on there. Then I take my chest rig strap. This is where I'm going to tighten it down. So as you can see, pulling tight now, right here. Nice and tight. Pull this nice and tight. Fasten. And now I have this standard chest rig placard nicely attached to the plate carrier, even if I don't have Velcro adhering on the sides. This also applies to larger chest rigs like the Mayflower or Velocity ones. You just run your little chest rig strap through the AC-1 or similar plate carrier through the cummerbund area. Although some plate carriers, uh, like the Slickster and other ones that like that, aren't going to be able to support this. Uh, but then you just literally have your little strap coming across, and that helps keep everything stabilized, especially if you're running four mags, a lot of extra weight. That's pretty dope. Works well. Shooter, stand by. Oh, wow. Okay. Shooter, stand by. Point, point six, stand by. Point six five. Yeah, not gonna make it with this gun having not shot it. It's fine. Those are all like six fives. Your turn. Shooter ready. Ready. Stand by. Stand by. Four nine. Stand by. Four five. Yep, stand by. I think that's six rounds, isn't it? 1.07. 1 1.07, five in. So I would have been all right. All right, Josh, you're up. Is it five or six? It's five. It's one, one, zero. One, one, two. Six, six. Stand by. Five, zero. Stand by. Six. Those are both low. One, two, seven. Six, 
107, clean. 105, nice, nice. One shot. Yeah, I'm in right. Little bit. This is a bad boy out here. Bye. DMR, basically, it's felt solid. Right. Time, 2.76. So I still made time. Part time is three seconds. Sixteen thirty-one. Should ready. Stand ready. by. Two fifty-eight. All right, shooter ready? Yep. Stand by. Oh, shoot. Come on. Six ninety eight with two extra rounds. Three Charlie. Running the three by magna uh, ACOG. Five and a little quicker at the RMR. Alpha, Charlie, Alpha, 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 Alpha. Time of 21.92. I know, I think so. Because I saw it. One, two, three, four, five. Five Charlies. And I'm going to call myself a Delta just because I think I threw one. Oh, yeah. Five Charlies, two Deltas. Twenty-six thirty. So I ran the RMR, and it appears I am here. It appears it is not fully zeroed. I'm gonna call that five Charlie, six Charlie. I'll sleep in a mart.
springs in 27. One, two, three. Best. Three, Charlie. Not bad. Seven eighty-six. Yeah, it's got the game to the mag. Yeah. One more time. Five five zero. Yeah. Yeah. I have one in the Del uh, the Charlie Borderline Delta. Eighty. Two A's, two Charles. Oh, hey, look, I aced it. So I had two Charlies for eleven seconds. Running this really for the first time, I had some issues when I first got it. With the uh, fixed four power LCAN, we have alpha, 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 alpha. Nice. Then over here we have Charlie, alpha, Charlie, alpha. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. On this thing sucks quite a bit super loose you have to get it to click into position for it to actually like allow you to fire so if you don't want 80 it perfectly you're screwed this target we have alpha 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 not bad Pretty solid. One Charlie and two in the head. The rest are good.
So this is a rifle that you don't see super often. This is a Daewoo. This is issued to the South Korean military. And one of the companies over in South Korea was kind enough to send me uh, this M-Lock rail, which kind of modernizes this weapon. Uh, it's uh, M-I-T-S Precision. MITS Precision. Uh, set this rail over. It's pretty cool because the front of the uh, handguard rail is a little lower than the top side. So if you mount a PEC-15 or a laser on there, uh, your normal optic is going to shoot right over that. But the biggest problem with this rifle right here is the safety. It's a very loose, has no sproing to it, and you can rotate it from either side. So you can't just shove the safety all the way to fire. If you shove too much, you're in a bad way. And until it is actually clicked into a semi to fire, it will not fire. So if you go to here, you know, if you're doing a shoulder bump, uh, the weapon will not be able to uh, detonate the primer. So I'm going to try another technique because I've been pushing down with my thumb like so. Um, I'm actually going to try pushing, pushing it all the way around and hoping to stop in the same spot every time. So I'm on fire. See what happens. Five yard headshot standard, which with normal guns I do in under half a second. I am also running magnified. So there's that. Stand by, old method. All right, good headshot, and that was in a 141. We'll do it again. I'm having to work the safety, it's a 94. Now we'll go backwards. Nope. It's a good headshot, but it's too long. No, it's not 8-2. And that's still a 118. I'll go back to regular. So I'm having to work the safety before I get on the gun. Because it gets real weird if you're already out there. Yeah, see, I pushed it, but then it wasn't it wasn't quite enough. Low ready. Okay, I mean that was decent. It's an 8-8. No, with a 7.7, that's the best yet. That's my grip right there. So I have to hold a little higher uh, with this particular optic and everything going on. But the safety is not great. It's not super consistent. It's obviously, as you can see, slower. I'm having to hit the safety, then bring the gun up. Um, we'll, we'll get it to work. It's just a training thing. It's a different platform, different weapon. But uh, definitely a little lackluster. If there's some cool aftermarkets out there that you guys know about or some of you South Korean guys know about, uh, let me know. Would love to upgrade this and build it out a little more. Obviously, after I've already done this rail and I got to figure out something to do with this Clinton era barrel muzzle device combo. Maybe chop it down, make it a little shorter or something. But all in all, it's a really nice gun. Um, it's different. I like it. A little paratrooper stock combo. Kind of mix up the sequence there a little bit.
little time of nothing. get healed. So what I'm playing with here is a fast way of grabbing a bunch of medical gear and I was playing around with hey I can take a DACA pouch fill it full of stuff med and by attaching shock cord to the four corners I can create this super lightweight little bag that you can simply sling on you and have, or like I, you know, put it on as a little backpack. And if I have to drop it off to other people, because I've talked to some departments who've wanted something similar, where they can literally just ditch it, leave it with people. It's got three tourniquets, a bunch of other hemorrhage stuff, burn dressings, chest seals. And you can literally just chuck this to people and just wear it however. Then you grab your rifle. And you're set. Doesn't get in the way. Lightweight. I don't know. Something I'm playing with. thing is, I bet those are from one string of fire in one location. Two off, this is two Charlies. All right, so three Charlie. Twenty nine, twenty nine.
five. Pulled one left on him. Two, four, five. Two, three, six. Awesome. Two, six, one. And then recently we went out and we purchased 10 uh, police trade-in MCXs from a department in Pennsylvania. It was actually through a reseller. Uh, they all came with the now discontinued SIG suppressors, which actually work pretty well. They're super quiet and lightweight. Uh, keeping them tight to the gun, though, seems to be a little bit of an issue. So we'll figure, we'll figure something out. Uh, but we built all these out for a project we're working on. So they've all got 10 PECs or LA-5s. They pretty much all have EOTEX, and they've all got similar stocks. And this is kind of the build. And um, the MCX is one of my favorite, if not my favorite, out-of-the-box factory gun. Um, they're super easy to modify, adjust, build. You can shoot them stock folded or collapsed, unlike standard M4s. Um, they also just have some of the cool factor associated with them of what kind of units are using them now. Call of Duty, uh, I'm sure movies are going to have these more uh, shortly. Um, so this is basically, at least in my opinion, based on right now, this is basically the new 416.
So low vis stuff is pretty big right now. If you guys hadn't noticed, if you go online and look for any sort of PDW bags, rifle bags, subgun bags, SBR bags, you'll see that the majority of them are out of stock. The other product that indicates that people are getting more interested in low vis and just truck guns and small guns is that law folders, which has been the hardest product for us to stock over the past year, they're very hard to find. Demand is insane for you know various accessories for your firearms that can make everything smaller and more compact. So in the process of looking for low vis PDW subgun SBR bags and whatnot, uh, people are you know when they Google that or you go to you know you're looking around on your favorite gun website. The majority of them out there aren't actually very low vis and they're expensive and usually they're out of stock. So what I prefer to do if I'm going actually low vis and trying to wear something that doesn't look like a trench coat in the summer, and by trench coat in the summer I mean, you know, I can wear a trench coat and I can conceal RPGs and stuff under my jacket, but if I wear that downtown Nashville in the summer, everyone knows something's off. The majority of low vis bags out there are kind of like trench coats. It's a big square with a little handle and you carry it around. It's not a bag that normal everyday people are using and it's kind of like a trench coat. So what I have right here is a $30 Jansport bag that I bought on Amazon and it happens to fit an MP5 just fine. Now it could fit your favorite Rattler 300 Blackout and there's a couple little modifications I did to it because one of the, you know, actual SBR subgun bags, they do a good job of usually optimizing the bag for holding a gun, that's great. Uh, sometimes they'll have a pull handle that is a little more obvious with that you grab with your entire hand that you will use to actually get in and get to the weapon. Uh, this Jansport doesn't have that because it was originally intended for like laptops and whatever crap. Uh, so what I did is I took gaff tape and I literally taped one color for the gun pocket and one color for the uh, little, little bandolier pocket. So I can immediately go down and go, I need this pocket to get to the gun. So black and green opens up the large pocket of the bag that has my MP5. 20 round magazine, so it fits in there a little bit better. I removed the Surefire 4 end because it does stick out a little longer. And I added this Insight WMX, which can be folded here on the bottom to make it a little smaller. And I can fold it out, out of the way, activate very easily. It's actually super dope. I've never used it quite like that. So when I have the gun out, ready to go, then I go for the yellow tape, pull that out. And then I have this sweet little first spear uh, bandolier. Now this is not something you know, that's been made, you know, Instagram famous. You don't see lots of shooters running around, you know, with these. Uh, but the reality is, you know, this is something I went and found on eBay for $75 and it works really well. Holds what five, up to five MP5 magazines for 150 rounds. Uh, but what I actually have right here is three 30 round magazines, a trilog suppressor, cause why not? And then a tourniquet, which is one of the most commonly used uh, medical, you know, pieces of gear uh, to prevent major bleeding. So I have a tourniquet, suppressor, and three magazines. When it comes out of the bag, this is really cool, they have a little handle here, I would assume, for this purpose. I literally grab from here, shoulder strap it, take the waist strap to stabilize it to my body, buckle it in the rear. It normally has a G-hook, I substituted it for a buckle. Grab the MP5, I have it on a one point, you could do a two point, but I just have it on a one point for now, and I'm set. Then, if for whatever reason, I need to add my suppressor, I can do that, fold the inside over to the side, retract the stock, and I'm good. I can still get to my sidecar if I absolutely need to. I've got my three magazines right here that are quite accessible, and then I have my tourniquet, and I'm set. And all of this is contained in a non-gun, non-tactical, non-SBR, you know, marketed bag. Um, now, I'm not saying you should go out and buy this bag exactly. This is just to give you ideas into other kinds of bags you might be able to get. Because yeah, if all of us start running around with this bag, it kind of defeats the purpose. Um, but you can go get similar bags from other companies, Nike, Puma, Bombs Demand Action, I'm sure they have a bag. And uh, start carrying your guns, provided you have a small weapon of some sort, or even a broken down AR, in one of those. Instead of waiting six months for your favorite tactical low vis bag to come back into stock. Because right now, everything low vis is in high demand. And that's because of the stuff that happened last year that you all saw. And people are just wisening up to more legitimate threats of our day. So I've got the Holosun 509T here. 
I'm just now finally getting around to using one. I know it's been out for a little while. They were hard to get at first and people were dubbing it the Acro Killer. And to some extent, it has been the Acro Killer as far as battery life goes. The original Acro having horrible battery life. I've got a couple of those. Uh, but now there's a new Acro coming out that looks like they've solved the issue. They're going to a normal uh, watch battery 2032. And so that'll be solved and that's awesome. Uh, but this is still a contender for an enclosed dot, obviously. Great optic. Uh, it's what I've been reading and hearing from cool people, and now I'll be using it myself. Now, you have two reticle options on the 509T. You have a center dot, and then you also have the sort of EOTech style uh, bullseye reticle. Now, we're going to do a little shooting test right here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and shoot, because I'm also interested in this just myself, because I haven't done this yet. Uh, three targets, just a simple uh, aimbot drill, but I'm starting on one target nice and close. So from the holster, you know, flash sight picture, I'm not going to have a perfect sight picture. See if that, you know, extra large bullseye will make me a little faster or a little more consistent. Uh, so we're going to do three rounds on each. So from close to far, we will start on a single dot. So this is just the single dot option. I'm in manual. They have an auto mode and a manual mode. The auto mode is actually uh, very responsive, which is really cool, uh, but I don't like auto usually. So we're gonna do a little manual. Three rounds on each, nice and close, going on through for this target about 15 meters. Stand by. All right, little slow start. This is my, uh, this is my cold start right here. Two alphas and a Charlie. Three alphas. And then two alphas and a Charlie. So two Charlies total. Not bad, not bad. And four, 12. And now we will do it with the big reticle. And my theory is I'll be a little faster. I don't know if you can kind of see the big reticle. It's quite large. It's huge. My theory is it'll be a little quicker up close to some extent. But I'll have a little more trickiness at range or shooting steel once this entire reticle eats up the entire target. Yeah, because right now I'm aiming at the C-Zone steel about 20 meters away. It's covering up the entire target. I don't think I would ever recommend using the entire bullseye. My first shot on this guy was a 9-2. I was done with him in one three, one three four. All right, here we go. Let's do this. Stand by. Really slow start, like really, really slow. But I do have all three uh, alphas, one in the line. I haven't shot a thirty-four in a while. First shot in nine five. Alpha hits here. This guy. Definitely a little trickier. I had to slow him down because the reticles eats up at that range this entire Alpha Charlie zone. But I did have he's mostly on the line or on the Charlie, but two A's and a Charlie. That was in a 446, so it was actually slower, which makes sense. A little having to slow down a little bit on these far targets because the reticle is huge. Uh, I should have been able to go faster on the close target. I was done on the close target in a 1 4. Uh, compared to a 134 or 136, whatever it was. Now I'll shoot steel with it. Big. We'll do dot. A single dot. Two rounds at 20, it's more like 30 meters. And then we'll go for two rounds with uh, the big, the big, uh, the big circle. All right, next to control, so three, two, nine. All right, that was much more representative. 205, get a mulligan. Now, big reticle. All right, two, four, three. I tried to go fast on it. We'll do one more. It was a 318. I just put the whole red on there. There we go. Definitely a little trickier to shoot at range, especially on a smaller target like that with the huge reticle. So uh, I'll be sticking with the single dot, which I'm sure most people are doing. 
and that's what I would recommend single dot you still run it nice and close as you can see uh, but it's also a lot easier to take out the distance it won't cover up your entire target so pretty cool pretty cool little setup I like it it's fun and yes I did cover the logos up bite me All right, so a little MP5 to pistol, 10 yards, USPSA. We have three Charlies. This is from the first burst. That was one of the Glock shots. But the rest is good at 10. That last, I have no idea, I was shooting suppressed. But my MP5 to pistol with five rounds in 4.1 seconds using a sidecar and a first spear little subgun bandolier. It's not super high speed, flashy, cool, but it does the job. It can hold five magazines. I have three MP5, suppressor, tourniquet. The suppressor's on here right now. Upside down with a flat pouch is not bad. That's a 331 at 15, 18 meters on C zone. But we gotta make sure we're consistent. So throw that back in. That's not bad. Not bad. All right. So I had a miss, which would have been a 3-4. Uh, so 3-8. Not bad. Now, if you're going to run an upside down magazine, I strongly recommend you have some sort of active retention on it. The ITW fast mags or even a Mars carrier, probably not enough. So I'm playing with a Cry Smart Pouch, Smart Sweet Pouch, 556 pouch, and it's literally upside down. Sweep the flap down, mag kind of comes down into your hand, and then it's straight up into the gun. It's not too bad. I can also run a 7.62 in there. So that's kind of cool. All right, so running the MP5 SD for the first time today. Really getting some time in on it. I've always wanted one, and now finally got one. Four alphas. No idea what the time is because this is so quiet and it won't even pick up the timer. I'm just using the time. That was rods. I'm just using the timer as a uh, indicator, as a start. You know, getting on the gun, on sling, on the gun. All right, we got here. Uh, looks like Charlie. Alpha, Charlie, I don't know what the heck this is. Might have been from earlier. So a couple Charlies. Not bad, not bad.
grip to our right hand, and uh, one Charlie. Didn't, was it focusing on a fine point on him? Was on that guy. Grip enough to my left hand. All right, so there's a couple things that I'm working through. Joel Park came through a week ago, and uh, there's a few things that I'm doing. I'm definitely I'm muscling the gun a lot with my right hand, and that does cause some issues. If I'm seeing the tendons in my hand, that means I'm gripping too tight. I need to grip more with my left hand. That already knew though. I knew that my hand is not gripping a, grip a lot uh, more recently. I am having some finger problems right here, which is preventing me from gripping as tight as I should be. But I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, the other thing is I'm not focusing on the target well enough, a fine aiming area, aim small, miss small, is a saying that I'm sure everyone here has heard. Uh, I'm just kind of looking at the entire brown, or in this case, the, uh, C zone, A zone, bringing the gun up. And the biggest issue is I'm not actually looking at the target enough. I'm focusing on where my dot goes on the target. So one thing that I'm doing to work on that, and this is a trick that people talked about before, uh, is I actually cover up my optic so that I'm not actually, you know, staring through the optic and the dot and focusing on that, but I can actually focus on the targets a little bit better. So I really focus on the target. The gun just comes to the target. So I'm focusing on the A in the A zone. Gun comes up. As soon as the dot's there, I can take my shots. So a lot of stuff to work on all at once. Um, but, you know, it's in the pursuit of being a better shooter, a more consistent shooter. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. One more. One more. Fine aiming area. Fine aiming area. And I shoot when the dot arrives to that area. Not horrible, still gripping with my right hand too much. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Didn't, uh, didn't get my sights confirmed on him. Fired too early right there. I was aimbotting hard. Same with here. Well, actually that was just, I wasn't looking at the, the target. You behave, please. I was looking at the, uh, you come on. You are, there we go. All right. I was not looking for it. I fired super early. Yeah, same thing. I I was not looking at that target on the uh, on the transition. I didn't look here. I kind of just like looked through my gun as it went across. This guy was not horrible. Granted, he's the easy one. This guy, I took my time. I looked at the A. He was all right. Motherless goat. P mag trash. A, 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 A. Look faster. Nope. I slid the gun. I, I, I started moving before I was done. Which is what that is. I'm not looking center. I did look center here, though. I was so fast at getting off the target, it was, it was perfect. It was perfection looking for that A. Perfection on these guys as well. Now, if only I can do a single perfect run, that would be incredible. Just one perfect run before the day is up would be lovely. Sit, A, 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 A. Not looking at my red dot, which is I didn't do on those and they were clean. Just looking at the target. I looked at him so good. I looked at this fool. There we go. Clean run. My grip was a little off though. But I, I really just, just burned a hole just like right there. Yeah, just got him. Um, they were alright. They were okay. He was per perfection. Perfection. Finally a perfect run after many attempts. Just tighter with the left hand. Focus on the dot. My second shot too much. So 
still gripping with my right hand too much. One more. Left hand. Focus on the dog on my second shot. All right, so what I'm doing is I am literally isolating out, focusing on a fine area on the target. So focusing right on this A and firing two shots. So I'm getting some recoil management so I can test my left hand because I need to grip tighter with my left hand. Oh, I don't have the stupid thingy. So I'm aiming with my, I'm focusing on this with my eyeballs. When the dot arrives to take my shots, I don't want to focus on the dot mentally, which I'm, I'm doing too much. I'm focusing on the dot too much and I'm, I'm following it around. That's been my biggest issue. And it, revelation, thanks to Joel Park, because now I know I've been doing wrong for the past probably year as far as marksmanship. Uh, so focusing on this, my eyes are on this. Then when the gun arrives, when the sight comes on, then I start shooting. And then my second shot, I'm picking up my left hand or my right hand, my right hand doing too much, so my left hand doing too little. And then I call it. Every single rep, you call the, the biggest issue. So I called like grip, I called, I focused on the dot on my second shot, and I'm gonna do this for now the next five months. Or longer, however long it takes. Stand by. Again, focus on the center. Have some height over board. Three or seven. Really, you just stare at the target the whole time. Boom. Boom. One ish, Charlie. Two, three. All right, one more. Well, ready. Didn't look well enough. Looked at him good. I looked at him good. The thing is, though, you really have to visualize looking here, not that. And I kind of looked here and then shifted. But those are my hits from five to six, seven yards, going pretty quick with a five-eighths riser with a T2 and a lower third on top. Like that's, I'm pretty happy with that for the last split of. Let's see what the last split is. A three-five. Just boom, boom. Total time of a eight-two, three-five. All right, my second the first shot was a little iffy, got, uh, kind of whiffed. But this is my 555. Five rounds at 50 yards into a USPSA target, all A zones, in under five seconds. So there is a standard of recoil management, smartsmanship, speed, getting on the gun fast, you don't waste time. It's in 379. Fastest I've shot this was with like a muzzle brake, 13.9 with a scope in sub three. But normal guns like this, a little different. All right, so it looks like I aced it. Yay. So all five in, I actually was holding like here because earlier I did it and it was like, we'll have to see what's going on with this gun. But aiming right here, I'm set. That was the one I whiffed, right? I felt the gun come up right as I was taking the shot. So clean run with this 10-3, T2 on a 5 8 riser, Surefire RC2 Mini or full size. All right, so what I'm working on is I have this unfortunate habit of arriving in a position and standing back up. I've known I've had this habit for a long time, but it creeps in here and there. It's probably crept in there a little bit. I also have this habit of shifting my weight to one side in a position for office. So with that, I'm trying to stay even with my weight distribution. I'm not floating to one side or this side so I can jump out of position more effectively. Four A's. All that with full kit. A recce kit. Two A's, one C, two C's. Three A's, one Charlie. So now I get to watch the video, see how I did. But it felt pretty good.
So we got the Vortex Viper PST right here. I bought one like, I want to say it was like five years ago or so. The older one, this is the Gen 2. And uh, used it for a little bit and then swapped to an ACOG. Uh, it also wasn't a very good shooter back then. But uh, gonna give this a, a whirl again. Uh, this is a foreign made optic, I want to say, uh, Philippines or something like that. Uh, it comes in at about $700, around there, $650. A uh, good price point. I will say the brightness on this reticle is impressive. It is overcast right now, but even on 10, it's it's too bright uh, in these conditions. So in sunlight, it would actually be pretty good. So for this drill, it's pretty simple. I got two papers at 10, paper at about 20, paper at 30, uh, or 28 or so. Uh, we're just going to do three rounds on each with this budget build, 16-inch FSP ballistic advantage. And uh, yeah, this looks like something from 2009 or something, you know, scope with an FSP. And yeah, it's like something from Insurgency or something. I don't know. The game, not real life. Well, and real life. Two rounds on each. All right. And now I shank one on, it felt like I'm on this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So two alphas, delta, three A's, nice and close. That's bad. I shanked that guy on uh, timing, this trigger, transition, all that good stuff, triple A's. Alphas and a Charlie. That was in a time of 497 for a total of 12 rounds. Not super shabby, although we did have a Delta, so I failed. All right. All A's. All A's. One Charlie. Two Charlies, one A. Hostage blade at 100 meters, two misses. 834, the Viper PST. Drop one Charlie on that slew of five rounds. And all is. So let's talk about the STAC T-Rex 7.62 placard. It is essentially our 5.56 placard, this guy right here, only 7.62, you guessed it. Um, it's simply bigger, it will fit your standard SR25 AR10 pattern style magazines, SCAR, G3, uh, any of those mags that are you know 30 caliber and nice and fat and, uh, and thick. Uh, now the question is, hey, how well do these run with 7.62 by 39 AK magazines? Because when people hear 7.62, they immediately jump to AK mags. Um, they do wobble around a little bit inside because an AK magazine is not as wide as a AR-10 pattern uh, style magazine. So does it doesn't work? Yes, it does. Um, 545 mags can be used in uh, this one, AK mags. And the 7.62 by 39 can be used in these, but they will rattle and wobble a little bit. But the cool thing with these placards is because it's a Kydex in style insert, you could potentially remold it around your AK magazine or kind of like push it in on the edges or do something funky and get it to work with your 762 by 39 magazines a little bit better. I don't necessarily recommend that, but it's something you can definitely uh, consider. As far as the retention goes on these, depending on the magazine, it is going to be uber super tight, uh, like a G3 magazine. It has lots of little like rivets and weird stuff going on on those. And so what I would recommend is if you are having issues with that, depending on what um, you know 762 mag you're using, Consider a taking the insert out and taking a hair dryer or a heat gun to the uh, the sides. It's something that I do to kind of loosen these up a little bit, and it also depends on how you're going to be running it. So there's two ways that the placard can be used. You have the standard uh, swift clip buckles that are included with one wrap to set the height of the buckle inside of the uh, inside of the rig. Uh, the one wrap is you know, on the inside, and then you pull it looser, tighter, whatever. And if you want to remove the buckle, all you do is uh, pull the entire thing out, pull the buckle out, shovel the one wrap back in, close the kydex, and you're done. Which is what I've done on this guy right here. And the reason for that is my AC1 is set up to be slick. I've removed the swift clip 
uh, chasm buckles that are included. And all I do now is I slap this sucker on. And then my cummerbund is actually going to fasten to the front of the placard itself. What this does is it just pulls everything super tight to the body. It just feels really good. It doesn't slosh around, move around. These aren't gonna like flip up like some placards do because the cummerbund is pulling it tight and uh, tight to the carrier. Uh, the downside to this though is when you are doing this, depending on how tight you're wearing the cummerbund, the retention on your two side magazines is going to be tighter, which again is why I like to loosen the Kydex so that if I am doing this, I can still get the magazine out um, fairly effortlessly. So with all that said, if you have any further questions on this, uh, go ahead and email us at team at trex-arms.com. But let's go and shoot with this sucker. This is why you loosen the Kydex. One fifty. What? Three hundred. What? Mini van. Good. A couple people, you were kind of, kind of standing like this. You know, the gun's right here. You're not leaning into it a whole lot. I don't think we, you know, you need to lean into it uh, super aggressively. But what I like to do is have one foot behind the other. That gives me good mobility if I need to jump left to right, side to side. I don't put my feet together. We don't do any of this dumb crap. This is horrible. Uh, have one foot behind the other. Could be one, or, either or, depending on which side. So generally, there's a saying and. I like it to an extent, but I kind of want to break it down because this is going to be real important to what we're about to do is some of this uh, driving on the target, getting that initial sight picture and going to work. And that is speed is fine, but accuracy is final. Now, the reason I have a problem with that saying is it implies that accuracy is the most important thing at all times always. The reality is if I am here to Josiah, I don't need an overwhelming, amazing amount of marksmanship to hit you. I'm not going to need that. I'm going to demo that actually here in a second when I uh, show this. So the way I like to see it, the way I like to draw it, is I have this chart. And on one side I've got priority, on this side I have distance. 
Do I have a colored Sharpie? No, I have silver. That's fine. So my distance starts at one meter, say five, 10, 50, 100, 200, 300, 400. So we have distance that is obviously getting further away. If I had two color Sharpies, this is where I'd come in with two colors. But you have two axes running through this. You have the importance of the priority of speed, which at close range is very high, but it starts to go down, some of that like really fast visceral speed up close, because our target's further away. So this is our speed, this line right here. But we have over here marksmanship, which is less of a priority at close range because speed is more important, but it's still there. It's not zero, but there is importance for marksmanship. But it starts to get more important at distance. And these lines start to, you know, at 100 meters, we still have some good emphasis on speed, but we also have a lot of emphasis on accuracy. It's starting to get more important at 100 meters than it is at one meter. So both of these lines are just as important to each other. They just fluctuate based on my distance to the target, how big the target is, and what the opportunity of the target is. So speed and accuracy, so accuracy is this one over here, speed is this one, they are both equally as important. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna run the same drill, single shot. We're gonna start at one meter, and then we're gonna end up going back to 50. And what I wanna see from you guys, and what kind of what we're, we're playing with right now is making sure our gun stays nice and fast, and you guys are gonna feel this. When we're back here at 50, which is right here, the marksmanship starts to be more important on the scale and our speed will come down some. It's going to be about right here instead of super fast 0.3 seconds up close. That is going to slow down some because we're trying to get a little further away. Does this all make sense to you all? They're both equally important. One is not absolutely more important than the other. I can get shots from the hip at three feet away and that's not marksmanship. Not really. That's just getting some basic hits, but what's most important there is gonna be my speed that's way up here on the priority list. Any questions on this little graph? No, awesome, well, I'm gonna demo this. Outside of it, it's probably a point six. That was inside. Inside under half a second. Nope. Nice. Failed. Three and a half second, and we got two hits. One inside of half. The other two are out. Close. You might have done it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. One, two, three, four. In three and a half seconds. Not the best shots, but it was within time. On this guy. On the line. Two alpha. Five alpha. Two alpha, one Charlie. Nice, do it again. Big time by a second. Drove the gun pretty hard though. Two alphas, all A's, and my three alphas. Perfect gun. Wow. Accuracy set. That is very difficult with an MP5 under three seconds. Stand by. Ah! No! No, 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 no! Uh, oh, butterfingers, butterfingers. MP5 reloads. Uh, I've gone down the drain a little bit. Some marksmanship's there, though. Now this next one, par time, I think it's nine. Ah, I'll 
else to run out of ammo there. Pistol shots were lackluster. Sweaty hands, bad grip. Two Charlies. Uh, within time though on the transition with the fire, barely. And uh, getting the gun back up. Whew. This is the new sidecar. This is the default configuration of the sidecar. What you have is none of the accessories attached on the side, but instead you have this little wing that has one of these standard clips attached to it. So what this means is I have a very stable appendix carry only holster because I have two clips attached to the belt, or I can actually run this holster in the four o'clock position, which originally with the sidecar design was something you just couldn't do. So appendix carry, I do one clip and then the other. The claw on this side helps drive the grip of the gun into the body. Then I have my EDC Glock 19 right here. Every single sidecar is optic cut because the future is now. I'm just gonna do something real simple on this guy. All right, so pinnace carry draw. As you can see with both clips here on the belt, the holster won't move. It's not gonna flip around. It's not gonna change its angle. So I can have a very consistent draw every time. Now the cool thing with having the two clips like this is I can actually run this holster in the four o'clock position. Although I highly recommend removing the claw as it makes putting the holster on a little more tricky. So the other thing you can do is adjust the ride height of the clips, especially with the clip in the front and that can give you some angle and some cant at three o'clock, four o'clock or five o'clock that can make you know getting the gun and just drawing in general a little bit easier. So four o'clock, this is basically a straight up and down. There's no cant at all. Do this in the seated position. Got my jacket over here. So the shirt is just pulled here behind the gun. You can obviously have the shirt behind it as well. Not the cleanest draw ever. Some jacket stuff. But yeah, four o'clock right here, single head shot. <laughs> With the makeup. But as you can see, for the first time ever, now you can take a sidecar holster, you can run it at four o'clock. I've gone from a four o'clock holster into a sidecar with a pistol magazine. Looks pretty familiar, right? Plus, it has some bend in the center, which depending on your body type can be helpful. Doesn't matter as much for me. So I've got my 17 extended mag. Works pretty well. Let's do one more. Just a isolated reload. So this guy right here. Jacket's getting in the way a little bit. One more. 
as you can see the pistol magazine is still accessible oh shoot alrighty so in the rain a little slippery a little nasty but you still can take this from a four o'clock holster or a dedicated penny scary holster into a holster with a magazine just like a traditional sidecar. Now let's get a little, little funky. So the other thing you can do is you can take this holster, pull the pin, and you can run something like this. You can have a tourniquet, which is obviously something that's very important. If you know how to create holes, you also should know how to plug them. So if you want to carry a tourniquet a little easier than just shoving, shoving it in your pocket, you can run that on here as well. We're gonna run a rifle magazine. Friction washer, drop it right in the middle. Pin. This is how fast it is to take your sidecar and reconfigure it for whatever you want. So, same thing. We'll run a 30. You could also run a 20, it's a little more com comfortable. Yeah, no, no, we'll run the 20. Yeah, we'll run the 20. So, this will be dedicated appendix because this is a little too big to run at uh, four o'clock, obviously. You need to loosen the belts a little bit. Same pistol, new magazine. Got my 20 round P mag, 5.56 ready to go. You can run this either rounds forward or rounds away. Again, this is something you can play with and see kind of what you like. We're about to get uh, about to get weird. belt on. Safety first everyone. There's obviously lots of techniques and theories about where the seat belt, seat belt should be in relation to your clothes and your holster. For this we're just going to have a sort of the shirt on top and we're going to see what happens. Then, if I need to, I can still run my pistol, do whatever I need to do. But that is a sidecar with a rifle magazine carrier. And let's just do a real isolated reload. So this time with a 30 round magazine. 30 rounder, let's work this guy right here. I don't have the timer, that's fine. As you can see, pretty accessible. No problem at all. Stitch that over there. And this is what you've got right there. So you have a fully configurable holster within literally seconds, minutes, that where you can give yourself medical, rifle magazine, you know, rifle ammunition, pistol mag, optimize it for four o'clock, handcuff carrier if that's something you need, all in one holster.
coming up. All right, so this is, I don't know the exact specs behind the drill, but uh, X-Ray Alpha, this is one of the drills that he is showing and doing a lot. Six on a target up close, five, seven yards or so, I think. Uh, so I've got two Charlies here, four Alphas, and then a target further away that's not su a super wide transition. So you have recoil control here, testing how much you're gripping the handgun, and then a far target to test how fast you can slow down. In this case, uh, I've got an Alpha and a Charlie, one on the line, uh, and that is an indicator of dragging my gun slightly to the right on the transition, pushing the gun a little too much, uh, with a total time of a 331. With the first uh, build drill, six rounds, uh, not the not the greatest speed, uh, but and and then first shot from the draw it was a 1-1, which is not. Eh. Eh, that range it should be under a second, uh, but that would only buy me about two tenths off of my total time um, So yeah, there we go All right, new mag kind of popped out of my pocket. This guy on the move, Alpha Delta, ouchies. But that was pistol and suppressor from a sidecar with a tourniquet carrier. Fairly unconventional and weird. Three rounds, fired three on him, all off to the right. I need this can look at. This is a. Uh, Tightening it down didn't do a thing for it. Yeah, everything's here. There, it's all high right. What the heck? Yep, high right. Off to the right, off to the right, and off to the right. I've been carrying the same Glock now for years, and at some point I'm gonna have to swap grips because this one's getting pretty, uh, pretty spongy and squishy. Uh, but my carry holster has changed now. So my new setup is a sidecar with a tourniquet, a cat tourniquet. And this is a training tourniquet because I was just doing some reps, so it's all like ratty and nasty and I've used it a few times. Uh, but I have a TLR7, my standard Glock 19 with a TLR7 that I've been carrying for a long time with a 1 MOA RMR, uh, 15 rounds plus one in the chamber. Uh, so this is my setup right there. If I need an extra pistol magazine, which I personally like to have, it's what I've been carrying in a sidecar for also years, uh, I can use a Neo Mag and then have my Glock 17 plus two base pad magazine ready to go in my pocket. Uh, so the Neo Mag, I can still have, you know, that extra magazine right here. It's much easier to carry a magazine in your pocket uh, than a tourniquet. Tourniquets are a little more bulky, and so that's where having the tourniquet on the holster itself inside your waistband is actually a little more effective than you have the magazine in your pocket. Uh, so this basically just goes uh, right into your pants like any other sidecar style double clip. Uh, holster design You want to make sure your pants get around the clip like so and then boom shirt done tourniquet It's also a little more comfortable in carrying a pistol magazine. It's a uh, soft and it's nylon uh, So all I'm really feeling is the pistol itself got my spare mag here if I need it and I'm set All right, so one of the benefits to the sidecar is the ability to being able to wear it at four o'clock So something that I've been doing now for quite a bit uh, since last year uh, is running a very simple loadout which is plate carrier kitted with a chest rig or chest rig only and instead of wearing a full war belt you know just layering my hips with kit uh, I just throw this sucker on 
Uh, the two clips means the pistol is very stable. It's not going to move around. Uh, even if you have something like a Glock 34 or the X300, something pretty heavy. Um, so this is actually one of my preferred setups for just getting some reps in versus having to wear, you know, wearing a full belt plus full plate carrier and all that good stuff. Uh, so four o'clock holster, much easier to put it on before the plate carrier goes on. Uh, so that's what we will do. I wear it, I'm skinny, I have to wear it at like uh, 4 o'clock, I can't wear it directly at 3, and uh, you have to make sure this clip goes in first, generally, and then boom, there there I am. Don't have to conceal, because obviously I'm going uh, pretty uh, overt. AC1, I've got 4800s in here. There's a lot of different ways you can obviously run a plate carrier. Uh, something I've been doing a lot more is taking an AC1 as a slick, just like this, and then another company's chest rig, in this case a Mayflower. This is a, a, a big boy. It holds much more kit than like a, you know, like a little micro fight or you know, a little chest rig or even a ready rig. So if I want more kit than that, I'll still run the back strap on the standard chest rig, the Velcro panel that's on the uh, underside of the chest rig is exposed, so that can actually adhere to the front of my plate carrier and keep it stable. So I have a much larger uh, setup worth of kit, and it's being suspended weight-wise on top of the shoulder pads of my plate carrier, so it's actually very comfortable. So I can have four magazines, radio, all my other stuff, medical, pistol mags, and everything on top, or I can ditch this, only have the armor, or I can ditch the armor and only have the chest rig. Uh, so it's pretty cool. So then uh, eye pro, ears, R5, and the pistol is right here as you can see, ready to go if need be as I'm doing my uh, malfunction, dr drills, stoppages, or whatever. This is what I've got. Alright, so 500 meter prone, a reduced T turn C zone by the minivan down there. And then about 380 meters, 400 ish meters to steal from right here. And steal on the move in about 25 meters or so, three C zones. That's in 45 seconds with a Remington R5 14.5 barrel and an ACOG T31. Hot.
This is the sidecar holster. Now, as some of you can tell, the design has changed a little bit from the design that we've been selling for a few years. With that design, we had a pistol magazine that was infused into the holster as a one-piece design, but it meant you could only carry an appendix. What we have now is a holster that is much more modular that can also be carried in the three and four o'clock position. What we have is this spine system, all this teeth in the front with a metal rod running down the center that allows you to accept a multitude of attachments and be able to scale up your carry system uh, based on what you need. By default, this holster comes with this wing on the side with another clip attached. So you will have two clips here in the front. This means you have a very stable holster if you carry this appendix, uh, but this also means you can wear this at four o'clock because you don't have that pistol mag in the front getting in the way. But when you're ready and you wanna add another attachment, all you do is pop the rod out. You can then run a pistol magazine, rifle mag carrier, tourniquet holder, or even a handcuff carrier. And then at any time you can swap back to your standard clip. You can adjust it for four o'clock carry, three o'clock carry. There's all these little holes on the back. You can adjust the cant of the clip itself, drop that back on and you're good to go. So what I'm gonna do is take this default sidecar. We're gonna remove this clip from it and we're gonna add a pistol mag carrier, similar to a older, more traditional sidecar. So I'm gonna take basic tools. The metal pin uh, is here inside. So I have a key. And I'm just simply going to push the pin from the bottom or the top, either or. Pull the pin out. This is a friction washer. It helps prevent the, the metal rod from sliding or falling out of the holster. And now my holster is ready to accept any of these attachments. So it should, could be a rifle magazine, tourniquet, or a handcuff carrier. Now, the other cool thing with this holster is because of the teeth design, the spine design, I can actually adjust the height of my attachment. So if I have a longer pistol magazine, like a, a PMAG 20 or something like that, I can actually shift this down a little bit so the magazine isn't you know, shooting up into my stomach quite as much. Uh, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and have the pistol magazine here at the top, flush with the top of the holster. We're gonna insert the friction washer here in the space. And then the metal pin, the metal rod, as you will notice, has two little notches here on the top and the bottom. That's to help you remove this uh, using various tools, such as a coin or a key, to help get the pin out of the holster when you're switching out your accessories. So I'm gonna go ahead and insert here from the top. You can also go from the bottom, either or. It will be a tight fit. And there we go. Now I've configured my holster from the default with the standard clip to a holster that can take my handgun and a spare pistol magazine. To remove the pin, it's fairly straightforward. There are a couple nuances though. The retention screws on the pistol mag carrier, the rifle mag carrier, and the handcuff carrier, you'll see there's a screw right here at the end. Uh, based on how much you tighten this screw, it will affect the retention of the metal rod when you go to remove it to add a different accessory. So if you're having trouble, like the metal rod is just not moving at all, you might wanna loosen this screw right here. But for the most part, to get adequate retention on your equipment, uh, it will still be loose enough to be able to uh, remove the metal pin itself. Uh, the best tool is a Phillips screwdriver. So we're just gonna get it out a little bit. It's easier if you go out the bottom, we'll go out the top for this. And as you'll see, the little notch here at the top is now exposed. So now I can take my key or my coin or whatever, and that can help kinda uh, be used to help pull the clip out. So we'll go ahead and use this key right here. Get into that notch, pull, and now the rod pin is removed. Remove the pistol mag carrier. We'll go back to four o'clock or just a standard clip. Add the friction washer back in. Push the rod back in. And we're back to where we started. Every sidecar holster comes optic compatible. Now granted only for standardized miniature optics mounted behind the ejection port, nothing crazy in front or frame mounted optics. Sorry, open shooters. Uh, and then the attention on the holster is adjustable near the trigger guard. On the light compatible holster, you have two screws right here by the uh, trigger guard of the pistol. And then on a standard non-light compatible sidecar, you will also have the two clips that are below the trigger guard where the clip actually attaches. 
The, uh, the clip is also adjustable as far as ride height. So if you want your pistol to ride a little bit deeper or maybe be a little higher so you have a easier draw to get a, you know, get your hand on the pistol. Uh, the clip can be adjusted and moved up and down. There's five little holes here on the clip itself. And then as you're doing that, you'll also want to adjust the height of your other clip, whether it's on your uh, pistol magazine attachment, your rifle magazine, or your just standard clip that comes with the holster. You'll just simply use the screws here, uh, or you'll actually move the entire attachment itself along the spine system to achieve the appropriate ride height that you need. One of the biggest changes in the sidecar is the fact that the holster can now bend in the center. We've had a lot of questions over the years, like, hey, why don't you guys make a flex sidecar? Why don't you make a holster that's, you know, all bendy? Uh, part of the problem is we've, in testing other holsters and other flex holsters, we've never liked the approach that the pistol magazine can bend and uh, flip outwards from the holster. It leads to uh, more printing, generally speaking, less consistency, and uh, not always very much comfort. The benefit of this holster, as far as some of the flexibility is, it is only bending on one axis. The magazine is not going to flip forward. The entire holster can only bend in one direction. Uh, so it's a little more consistent. It's much more stable. So you have the stability of the you know, older, more traditional sidecar, but you do have that flexibility, which can be useful for certain body types um, or just if that's something you're interested in. If you're looking for further information on the various attachments for the sidecar, we have detailed overview videos on those product pages. And if you have any further questions for us, go ahead and email us at team at trex-arms.com and we'll be right with you.
hundred. Oh, I can barely see him. Woo! This lighting right now is the absolute worst for long range. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we got three A's on him, one's on the line. Three alphas right here. This is some decent shooting with a mil spec trigger, giant red dot. Uh, I've got two A's and a Charlie, dragged one on the right, and then yeah. Breaking perf, but it's still a Charlie. I, I'm not gonna say it. So two Charlies. start getting a little wild with our drills because just standing still is boring so what this was was five rounds at about 30 yards not bad so that's what we have at five uh, at 35 that was in three five eight seconds pretty happy with that I took this guy a little bit quicker got one Charlie this guy riding in position which is pretty slow one Charlie with a total time of uh, 10 77. So with the way that this build is configured right here, I just ran the math. We are at $966. So we are at $1,000 for this build with a good rifle slang, a good set of iron sights and a very decent weapon light. However, there's no ammo involved and there's no additional magazines. So if I add two more P mags, that's 22 bucks, plus obviously some shipping if you, depending on where you go and buy. Um, so then we're right under $1,000 and that doesn't include ammunition, that doesn't include a chest rig or a way to carry more ammo or a messenger bag or a duffel bag or, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, so is it that reasonable to think that you can build out a full loadout or kit for a grand? Uh, not really, unless you're willing to build your own chest rig out of duct tape 
and run in with a, a single magazine and a handful of bullets. There's a lot of different ways I can build this rifle out. I mean, I can throw an extra 400 bucks on with an Aimpoint Pro. This thing is an awesome little setup uh, with this optic. I could ditch the irons and run another red dot. I could ditch this light and run, you know, the stream light or this guy right here. Uh, but this is the configuration that I would probably uh, run this rifle in as I'm trying to go as budget as possible with this gun. Uh, I will run iron sights, not a cheap red dot that's like 150 bucks. I would much rather run irons. Uh, and with training, you can get very good with irons. Uh, don't think that, you know, irons are uh, completely defunct. There are some benefits to irons over red dot. There's very few benefits. Uh, one is there's no batteries and they are very durable. But irons can fail. Don't think irons are invincible. Those can fail as well. Um, so now the next thing is really uh, testing this sucker out, seeing how it performs. There is a reason there are budget rifles on the market that come at a lower price point compared to higher end rifles from companies with more quality control standards and better components. Like there is a reason there is varied pricing. Now I'm not going to pretend like there aren't companies who upcharge for quality or what they say is quality, but you're really not getting that quality. And that especially happens on influencer branded rifles where you buy a rifle with someone else's name on it, like a, you know, like a signature line or whatever. I personally am not a huge fan of that because you are spending a lot of extra money on someone else's rifle when the reality should be, this is your rifle. You're going to paint this gun. You're going to understand the ins and outs of this gun. It is your rifle, not someone else's. You, you can build a rifle for $1,000, but it's not going to be very useful without all the other support equipment. And the perfect example for that is night vision. You can buy a PBS-14 for anywhere from $2,000 to $4,000 based on you know how used and what type of tube it has. But that night vision actually isn't going to be that useful besides wearing it around your neck unless you buy a mount, a helmet, uh, a laser for your rifle or some sort of aiming system, an IR illuminator, and that's gonna add another thousand to two thousand dollars. So just saying, oh, I can buy a rifle for a thousand dollars. Oh, but that doesn't include the mags, the ammo, and the uh, gear to actually support the rifle. Uh, it's just not a realistic expectation, and we need to uh, kind of work on um, killing that expectation because it's not very reasonable. One of the original goals with the AC-1 was to provide people with a one-stop shop for body armor, plate carrier, and the support equipment to go with that. So we have the AC-1, so we have the carrier system for whatever armor you want to stick inside, and then we also have the HESCO L210s, which are some of the best entry-level plates out there that you can buy. Uh, they defeat all sorts of uh, great calibers, including some uh, unofficially that people have been testing. And then we also recently added our foam backers, which are uh, very effective when you combine them with an L210 plate because this is a hard plate. It's not the most comfortable thing to wear against your body. So having that foam backer kind of helps uh, soften that a little bit, make it a little more comfortable, especially if you're wearing it for more than a couple hours. Uh, just taking, you know, like the range, you know, what you do at the range and what you think works for the range uh, is a little bit different when you start having to wear stuff for days on end or even a full day versus just going to the range, wearing it for two hours, taking it off and being like, hey, I'm done. Um, yeah, things can work great if it's only being worn for two hours. So what we have right here is around $700 for this full kit. So what you get is the AC-1 for $190, L210s, which are between $309 and I think up to $360 based on what kind of sales are going on. We do have a sale right now. And then you have the foam backers, which are $30. Bucks. There's nothing fancy and special about these. You could take a yoga mat, cut it up, and achieve the same thing. I've done that before. But if you just want to get something to slap in there that maybe is a little bit better and then you don't have to worry about something else, definitely check those out. The uh, exclusive STAC shingle placard thingy uh, that STAC makes for us. Great little way of slapping three mags onto your plate carrier. Uh, there's a couple ways of wearing it. It comes with Swift Clip uh, compatible buckles, or you can remove those buckles, tuck the one wrap inside, and then you're actually going to run the cummerbund on top. I actually really like that. It brings the entire thing a little closer to the body. Uh, just keeps it all, um, you know, tucked in. Uh, the downside is the cummerbund does generally pull on the two side pouches and adds a little bit more tension, but no big deal. It's not that bad. So let's go ahead and build this out. I also have some medical because that's important that I've thrown in here. So what we're going to do, these, this is a size medium Ranger Green plate carrier. We're going to run, throw the backers in first. Actually, no, I think with L210s, you want to put the L210s in first. It is a little bit of a tight fit. These are size large L210s. Yes, they do fit into a medium AC1. 
They're a li little bit of a tight fit, and then we're actually gonna add the, the inserts in. It's actually not that bad. Then we're gonna add the inserts after. Oh, I hope my hangnails don't get busted. That's the problem with foam gear. So boom, it's gonna look something just like that. So all this nice soft padding is going to be against your body. Tuck that on the inside. Boom, that's the front. Rear bag, same deal. The plates are ambidextrous. It's not like there's a front plate and a rear plate. They literally can, it doesn't matter. Uh, wrong side. Skull facing out. And then push that up in. Boom, we're good, just like that. Tuck that in, Velcro that, and that ain't going nowheres. Then on the front, this normally comes with two swift clip buckles that are attached here to these little molly sections. I've already removed those because this carrier is simply going to be taking this guy right there. The cummerbund will be going on the top. And then back here, we have two large slots in the cummerbund and these fit the ITRK EDC just fine. And since it's vacuum formed, vacuum packed, I should say, uh, it's obviously waterproof. And then take my three magazines. If I want three, I could, you know, do something different. Run a pistol mag and another one. And there we have it. L210s, backers, some medical magazines, right around 700 bucks. You have some good armor. There is no reason to be buying steel armor when you have plates like the L210 that exist, in my opinion. So yeah. Not only did we restock AC1s, but we also launched Multicam Original and Multicam Arid. Now, obviously, you know, these patterns, you're going to want to pick them based on, you know, what you're doing and where you're wearing them. I still recommend Ranger Green, Black, and Gray for urban stuff, such as, you know, most of the stuff that happened in 2020. Uh, but camo is great, obviously, when you have to go into the woods or you're in the desert or something like that. So if you need multicam or you want multicam area to look cool and no, we're not doing multicam black, uh, we have we've got you covered. So I want to cover the AC1 a little bit. This is how it's configured right out of the package. Got chasm buckles already installed, standard elastic cummerbund. Now, why we do not have an, a multi-cam cummerbund on our camouflage AC1s is simply because the uh, dye process and the, the multi-cam process of making this material in uh, a pattern uh, makes the elastic suck. So we're not going to do that because we like to make, you know, nice product. Uh, so we're having to go with Coyote because this elastic is actually high quality. Uh, if we go up to like the weird poly stuff that's 5 inch, 6 inch, uh, in multicam, that stuff is also really weird. So we have chosen to stick with standard elastic, you know, the, the good elastic, and uh, just keep that in the solid colors where it's still, you know, high quality. So that's why we have a Coyote cummerbund. If you absolutely want a multicam cummerbund, you know, or something that's color matched, something like this, the Cry MBAV cummerbund, uh, which I do use for some stuff, uh, can be useful. It also gives you uh, side plate pockets. Uh, this is the JTAC one, and it gives you two radio pockets on the sides. More on that later. So, built out the way it is, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and install. And to confirm, those those of you who have been asking, hey, size large L210s, which you carry on your site, do they fit in a medium? The answer is yes, they do. It's a little bit of a tight fit, but they do fit. I do recommend you get foam backers though. I'm just gonna install these to give this some form. So those go right in. It's a standard plate carrier, opens from the bottom. There's a lot of excess uh, length of Velcro and loop field on the inside. So if you're using size small plates inside the plate carrier, you can really get that tucked, dip it, tucked up in there and still have adequate um, adherence with the Velcro. Something that some plate carrier companies don't do. And uh, I've had issues in the past. So we wanted, to, we wanted to fix that. We wanted to give a little bit more Velcro so you guys can get size small plates and other weird stuff to fit just fine. So in this configuration right here, there's a couple things we can do. Let us just say, we'll have some fun. We have like Legos right here. Let's say I want a dedicated radio pouch. This Cry Precision, super fancy, schwanky little setup. We'll stick that right here. Tourniquet on this side. Take this one, slap that right there. 
Now, my ammunition system. I could do an STAC placard, uh, which is, this is what we sell. It's an exclusive that STAC makes for us. It's got Kydex inserts, and you can run the buckles. There's one wrap right here that comes with the buckle. You can either, you know, have that up here, set your height, or I actually have that removed. That just sits right there, and then I just bring the cummerbund over the front like so, and I'm set. So right there I have a dedicated radio pouch that's going to be, um, you know, sort of in my uh, rib cage uh, with the pull tabs and everything. I can have other stuff on the front, and then I've got a tourniquet on this side, three mags in the front. Nice, solid little setup. Um, if I want to go with a traditional, you know, placard style setup, I've got a few options here. I've got a Spiritus, and you can kind of see, uh, this is the multi-cam elastic that I was kind of talking about. Uh, this is not Spiritus's fault by any means, but as you can see, it's wearing and uh, the rubbery stuff on the inside comes out. So uh, solids are generally more effective. Um, still a good product though. This is their little shingle. So I can attach that on the front, buckle it up, and now I have this nice flat elastic mag carrier on the front. Or I could run this sucker. This is the Haley Micro. Uh, triple mag, big GP pouch in the front, two uh, utility, pistol mag, whatever, multi-tool pouches on the sides. I can attach that, buckle in, and then my cummerbund, traditional like, will go up underneath, slap that down, and now I have a traditional placard style set up on the front of the AC-1. But let's say I want to get a little weird. Let's build this out. This is a configuration that I'm using a lot right now. It's a little bit different, but I really enjoy it. So I'll rip that off. Uh, tourniquet can stay, pretty sure. I'm gonna show you guys how to remove the cummerbund. So, on the AC-1, you have this rear flap that covers the back side of the plate carrier. Now this is really important because I've used other plate carriers in the past where the rear of the cummerbund was exposed and you can get into all kinds of issues uh, inside of vehicles. Uh, I've had the cummerbund actually come off on me before uh, where it has actually peeled because the entire thing is exposed. So my thought is why don't people just make a little flap that literally shuts over it so that now the cummerbund itself is protected. Well, it costs extra money. That's why they probably don't do it. Uh, plus it looks kind of weird. But in reality, in my opinion, it's a little safer and uh, keeps your gear a little more consistent. So removing the cummerbund, as you can see, Super simple, also fun trick if you really want to get wild. Flip the cummerbund. It is basically ambidextrous. And now you have large pockets in the front instead for 308 mags. If you want to run two 308 mags uh, right up here in the front. If you really want to get, you know, funky and weird. So I'll pull these. And let's take the MBAF cummerbund. There you have this set for me. I had to make a slight modification because it does not have a hook on the inside of the actual um, of their little three strand setup. So I ad put adhesive loop field on the front right here. I'm going to, there's a little bit of loop uh, Velcro on the front. Put this right here. Going to keep some field right here because I want to make sure that this attaches, you know, it sticks down right here to keep it from moving. So now I have a brand new cummerbund. The Cry MBAV JTAC cummerbund. And what that gives me is uh, side armor capability, if that's what I want, and two radio pouches, which in this case I have an ITRK on one. I can do my radio on the other. And then, if I really want to get funky, I take something large like this. This is the Mayflower chest rig. You will swift clip that in the front. Make sure that this Velcro is, uh, ex you know, we remove the little flap because I actually want that to adhere to the front of the plate uh, carrier itself, right here down the center. Boom, so that's gonna stick. And then I'm gonna route, this actually works really well. One, the rear strap, the back strap for the chest rig is actually going to go underneath my plate bag. And then that will attach to the front, uh, up, up top, usually up top's a little better, top here. And now I can have a little bit more of a loadout, more GB pouches, four magazines instead of three. It's still stable to the body. I can tighten this down based on how tight that I need it. I also have these integrated pouches here on the side. I can do side armor if I want. I could add shoulder pads for a little bit more uh, load bearing capability. 
and then my back is still slick for a standard like eagle yoke pack or you know whatever. So as you can see in the span of just a few minutes, there's a lot of ways of building out the AC1. Uh, you can go super slick, you can wear it under a jacket, you can build it out a little bit more. Would I recommend this carrier as a full load bearing direct action carrier with you know a big breacher panel on the back? The answer is absolutely not. If you need a plate carrier for that, that you want to load up with tons of crap, I would recommend the Cry CPC or the newer Cry ABS, an actual load-bearing plate carrier. But something that's kind of in the middle that you can kind of scale, but also still have for uh, slick, minimalist, covert type stuff. Uh, that's where the AC1 really excels. And we've got lots of them in stock right now in Multicam, Arid, and Ranger Green. And we're going to be having more coming uh, in the next few months. They're being uh, produced in batches. And we also have black on the way as well. So, AC1. Copy. We just finished a special event at the beginning of Copperhead where sponsors and staff defended a marketplace here at Plyus and 80, it's probably more like 100, 100 multi-cam, Ranger Green, uh, Op 4, we're supposed to assault, kill all of us and find loot and intelligence uh, hidden in all the different rooms here. Uh, we had a lot of night vision on our team. They had a decent amount of night vision on their team. So we got to control biz lights facing out, shoot IR at them, beams just all over, get two saws up top. Uh, it's a pretty cool defense scenario. I liked it. We, over, we got overrun eventually, but at the beginning it was uh, pretty easy to keep them back. But I liked it. It's pretty cool. A lot of good night vision versus night vision action. Brutal. So, what we
we've got is two on each at each barrier and then tack magging at each behind cover and then uh, full shooting on the move. We've got one nick here, we're all right, although I don't like that. And we've got all A's. Eight A's. We've got two Charlie, one unaccounted for. Oh, it's right there. The double. Two Charlie. One, five, six, seven, eight. Two Charlie. Four Charlie total for a time of 66. I think that's okay. I guess we'll find out. Oh no, we're set. Dude. That must be it. Uh, I thought it was up here. 100% again. Yay. I threw one far right over in Delta. The rest were A's, but... All right, 4195. Wrong target. 34.
Oh my! Jeez. Two alphas! Three alphas! I'm pretty sure, uh... No training. Those are great. Two alphas on him. Just, just getting in here and getting his feet wet. Two bravos. Right in the noggle, right in the face. Two alphas. Two alphas. And you shot three on him. I don't know why. Because I felt off. Oh. So I just... Send it. You crushed that.
three gloves. I got a tack man, but. Shipping through eight mags. Kind of sucks. Whew. Pretty uh large gun. Wow. That was brutal. So Got two Charlies here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're good on him. Eight. One Mike, two Charlie. Now for the worst. We clip this guy in the middle, kneeling. I think is where it was. Three Charlie, four A's, one no shoot. Definitely needs some work. That was with the Remington or Sass. All right. Did us a nice little controlled close range drill with the Remington or Sass with the Tango 6T. Got three alphas, two in one hole. Two alphas of Charlie. And then three alphas right here. And that was in a time of, not counting that last dead check, 545 with a 762 big boy gun. Same. Not, not bad. Didn't get the time on that. But those are all in the five, six, five, five range. It's my standard at five yards from a low ready. Looking over the optic is under half a second, three times in a row. So my hits are good. But I'm definitely outside of time with this big, this big sucker. Say again? Okay. Didn't feel clean. Three Charlies. 
Trying to not get a no shoot. One shot. Oh. Yeah, when I got room to be generous. Three, four, five, six, seven. Where's the eighth? Eight, Delta. Dang it. Oh. No misses, no no shoots. Pouches are always the worst. Man, the tack mags could definitely use a little work. Pull tab on this guy got in the way of this guy. P mags are super tight. Look at that. Let's check our hits. Around the ACOG for everything, in the back, I've got one Charlie. Yep, one Charlie. Two Charlie. So, five Charlie total in a time of 80. It's a little slower than my uh, previous run. Not bad. Fancy for no reason. Nine, seven. Good, good. Didn't even need a third.
cost me two seconds. So we're going to be doing something a little bit different for the month of October. Every night we're going to be publishing on YouTube, Instagram, social media. We're not posting every night on YouTube, but as, as much as we can. We're going to be posting content at night with night vision, handheld flashlights, weapon lights. Now why are we doing this? Well the fact of the matter is a lot of people, myself included, I'm guilty of this, take low light training for granted. There's also not a lot of ranges that offer bays or hours that support low light training. But if we can spread the activism and we can spread the awareness of the importance of training at night, that's how you're able to inspire change when business, with gun ranges, with you know people wanting to get out there, you know, growing the customer base, that is going to drive the community to enabling that kind of training. But you have to have the awareness uh, starting first. You have to basically change the culture in order to change the businesses and the business practices of gun ranges. And the fact of the matter is, most of our training should probably be at night. Most bad stuff, when you look at statistics, occurs at night. So getting out there and practicing with our handheld flashlights or our, our you know, weapon-mounted pistol lights, our night vision, or our rifles with white lights on them is something we all need to be doing more. So for the month of October, and y'all feel free to join us, uh, we're gonna be posting a lot of content all at night. We're gonna be running all sorts of different equipment. We're gonna be showing our reflectivity of various clothing. We're gonna be doing stuff in the woods, shooting suppressed guns, shooting long range with night vision clip-ons, all kinds of cool stuff. So if you're interested in seeing more of that, pay attention here in October while we publish a lot of this content. And join in if you can, if you've got a range or if you don't have a range that allows you to do this because the culture hasn't really been developed enough for it yet. You can dry fire with your pistol light. You can turn all the lights off in your house. You can get your handheld light out there and you can start dry firing. And that's the kind of stuff that we need people seeing so they can be inspired to go out there and do some training at night. One Charlie. And what was that? Four, four, five. Four, four, five. So I want to show a few techniques for shooting with a handheld light. So the most optimal way of manipulating said light while using a handgun is going to be gripping it like so. Thumb will be activating the button on this stream light 
and I'm going to be using momentary if you know, you know, as much as I can uh, versus clicking for constant. Every time I am not shooting, moving, or reloading, the light will be off. I only turn the light on when I need it, and it's off all other times. As far as technique goes for holding a light in a handgun, as you can see, I have the dilemma of not being able to hold the gun with two hands. This is where a, a pistol mounted light gives you a little bit of advantage because I can have both hands on the pistol, shoot a little bit faster and have better recoil management. I know there's the whole argument of, oh, well, they're gonna shoot towards the light. Well, yeah, yes, but no, and I can't shoot what I can't see, so I'm gonna have to take the risk of activating a light and potentially, yes, showing where, where my position is while I'm in the process of shooting. So a couple techniques out there, you've got the Harry's technique of hooking this hand in front of the hand that is manipulating the flashlight. This looks extremely goofy thanks to Hollywood, but actually works pretty well when it comes to controlling the handgun and having consistent rise and fall and aligning your sights. So I have a chameleon target out here. So as you can see, the gun, the sights are rising and falling very consistently. I can activate the light, see the target, and I'm good to go. If I don't want to use the Harry's technique, there's a few others. Uh, if you're running an iron-sided pistol, I highly recommend this one. And that is a, you could do jaw index is one that guys like to do. The downside with this is my handgun is typically being held above uh, where my beam is, so I'm not going to be illuminating my iron sights. If I go for an actual like head index above my ear, what this does is this allows me to actually see my iron sights, whether I have stock irons or an illuminated front sight post like this one or my fibers. If I'm using a fiber optic front sight post, it illuminates very brightly. So then from here, I can then, the light is going to be following wherever I look in this certain position. And then when I need to move or do whatever, I just turn the light off by depressing with my finger and now the light is off. There's also umbrella techniques where I hold the light above or I hold it out like so. Shoot, magazine, back pocket. And I'm set. I prefer a technique that keeps the light closer to my body, either a head index or a Harry's index as it allows me to point the light a little more effectively where I'm looking and where I'm shooting. There's, those are a few techniques for you guys as far as shooting a handgun with a handheld light. I like to practice on a buzzer, drawing from the holster and drawing my weapon light at the same time and indexing both, that's one thing you can do, or practice with the light already out and then on the buzzer, drawing the handgun and then taking your shots. people when you want them to get into a file, say we're moving out of a wood line, I'm going to do this and I'm going to point exactly to where I want them to be in a file. So if I point here, right there, that means the guy behind me needs to be in a file by the time he passes that, right? Otherwise, if I just give you this, it's kind of like a, hey, everyone start moving to a file. You pass that back to the person, you make sure everyone sees it. So team leader to his left and right, make sure that both them see it, they pass it on to whoever. Like, you're gonna have like multiple guys in like in a squad, so they'll be like another team back here. And they can be in a V2, but they don't have to be. They can be in a they can be in a staggered column or something. This gives you a lot of firepower to the front, and then you got your sides here. So it really all depends on like where is stuff coming from. Sector, buddy, team, cover. That's like your four scans. So you scan your sector. Then you look at your buddy, then you look at your TL, your team leader, and then you look for wherever you're going to cover and take contact. That's, it's, that's the job, is just cycle that all the way through. Flashlights are awesome because you can use them for all kinds of things and not shooting. But if you are shooting with them, there's a few techniques you can use to make uh, shooting the handgun a little more consistent and allow you to also, if you're running iron sights, see your sights a little bit easier. So your optimal hand position, carrying the light and activating it, is going to be essentially a beer can grip like this. You then have your thumb ready to go, uh, you know, kind of like a, a switch on an explosive, right? Where you just gotta, you know, hammer that red button. But my thumb's gonna ride right on here and I'm going to be activating the slide in a momentary fashion. So when I don't need the light, the light turns off. If I go to reload, go to move, do whatever, 
and the light is only on when I want it to be on as I'm scanning or doing whatever. So as far as techniques go for shooting a handgun, one of the classic techniques, the Harry's technique, looks something like this. I'm going to be hooking my dominant hand with the handgun in front of my support arm that is activating the flashlight. Now while this technique looks very corny, uh, it actually works pretty well. I have a little bit of stability on the, with the handgun, an extra point of contact with my left, with my, uh, left hand, my support arm, and that actually allows me to track my sights as they're rising and falling a little bit more consistently. So it's going to look something like this. My sights are rising up to the left slightly, and then the gun is settling. Wearing a watch, it does kind of get in the way a little bit, but optimally what you want to do is brace your pistol grip if it's long enough into your hand. So you're pushing forward with your light, you're pulling back with your pistol, and it's actually a very firm grip. If you're running iron sights on your handgun, if you have non-tritium, non-fiber, non-bright you know, bright, illuminated uh, irons, it's going to be very hard to see those while you're activating your light downrange away from the pistol. So another technique that can be really awesome is a head index. Now a jaw index is a method some people like to use, but the downside to this with running a handgun is, generally speaking, you are going to be raising your handgun above where the beam of the light is. So you're not actually illuminating your iron sights at all. But if we take the weapon line and move it up a little bit higher, up to the top of my head, now I can actually illuminate my pistol irons. And in this case, with the Ameriglow iDot Pros, I have my bright orange front sight that this is illuminating really nicely. There's also the umbrella technique where you hold the light up high or outwards. but it's a little bit harder to keep it on the target. There's also some little adapters out there for lights, the little uh, thigh rim little thingy, where you can basically hook the pistol light here in the front, get this sort of weird little grip like this, sort of have two hands on the gun, and still be activating the handheld. It requires going out and getting an accessory, accessory generally speaking, so I usually just stick to the head index like so, or the Harry's if I am running my handheld uh, with my pistol. But as you can see, I'm only shooting the gun with one hand. I have to shoot a little bit slower. I don't have as good recoil management. And that's why pistol mounted, uh, pistol mounted lights are awesome. However, I'm not gonna be drawing that handgun with a light on it to be looking around for stuff or drawing it in public because you know that's a really easy way to get a misdemeanor. And that's where having a handheld light works great. My pistol can be holstered. I can be doing whatever it is, either on low mode, my five lumen mode, on uh you know for admin whatever finding stuff looking for my you know wall charger and then i can go high mode if i need all of my 1200 lumens on this particular light All right, guys, so what we are doing right now is demonstrating IR reflectivity with different materials, fabrics, and gear. Sometimes the naked eye likes to play tricks on us, uh, what we see in the day, and what we perceive will be seen at night. Uh, Josh, what color is your t-shirt? Black t-shirt. All right, he has a black t-shirt, but under night vision is actually the perfect tone as far as how much IR it's reflecting. Uh, and absorbing that it is blending in with the terrain that we have so a black t-shirt that is bright uh, Through the naked eye is blending great with night vision. Uh, what color is your plate carrier? Ranger green Ranger green. So this Ranger green Cordura, but even with the black uh, Front velcro is actually blending really well uh, as well uh, Drew what color is your plate carrier? It is black. He has a black plate carrier and as you can see the IR properties for that are much more high contrast which lead to uh, Not as good camouflage uh, when you're looking at it against normal terrain uh, So you have a black AC one uh, Is this what color is your uh, your, uh, your your black. your black? That's black GP pouch. It's a black GP pouch with different kinds Ranger of materials looks like you have a what? Ranger Cumberbund. Ranger, Ranger Cumberbund. That's Ranger. blending. What color is your Mars carrier? The Kydex. First carrier is Ranger. Ranger green. Uh, lift your arm up. That's blending really well. Good as well. Your dump pouch is what color? Do you remember? Black. 
that's black yes yeah, so that's super high contrast uh your backpack on the rear is black, black so that's actually it's a little little uh brighter than um than uh than the black cordura material of the ac1 uh let's check this out josh what color is your safari land black black so also very high contrast uh, lots going on there. Black, we all have black thigh straps, which as you can see, uh, not great under night vision. Uh, Ranger green most likely is going to be uh, much more effective. Black magazines, pistol mags. Uh, what color is your Kydex on your belt? Black. Black, aha, high contrast. Uh, the Ranger green Kydex will be much more effective under night vision as Drew has uh, there on his side compared to the black Kydex. Uh, what color is your dump pouch? Gray. Gray, look how great, gray looks awesome under night vision. Uh, no problems at all. It's blending great with everything else. Uh, what kind of pants you got? Just jeans, denim. De jeans, denim jeans. Those actually are, are quite good. Drew's got denim jeans as well. I do, and that's actually blending uh, great. Shoes. Uh, you have, these are Solomon uh, whatevers. Or forces. Forces, Shoes yep. Blantes. They're pretty good. They're better than some of the Solomons that I've seen. Some Solomons are absolute just trash when it comes to IR reflectivity and, and absorption. Uh, what shoes are these over here, Josh? They're black speed cross fives. Yeah, exactly. So, and that's what I'm talking about right here. That high contrast, you can see uh, the two different materials. Uh, the material going through, that's the main structure of the shoe, is very high contrast under night vision. Uh, the Forces shoes over here are a little better, uh, but they're still fairly high contrast. They don't all blend together. Yep, so I've got a black AC1 with uh, Ranger Green triple mag uh, placard setup. I have a spray painted Ranger Green Opscore helmet. How does my hoodie look? Uh, it's blending nicely. Blending nicely. This is a light green, sort of a dark green, light green going on right there. Uh, pants, it looked like, looks pretty good under night vision, blending good with the natural terrain. Uh, the Kydex that I have, I'm gonna assume this is high contrast because this is, I think this might be multicam black actually. So that is not contrasting as much as your belt is. As much as my belt. This is multicam black. This is multicam black material right here. And uh, it's pretty, it's bright black. Is that how it, what it's looking yep. like? Uh, this is a Safari Land Black MP5 mag carrier. How's that? Black. Just straight black, yep. Uh, dump pouch is a prototype. Oh, shoot, I shouldn't have said that. Oh my God, uh, okay, it's, it's happening. Is, uh, Everybody it's stay calm. Green. What's the first thing? It's blending very well. It's blending, yeah, so that's a Ranger Green material. Uh, although I am curious, this is Hypalon. How does this look? Bright black. Bright black, yeah. Hypalon is uh, Hank material, is not always uh, very good uh, for this sort of thing. And uh, then this Kydex holster is black with a piece of tape on it. Correct. And that looks like bright black under night vision. Yep. How does the tape look? It blends pretty well. It actually blends pretty good. Okay, so I could maybe cover this up all the way and maybe be good to go. Yeah. All right. So something to try out for those of you that are watching this. If you have like your loadout and your night vision stuff, have someone look at your kit and see what on it is being that bright black high contrast because that's something you're going to want to avoid you don't have that out in nature that's what if you look across the field and you see deer uh, they don't absorb uh, or they absorb too much ir light they appear as bright black uh, when you see like animals out in the woods and stuff but normal terrain like this actually is is it's pretty pale it's not super high contrast black so high contrast black stuff uh, guns and black thigh straps and black cordura and things like that could be a bit of a problem. It can look great at night with white lights on, but under nods, it can stick out like a sore thumb. So do a little camouflage test, a night vision IR camouflage test. Look at your kit, mark what's good, mark what's not good. Get new, you know, sell some stuff, get new stuff if you're that concerned about night vision stuff. But uh, IR reflectivity, it's not just about bounce back of like id of like id tags and like american flag patches and like you know little things like that it's also the materials and if they're showing up as high contrast under night vision so things to think about take some night vision and check out your stuff if, if you have it and save up and buy some it's awesome so it's interesting to look at rifles under night vision and see some of the reflectivity uh and just how much ir light they're absorbing and a big question is uh, does spray paint help with some of that high contrast, bright black, uh, high contrast appearance that you want to avoid with night vision? And the answer is it kind of can a little bit. Uh, the different finishes and the anodize are generally going to be affecting the gun a little bit more. So what we have here is this is uh, one of Drew's rifles. This is an absolute mishmash 
of various colors. We've got an FDE stock, which as you can see under night vision looks great, uh, versus a stock, or in this case, this is a pistol brace, uh, that is black. And as you can see, it is indeed bright black, high contrast under night vision. So FDE, great. This is an FDE LCO, correct? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's, that's great as well. Uh, this is a black magnifier, it looks like. Spray painted lower, tan, brown. Tan. It's kind of what you're, yep. And that's blending great. This rail is uh, FDE, yes? Yep. Yeah, and that's blending great. Uh, the suppressor though, uh, I mean, it's just black because that's a, that's a black suppressor, right? Yep. Um, spray paint, so this gun right here, this is spray painted uh, Rust-Oleum green, how I do most of my rifles. And as you can see, it's not doing quite as well as a, a brighter or, or more tan uh, sort of a finish. Uh, but it is a little bit better than, say, uh, this rail right here, which is a brand new Centurion Arms uh, in black, which is much more high contrast, and the green's a little bit more muted. Magazines are also interesting. I've got, uh, where's that tan mag go? I've got two P mags here. I have a black one, which, as you can see, high contrast under night vision, and an FDE one, which is blending much better. So even on your kit, where your mags are located in your placard or in your, uh, just in your chest rig, if you have a bunch of magazines, you're going to have that high contrast of black above, you know, your nice Ranger green material or gray material or whatever it is. Uh, so FDE magazines, that's, that's pretty rad. Uh, this is gone. This is a budget gun that I just uh, spray painted. It's all green. Uh, but again, kind of going back to the Rust-Oleum green is sort of a mid-tone. It's pretty close to this black. Uh, a spray paint tan would look a little bit better. However, a spray paint tan will be more visible with white light. So then it's like, oh shoot, do I prioritize night vision? Do I prioritize, you know, darkness, white light, the naked eye, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this gun painted green is kind of dark. Uh, and then this one right here is uh, a brand new Colt rifle. And uh, even this is actually blending pretty good. Uh, this is just matte black anodized. And the lower and the upper receiver are actually doing a lot better than whatever the anodized is on the Centurion Arms rail that they've got going on here. And then there's a black peck, which is, you know, high contrast black. And uh, that's kind of how we're set up. This is a Raid X in tan, is blending much better with night vision, reflecting IR light much better. And uh, the black at PLCs appear high contrast. So important things to think about with your rifles, uh, you know, spray painting them with a Ranger Green or even an FDE uh, can be effective. Uh, but take a look under night vision. If you've got night vision, you have no excuse. Look at your guns, look at your magazines, see if there's anything you need to switch out, anything you need to change, anything you need to remove if you're trying to camouflage yourself in the IR spectrum. So I've got the Surefire M300 Vampire on the end of this MP5 SD, and you'd be surprised at how crazy these lights are when you select them over to IR. Now they're kind of weak on white light, I'm not gonna lie, they're not incredible on white light, although they are pretty focused. But on IR, uh, they fill this entire like area back about 90 meters. It's really, uh, it's actually very impressive. We're gonna see how far we can take one of these over on the long range. Um, but using this uh, EOTech on night vision mode,
as you all can see, blazing speed, acceptable accuracy up close. Now, what you all didn't see is my grip on the gun for my second shot was not great. And where 1R1s become even more evident, this is the biggest problem with 1R1s, is you get really lax on your recoil control. They bring the handgun out, they fire their one shot, they have their good grip that they establish from the draw. You know, their good grip they build, press the gun out. They do their reload, and then because they're on the clock and they wanna go really fast and they're under the stress of a timer, they're on the gun, they do their reload, and they just take it. With whatever grip they have, they just send it. And if you're only five yards away into a full USPSA target, that's fine. You're not gonna need good recoil management. You can shoot it one-handed. You can just do this and go and hit and you're fine. But is that gonna set you up for success if you have to fire five rounds or three rounds or at 100 meters? Josh is about 20 meters away with a Phoenix that's 1200 lumens. Go ahead and shine it at me. This is a Surefire EDC L-2, also 1200 meters. Go ahead and turn yours off. This is a Surefire X300 versus another Surefire X300 at 20 meters. All right, this is X300 Ultra at 20 meters versus a TLR-7. This is Surefire X300 versus a TLR-7 at 20 meters.
Something you should definitely do if you're training with night vision or white light for that matter is uh, run a couple drills with the light shining at you. So for this drill, what we're gonna do, we have this USPSA target. We're gonna be shooting in from at uh, seven or 10, I'm not sure. And I like to just tape the flashlight directly to the top of the stick, about where, you know, his arm might be. And I just lash the flashlight to the top. And your accuracy should be such that you will not shoot it. If you shoot it, you suck. But this is a Streamlight ProTac 2LX whatever. So uh, it works. That's the intended effect. And we're going to shoot nods straight into it. It's going to be dope. It's going to be sick. I use white light to help get past all the photons and all that fun jazz. I still activated my laser, double tap for constant, and then I ran white light to get past this guy for a total of five alphas. Now, I took my time, I didn't get off line of attack and all that crap, and yeah, I know. Uh, but a lot of folks haven't even shot into one of these to really know what's going on. So, isolate it out, do it static, see if your white light and your laser are powerful enough to get past something like this and what you need to uh, what you need to do about it. And this is one, two, three, four. one of those rounds down low. All right, ready. Stand by. Oh, okay, then we're good. <laughs> uh, always. Mine's brighter. Does it look brighter through, from your yeah. perspective? Yeah, yours is a little more robust. Looks a little more bright. Are you running an APLC? It's a hollow sun. Civilian oh. class. Yeah. With a high and a low mode. Oh. So what I've got here is the T-Rex Arms backstrap. This is a small upgrade that you can make to your existing chest rig, provided it has standard three-quarter buckles attached to the rear for a standard three-quarter strap, which most chest rigs have, whether it's a Haley chest rig, a Mayflower Velocity, uh, Spiritus Microfight, what have you. Uh, it will support this upgrade. What this is is an inch and a half of webbing, so you have a little bit more stability, a little bit thicker material, also a little more comfortable in my opinion, you know, versus that skinny little strap. Uh, and you have some stretch. Plus, you have the ability to adjust the size of the strap when you need to based on what you're wearing. So I'm gonna loosen this all the way out. I've already sort of tailored this, cut the tail and all that good stuff. So I'm gonna attach it to one side of my Mayflower. Buckle on this side. Bring it around. Buckle on this side. And as you will see, I have a little bit of play a little bit, which will result in my chest rig jumping all over the place. So what I'm going to do is bring the chest rig to one, the back strap to one side, and I'm just going to go ahead and tighten it to where I think I might want it, send it back around. I like having it, you know, tight fit so that stuff won't move around. And now the gear stays with me. It's nice and tight. I have that stretch, so if I spread 200 meters or whatever and I'm a little bit winded, a little bit gassed, this is not going to restrict me from breathing. So it's a cool little upgrade that you can buy right now with T-Rex Arms. 
provided they're in stock. And you can throw it onto your chest rig. If you hate it, you can give it to someone, sell it on eBay, and if you love it, then buy more. So we're doing some experiments with uh, the shooting standards that we're working on. And this is a 40 round course of fire that we're gonna be shooting. So not just coming out here and just shooting, you know, various drills without a whole lot of purpose, but starting at the five yard line, we have three headshots, three consecutive headshots with the goal being under half a second per. This is all uh, with weapon lights on our rifles. Uh, we then also have a flash sight picture at seven yards, which is five rounds, so it's a recoil management into the center target. Uh, the one, two, three, four, uh, which is on all three targets, and they're two meters apart, so we have a decent target transition. Uh, that's at the 10 meter. Uh, five reload five into both side targets. And then at the 25, we have two sticks for movement, uh, two on each target, move to the other stick, two on each target. So get our target transition rep in there, plus some marksmanship for a total of 40 rounds. So that is three headshots, 37 alphas is the count. And we're each gonna run this white light, and then we're also gonna run the same thing with night vision. It's gonna be sick. So there. Point seven two. And then seven. This is five rounds from center. Uh, one, two, three, four from ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven A's on this guy, which I think is an appropriate count. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So twelve A, two C. I have two two ahead, but I'm out one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So two Charlie. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice. So two Charlie. Five Charlie. This one I got two Charlies and three deltas. Not very good. Two Charlies and one delta.
hold a touch higher. A couple Charlies. Three Charlies. Yeah, I got two Deltas and four Charlies. Base targets. Under night vision from three feet away. Oh, come on. One, two, three, four. And I know I drove one low. Mm -hmm. Absolutely got awful, and I knew it. Uh, two Charlies, one Delta, and one Mike. Three Alpha, three Charlie, close. Very happy about that. Where'd you hold? Absolutely crushed mine. Had a fire attack mag. Five Alpha, one Charlie. Look when that laser's off. Mm hmm. Consistently. It's about the size of an A zone, mm -hmm. roughly. I'm just off to the right a little bit. See if I can fix that on the next one. That's a double. double call. That's right. a double. So three C for me. Yeah. Oh, that is an Alpha. That's a Delta you up there. All right, two C, one D. Yep. Two, two, two Charlie. And this is Drew's target. Your middle. Yep. Nice. You have two C. Right? I think Drew beat us. Drew shot it quickly. Yeah, Drew, you you beat us on that one. Weird. Seven Charlie. All my shots are consistently on the left edge. Total Charlies.
what? Seven. See, this is this is perfect. Yeah. I mean, uh, all right. So it's two C's, one A. Two C's. So I've got a little uh, tip here for those of you running panos. Uh, when you mount them to most helmets out there, Opscore Team Wendy, uh, you'll notice that the bungee stabilization retainers are a little loose and a little long because the uh, attachment point is so much further out than it would be on a normal set of binos. So what I like to do, uh, if this is the case, is I just tie a knot uh, into my bungee, uh, whether it's Ops Core, Team Wendy, doesn't matter. And what that does is that just tightens it up a little bit. So then when I come out here, I am, get in, get in, get in here. I'm set. This one's already tied off. I was trying to run a 14 on here. and So now I still have good tension on here. So that when they are deployed, I still have that stabilization happening with the panos. Now, if you didn't know that I was being facetious. So don't take this as a serious tip for most people because it's not. All right, Boa, loosen up. There we go. Stand by. like to Charlie gosh all right your heads were good you got uh, five Charlie That's uh, uh, four Charlie not bad not bad No, I didn't. What happened? Sprinting. I'll, I'll call it. Okay. Go! I had one mic. Alpha head Charlie. This guy was way more controlled. Although I have a Delta on him. Alpha Charlie Delta. Yeah, I was moving pretty quick too. <laughs> I was really trying to keep up with Luke. Don't do that. Well. All high.
Uh, three Charlie. Oh, uh, two are. This one's not. Okay. So counter is a miss. Okay. So we need 14. One, two, three. Six. Four Charlie. One mine. 11, and that's two Charlie. Hey guys, so I've got the new Phantom Hill budget laser right here on this Mark 18. It's my first time coming out here and shooting with it. I didn't have time earlier when I first got it. Uh, just didn't happen. But basically what you have here with this laser, it's an $800 laser unit with a integrated white light and IR illuminator and then IR laser here in the center. Now what's cool about having a laser positioned center of the laser, of your laser unit, center with the bore, is you don't have to worry about when you're, when you're creating a parallel zero, uh, you're literally just aligning the laser at the same windage uh, as your muzzle bolt trajectory. So the only thing you have to worry about at range is going to be your bolt drop uh, as far as knowing your holds. You don't have to you know, place the laser on the right side and have a parallel zero. So 12 o'clock's awesome. It does mean you can't use a front side post type gun. That's the only downside. Uh, the way this unit is set up is it is built uh, prioritizing right-handed, properly handed people. I have a small button here on the left that activates the white light. And then the button over here on the other side activates the IR, which I won't show yet. We'll get into that. Uh, but first I want to go ahead and engage some steel here at about 50 meters. This light is uh, not super powerful, but I can see this guy right here. I can see the paper out there at about 90. You can barely see the steel next to this car at about 90. Let's smoke the clear. All right, so the light's not super powerful. You all can see, but that, those are some shots. Difficult shots on uh, steel at about 90 meters. So now we got the 31s on. Let's check out what this IR laser is like. And this is laser and illuminator at the same time. Ooh. That's a that's a little bit. So we'll aim this at the ground. You can see I've got a pretty good circular, very clean illuminator. Like a, it's kind of like an M300 vampire. I'm illuminating that entire berm. If I transition over to here, I'm illuminating to the back of the berm, which is about 130. Not bad.
Not too bad, not too bad. Now the downside to this laser right here that I'm just looking at right now, take my hand off the gun, do my reload. I come up to the laser. These two buttons are super close together, which means accidentally hitting the white light, the possibility is very high. Now I know you could say, oh, we'll train, you'll be fine. Yeah, but these buttons are super close. I think they need to be further apart. So you have to accentuate your thumb even more. So when I'm done with my reload, I know reach to this corner is IR. Reach to close corner is white light. Because right now, under nods, like, okay, that's not too bad. I do my reload, come up. Okay. But the chances of hitting the white light, yeah, see, I feel it right there. Pretty high, pretty high. So that might need to be something you know, if they can modify it, that would be pretty cool. But over overall, very cool laser. This is a lower third aim point, and you barely see the top of the laser unit itself uh, in the optic. So all in all, very cool little unit for $800. Uh, but there's a couple little things they could probably do to make it a little better, a little more usable. But I like where they're going. Stand by. This size group. Huh? I have one Charlie. I'll throw. I'll, 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 I'll. Nice. You could come maybe two or three clicks to the right. That makes sense. Which is what I'm seeing on my side too. Gotcha. Is I have a good group. You know, it's all right here. So. That is a good group. That just needs to move to the right. That would have been me. And you were aiming right here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was aiming here. Since I'm uh, center, I, oh, I just put my laser right here, and I had a three-inch group. Yeah. Hot. Dude, center center laser is oh so much better. When you say yeah. center laser, what do you mean? It's center with the bore, so it's, you don't have to be sick. offset. <gasps> what? I didn't realize. That's Wait, how the ray. This is, is the laser right here. Yeah. So this is white, and this is IR. Yeah. If you have your aiming point here normally with your red dot, and you have your impact zone here, you'll just put the laser right in here in between. Dude. And you're done. Awesome. What? Yeah. yeah. Dude, that no, is it, it simplifies everything for the common dude. All right, I didn't think I'd run dry that much. We have Alpha Charlie, three Alpha, two Alpha, oof, A box, Alpha Charlie. Alpha Charlie. Looks like alphas. This is already marked. No, I should one, Charlie. That was my makeup. That's what it was. Oh. I felt my laser flash. So we're good on him. Up here.
when the AC-1 was originally launched, there was uh, a bit of an outcry for black AC-1s. Originally, we didn't make black. We had Ranger Green, Wolf Gray, because we thought that would be, you know, good enough, and uh, then Coyote Brown. But since then, we've added Multicam Original, Arid, and now uh, Black, which uh, we have just recently started stocking. And I want to show you guys uh, how I set these up and basically what you get out of the bag. So you are going to get an AC-1 with our a small, medium, large style cummerbund, pistol pouch, 5.56 pouch, uh, larger GP type uh, cell. So instead of having all 5.56 cells, you actually have a little more, um, you know, a little easier to, to have different stuff in the cummerbund. Uh, two chasm buckles that are pre-installed. These can be removed. And then you will be getting the AC-1 in whatever size you ordered it in. And if you get one in the size you didn't order, email us at team at Trex Arms and they'll, they'll hook you up and they'll get you squared away. So you can see right here, this is a size medium, uh, which is what I wear. I can also wear small, but I usually wear a medium or the logo and we're good to go. Now there's a couple things about this. The way I'm gonna be setting this up right off the bat, I know that I need to tighten up the shoulder straps to begin with. Uh, just I've worn AC ones enough that I know what I need to do with the medium. And I highly recommend you adjust the shoulder pads before you put the plates in. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna shove the shoulder pad, which is tweave material with some mesh on the inside. So it's not just a tweave sleeve, it actually has some mesh, some padding. We're gonna rip this apart. And then you are going to affix the Velcro to where you need it to go. Which for me, I know, uh, I think I wanna say I have a tiny bit of Velcro showing. That looks about right. It's possible I'll need to go a little tighter, a little bit looser, we'll go with that. I then unfold some of the Velcro over like this, get the tweave sleeve started. It's a little bit of a tight fit. And I pull it through, come around to the bunch. Oh, come on. Pull that, lay that flat, pull this center, and there you have it. So you can see it's uh, nice and tight. And then I'm gonna do the same thing here. And I move this to the back, grab the Velcro, same thing. There's a little bit of Velcro showing. These do have consistent sizing, so this will be center. Pull all the way to the front. See how easy that is. Center it back up. And I'm set. So now I have adjusted the height of the AC-1. The other thing that I know I'll need to do is I'm gonna need to loosen the cummerbund slightly. Now this is gonna depend on you know what you need to do, but what you do is you open the back flap, just like so, exposing uh, the cummerbund. You can also adjust how the plate carrier rides on you based on where you actually place the cummerbund. Um, we have a, a six inch piece of Velcro back here uh, instead of you know just like a little four inch field, so you can actually move it around. Uh, I wanna say I do the center. Uh, I'll have a little bit of Velcro overhanging. Also depends if I'm Velcroing the cummerbund over mag, full mags or not. So I have a little bit of Velcro showing. I'm also shifting it more uh, towards the top. I'm gonna fold this back under or over. And now I am set to receive uh, the plate. So we will go ahead and insert through the front. Flap opens up like any traditional uh, carrier. I'm gonna insert my 4800 LVs with plate backer. These are actually size small plates going into a medium. Because we have a large loop, uh, hook field and then a very deep loop field that goes all the way to this seam right here. You see how far this goes. I can actually set the tightness of this plate, the, the plate bag itself against the plate and keep it up here at the top. Um, there's a lot of carriers that don't do this. 
and it sucks. Uh, they just have like a little two inch piece of Velcro inside and so you're kind of screwed if you want to push plates to the top, but you can't. Then you have to pad the bottom out and it's just dumb. So we have a large, long piece of loop field so you can actually size your small plates or your medium plates inside your large carrier, you know, et cetera, um, accordingly. I cut this uh, part out of this, some of you might be wondering, why well, I cut this part of the uh, plate backer out uh, with these plates and how um, how much they are curving. Uh, this was actually being pressed too much into me, so I literally just cut that away for a little bit of relief and it works really well. On L210s, that's not necessary, but on these plates, they are curving pretty dramatically up into my sternum. So I went ahead, cut that little piece of foam out and it works way better. Um, so just a little DIY uh, modifications. If you need it, you need it. If you don't, you don't. Push it all the way to the top. Boom, we're set. Now, tourniquet holder. Got a little tourniquet holder right here. I like to have these on the left side. I try not to have them on the right side. Uh, what'll happen, and this is, and this is the, the cat tourniquet people get really upset. Uh, if you have this exposed, a little, a little, a little trick here. Uh, what I have often had, and there's a couple things you can do to get around it, I have had my sling get caught up inside the trap and then uh, literally pull the tourniquet out or just my rifle is stuck inside of there, which is one reason why I close the time uh, strap on the tourniquet to prevent my sling because like my gun's pretty important like having it accessible and getting it caught in there is a no bueno. Uh, the other option is you actually turn the tourniquet inside out. Um, so then the trap is turned inwards and that also helps prevent the uh, sling from getting inside the trap. But if you position the tourniquet holder on the left side, you can then have this facing out. You're not going to have any problems. This sling is over here doing its thing. Now I'm going to remove the swift clip buckles. Uh, they are easier to undo when you don't have plates in the carrier, but as you can see, they're still fairly easy to undo. Uh, they are split on one side. So boom, I've removed both of them because I want to run a little bit slicker and I'm going to be using a Velcro style placard on the front with the, the cummerbund on top. Uh, for a few options, I really like our STAC exclusive um, that we get made by them. That can, and I remove the buckles on that normally. I can slot that on, throw the cummerbund on, I'm set, I'm good to go, I'm done. These are very hard to keep in stock right now. Uh, Astac is working very hard to keep up with demand, but it's just crazy. If you want a style of carrier like that and you can't get that from us, this is another option. It's been around for a little while. This is the uh, the Pig uh, Chest Rig System, whatever it's called, um, made by SKD. And uh, it has Codex inserts as well, Velcro on the front. Does not have a lot of Velcro on the back, so you are gonna have to rely on the cummerbund coming over the top. There are little G-hooks that you can uh, hook into the bottom here. This is like G-hook compatible. Uh, so basically what that's gonna look like is I hook both of these, slap this sucker down, and exactly the same thing. Cummerbund's running on top, uh, just like so for my three magazines. If you can get the shingle from us, or there's a few other companies making these, this is gonna Velcro straight up on top of the carrier as well. Cover bundle will go on top. As you pull stuff out of the pouches, the entire thing's gonna sit flatter and be lower profile uh, against the carrier, because as you can see, it's uh, skinny, small. So, what we're gonna do is we'll run the shingle, because why not? And we're trying to get more of those in stock, because those also are almost impossible to keep uh, stocked. This SKD one's pretty cool though, I kinda like it. So pull that, shingle, center that up. Come run. Make sure the hood's popped out. That's what it looks like. Height's pretty good. It could be a little higher in the back, but this isn't bad, uh, especially for like a first time uh, fitting. And we're good to go.
horrible. Three alpha swim, Charlie. Five alphas, one Charlie. Four alphas. And 15, 56. So we've been playing with a bunch of different shooting standards and different things that we want to put up on our website. And one that I'm toying with right now that is quite difficult, and also one that you know probably not a lot of people are going to be able to do because it requires 50 meters, is two headshots on a USPSA target from the low ready or high ready in under two seconds rifle. Uh, I have done it. It's very difficult. It's not something I've been able to repeat three times. Um, under three seconds is very doable. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to shoot. I have three targets down there. So three strings of fire. I'm going to do my two, do my two, do my two. This is a five inch box and uh, see what kind of times, you know, we're putting down, hopefully sub three and then make sure we're getting our, our good hits. Uh, but this one's it's just uh, recoil management because you have those two shots you've got to have a good recovery and uh then good bounce of uh of speed the left target first stand by So 191 for the first guy. I think my first shot is uh, high right. It might be on. I think it was right over the head. So that's sub two, middle target. I think we're okay on him. Ooh, ooh, 192. Ooh. Watch, we're to get down there and only have one hit. Last target. I went high ready for that, so that definitely took longer. That is a 244 on the target on the right. So we had a 191, I think, and a 192. This suppressed MCX 300 blackout. Yep, called it. Somewhere right here, one hit. So failed. Failed. And a 244, solid. So under three is easy. Pushing the speed and getting that, that double with like a normal like duty work gun, not like some competition, you know, you're shooting on 3X with a muzzle brake. Uh, very difficult. Give it a shot. It's a, it's a good test.
was really bad. I dragged left on the middle. I dragged left on the left. And I dragged left on my last target, the back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Two C's? Left. One is here because it blew the paster off. Oh no, it's there it is. So, Charlie. So three C, one D. Yeah, these are them. I called them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So all scored. So that's two, one, five C, two D. That's minus um, 10. Minus 10. And it minus is for the C's. Eight for the delta. Uh, that's 200. Minus 10, 11, 12, 18. Two, so what is eight, a bunch of times. 40 divided by 3, 4, nine, uh, 11, and 14 is 2, 5, 5, 22. 22, oh, 5. Help. Ah. Ah. Magazine. Alrighty. Kind of got hung up there on the seat belt a little bit, which is a good reason. There's a lot of discussion on, oh, do you have the seat belt behind the gun, in front of the gun, et cetera, et cetera. But let's go ahead and check the hits. So through the windshield of my Forerunner, I've got some pretty solid shots, a little slow on the draw, probably already died. And uh, once again here, could have held a little lower. That was with my Winchester 147 grain uh, hollow point ammunition, hence why I swapped to my carry gun. Because, you know, I wanted to see what my, you know, defense ammo will do puncturing through my windshield. And uh, if we look at the windshield over here, we can see all alpha hits uh, through. Nice little transition there. And, uh, actually went pretty, pretty well. All right, is the sidecar holster the most modular holster on the market? Let's go talk about subguns and the sidecar. So what we have over here is we have an MP5, which we're gonna be using a little bit. Now I know you guys are wondering, why on earth would anyone use a rifle mag carrier or a submachine gun carrier, appendix, low vis, concealed, all that good stuff? Well. If you don't need it, and it's not something that, you know, you have a, a use for, don't buy it. Very simple concept. Same goes for a cuff carrier. You absolutely don't need handcuffs to be detaining people as a citizen, law enforcement officer, or military. I know some military guys are using cuffs now instead of flex cuffs. Uh, if you're not needing this, don't buy it. All you need to buy is the holster, the pistol mag carrier, maybe the tourniquet holder, uh, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna need this sucker. Uh, rifle mag carrier, same goes for that. Submachine gun carrier. If you don't have an MP5, you don't have an MP5 SD, a Scorpion, a Crank, I know, a PCC. I know everyone's making PCCs nowadays uh, for whatever reason, even though they're dumb. <laughs> kind of did in backwards order. <laughs> One reload four and a 333. Not bad, not bad. Do it again. Four rounds and a 483 for the pistol transition, a reload. It's really not that bad, you know? Oh, I was going to go and put it in my back pocket, but no, I want it right here, right in the front. Not bad, not bad.
This is the steel target that we have been using now for quite a while, I think around five years. This is the TA Targets Reduced ADAPT C-Zone. Uh, this is AR500, 550. Uh, this is the half inch variety. Uh, this is on a swinging uh, post so that I can absorb the impact and direct the frag more into the ground. So I want to show you guys just for size comparison. Uh, this is a full size USPSA target. So steel companies generally say C zone steel, which will be this entire thing. Or if they say reduced C zone. Oh, geez. I forget how small these are. <laughs> you will see. This is not at all a C-Zone target. Uh, this is very much reduced. And uh, as far as having a high standard of accuracy and marksmanship, uh, this is more or less just the A-Zone of the target. Uh, so what I like to do is I shoot paper. If I am really tracking my marksmanship, I'm really tracking my groups, I'm tracking my target transitions to see if I'm dragging rounds on or off target. And then if I just have to work training efficiency, if I just need to work reps in, and I don't want to walk up and constantly be pacing a target, that's when I utilize steel. Uh, or if I have a target that's a little bit further away, say 100 meters, 200, 300 meters, something like that with carbine, then I will shoot steel. Stand by. So I was shooting 100 meters with this lower third Scalarworks Leap with an Aimpoint T2. On this particular target, I was holding about right here. And as you could see, the group could be tighter. And I was shooting this a little quickly. Uh, but my, you know, as far as my windage and where it is, I'm set. I then removed the optic from the gun, untwisted the Leap mount, you know, dropped it around, put it back onto the gun to see if it returned to zero. Held more center on this target. And as you can see, the windage uh, did not shift, it did not change. So is this optic going to work and return to zero if for whatever reason it comes off of the gun or comes loose and pops off? The answer is absolutely. We've got these for sale over at T-Rex Arms. It's our favorite aim point T2 mount out there. They're super lightweight, super durable, have a really good return to zero, and uh, they're on sale over at Trex Arms. Check them out.
EOTech products on sale at T-Rex Arms. Alright, so one of our favorite products for Glocks is the Zev Mini Magwell. It's not a huge funnel like some of the competition ones out there. It's concealable. It doesn't require multiple screws. One screw through the back strap. Metal. The compact works on both Gen 3s and Gen 4s. And then the full size will work on your full size Glocks Gen 3, Gen 4 as well. We've got them on sale here for Black Friday. Definitely check them out. Do aggressive muzzle brakes like the Surefire shatter windows? Let's find out. No, they don't.
Charlie! Charlie! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, shooter ready. Yep. Stand by. That's a point six four. Shooter ready. Ready. Stand by. The point eight oh. Shooter ready. Ready. Stand by. Point nine nine. Stand by. There's a one nine four. Hard one too many. It was a four, six, seven. Was that eleven rounds or ten? Ten. Oh, was ten? Oh, then I'm good. Alpha, one, uh, excuse me, three Alpha, two Charlie. Yeah, uh, three to. Alpha, two Charlie. Yeah, that's good. Five Alpha, two Alpha, three Charlie. This is a perfect use case for the T Rex Arms back strap. So it is starting to get a little colder. I had this configured for wearing quite a bit less clothes when I'm using a chest rig. So I'm gonna show you guys just how adjustable this sucker is. So I'm gonna buckle it in on one side. And when I come over here, you'll see this is going to be pretty tight if I end up buckling it in. It works, but I may want it a little bit looser. Or if I upgrade to a larger jacket, like my Arc'teryx or something, uh, that I'm gonna to wanna to loosen it a little bit. So I bring it around here to the front, so I still have it attached to one side. I pull the tri-glide a little bit out, however far I need. So I have this much adjustment that I can work with. I'm gonna go to about half, I think it was about there. So I'm gonna pull out about an inch. Take it back here. And that feels a little bit better, but it's still tight enough that the entire rig isn't gonna fly all over the place as I'm doing stuff. And as you can see with the elastic, as I'm breathing, it can expand, it can stretch, it can move. And I still have that nice stability and that comfort. And I can adjust this even more if I put on a larger jacket or if I decide I can take this off because it gets a little warmer in the day, I can then tighten my back strap up so I can maintain that stability regardless of what I'm wearing if I'm using a heavier, larger chest rig. So check them out. They're on sale for this Black Friday and we've got them in multicam. Ranger green and black.
right, so that's three hits at 400 meters. The Trijicon ACOG is one of our favorite optics, especially for shooting out to around 400 meters. But, but the best thing about this optic is this right here. This optic retains zero. Dropped straight on its head from four feet. Three hits of 400, the Trijicon ACOG, on sale at T-Rex Arms for this Black Friday. A big question that we've been getting since we're launching the new sidecar is, where did the Raptor go? Are you guys gonna bring the Raptor back? Why should I buy a sidecar when I already have a Raptor? Those are all very good questions. The reality is the Raptor holster was a good holster. Uh, it's a holster that we've been making for a few years, uh, but, but we wanted to make something better. And what we found in testing uh, is, you know, when we were coming up with the new sidecar, everything we could get the sidecar to do, it was simply doing better than the Raptor. And so we really had to make a decision. Do we keep carrying a, in our opinion, and, and based on our experience, you know, an inferior product at the same time as this superior product over here that can do everything a lot better and more. So what you have right here, this is the sidecar and it's just standard configuration. Uh, the only thing that this, the, the only major cons this has to the Raptor is this is a little bit more expensive uh, than the original Raptor. But what I have here is the ability to run two clips if I want, which on the Raptor you couldn't. If you want to run a single clip, you could just remove this whole thing and run it like a, like this is a Raptor right here is what this looks like. Um, or at any time, if when I decide to, if I want to carry appendix, I can add accessories. I can add tourniquets, pistol mags, rifle mags. I can build this holster into whatever I need it to be. Whereas on the Raptor, it was just a standalone holster that the only thing you could really do with it is add a skinny clip, uh, the wide clip right here, and then have a claw that is removable and uh, you know you can add it or you know take it away. But one of the biggest issues to the Raptor, and uh, this is one that this is one reason I didn't like using it in the appendix position. If you are using the wide clip on this holster, which is easy to put on, uh, it's very comfortable. You know you can just you know drop the holster right on. It is not very stable, and this is with the claw installed, uh, in your pants. It is not very consistent. That's not great if you're trying to carry a handgun in a consistent position where you can draw fast and efficiently. So what I like about the new sidecar, and honestly any holster that has two clips, especially the further apart that they are, uh, you're, you're gonna have a much more stable holster experience. Where now the holster can't move like it could earlier with that big fat comfortable nice clip so now it's always in the same spot so if i'm sitting down or doing whatever it is good to go with both clips and with the sidecar specifically there's a few holsters out there that have uh the two clips close together the closer the clips are together the more the, the holster can kind of wobble back and forth uh, but this puts the clips pretty wide and they're wide enough you can fit most pants uh, belt buckles in the middle so you're getting better stability you're getting all the benefits of a raptor but you're also getting a ton of benefits at the same time. Yes, it costs a little bit more money, like I understand, uh, but this is also uh, you know, able to be upgraded in all sorts of different ways later on if you wanna change how you carry. Now, something that a lot of people don't realize is this holster in its configuration right now, even though it is a sidecar, uh, can be worn in the four o'clock position. And our little wing attachment here that takes the claw can have the claw set at all sorts of different angles. So if I'm wearing this at four o'clock and I wanna raise this up and I wanna have a, like an FBI cant or an ATF cant or something dumb like that, uh, I can actually twist this clip all the way and actually get the pistol oriented just like so at the four o'clock. And you couldn't do that with the old Raptor holster. I mean, you could kinda twist this clip over a little bit like that and you could kinda sorta try to get it at four o'clock but it just didn't work. So is the Raptor ever coming back to T-Rex Arms? The answer is it's not. And if you really like this holster, just based on how simple it is, and it's got the big clip, and just like how easy it is, you can go to eBay, you can look around, I'm sure there's gonna be used ones of these popping up all over the place, especially as people are upgrading to this holster, which we believe is superior. And uh, so if you are looking for a holster that can do what the Raptor does, but can also do it better, you should definitely check out the sidecar. It's more stable, gives you more options, 
It is a little bit more expensive. That is the con of this versus the Raptor. But uh, we feel that the benefits of this holster outweigh the cons and the pros of the old Raptor holster. All right, let's make some room. Let's talk about Mars Carriers. So last year in 2020, we were making some commitments and talking about inventory quite a bit. Last year, everyone in pretty much every industry had all kinds of problems with the supply chain, supply lines, especially companies that rely on Chinese products. And in the process of all this happening, we were deciding as a company, you know what? We want to have months of supply at all times on products. Now in our zealousness uh, for excellence, we may have possibly acquired a 14 month supply of Mars carriers at our current burn rate, something like 30,000 Mars carriers. So we've been sitting on these now. We've been stocked uh, pretty deep, you could say. And what we're doing for this Black Friday is we're having a little bit of an overstock clearance. 40% off all Mars carriers, rifle mags, pistol mags, different kinds of pistol mags, lefty, righty. We don't charge more if you're a lefty, we don't do that. Uh, but this is basically what you're getting. And we have a couple models. I have a couple belts to demonstrate and show some examples. But the real benefit of this mag carrier, and this is where I recommend you use a mag carrier like this, a Kydex hard shell Kydex mag carrier, is if you are using a two-piece competition style belt. So I have a Cry, uh, this is the Cry range belt. I don't necessarily recommend this belt if you want to put a lot of weight on it, but it is kind of dandy, it's kind of cool, it's very expensive because it's Cry. Uh, but as you can see right here, we have a two inch or one and three quarter inch uh, main body for the belt. A inner belt is used that goes through your belt loops on your pants. The outer belt is then applied to, uh, you know, put on your waist. And you have your pouches then attached to your belt. And what I use for that on all of my two-piece belts, regardless of what they are, I have a, a bunch of different companies' belts, is I use the Blade Tech Tech Lock, which is my personal favorite. And all I do is take a small piece of, you can find this at like Hobby Lobby and Walmart and places like that, or Lowe's, adhesive Velcro. A small patch of adhesive Velcro, and what this does is this gives you that Velcro uh, surface on your two-piece belt to adhere to your inner belt, as you can see. Because the last thing you want is one of these tech locks, and I should have one here. These all have Velcro on them. Here's one. Uh, that is just the plastic side, and you have that against your belt, and so then you have this, uh, basically this section of your belt that isn't actually attached to your hips, and it can fly all around and move around and stuff like that. You don't want that. So the adhesive that goes on the tech lock is a big deal if you're using this on a two-piece belt. Now, where I don't recommend using a Mars carrier is if you're trying to maximize how many magazines are on your waistline with a Molly belt such as the Orion, which is why we really like the S-Tac uh, Kiwi pouches. Uh, those you could stack, you know, five pistol mags on five rows of Molly, have the most amount of ammo, it's also quite a bit of weight, uh, on a Molly belt such as that. Whereas if you only want a couple magazines and you want them in a super fast, you know, with adjustable retention mag carrier system or something you can pop off really easily, add on a new one, uh, that's where the Mars carrier really comes in handy. So I use both styles of pouches for my different kinds of belts, uh, but I use two-piece belts quite a bit. This is an AWS, and as you can see, it has the Molly slots, but it's also slim enough that it can take one of these tech locks just fine, snap that on. These are also angleable. That is now a word. So I can angle my Mars carrier on the tech lock. You now, if I want a angle that is more comfortable with plate carriers and a little bit faster for more natural body mechanical efficiency, and um, that's what I can do with my Mars carriers. I can slide these all around. I can stack up three of them, four of them, uh, grab a rifle mag. So here's the rifle mag carrier. Slap that on, decide I don't need it, pop it off, put a pistol mag on, and I'm set. So if you're looking for a solid mag carrier that you can wear on your normal pants belt for when you're on the range, on a two-piece competition saw belt like one of these right here or others out there, there's tons of people that make them now. It's, it's a very common belt system. Um, definitely check out the Mars carrier. So I have an MCX right here. This is a custom 10.5 chopped uh, Virtus. And I have integrated QD cups, one here on the rail and one here on the lower receiver. And so what I've done is I have two BCM QD swivels. So when you go to buy a sling from any company, uh, what you should do is look at your rifle, 
see how the sling is going to attach to the weapon, and order the appropriate hardware at the same time. Otherwise, you'll get the sling with nothing, and then you have to go do this, wait another week, and it's lame. Order all the stuff you need right off the bat based on what gun you're putting the sling on. So the T-Rex arm sling is removed simply from the bag, and included with every sling are these two sling keepers. It is simply shot cord with a little plastic uh, tightener thingy. I don't know what the exact word is for these. And that allows you to tighten this on the rail against your sling. And uh, depending on how fat, how skinny the rail is and uh, retain the sling appropriately. Sling is then going to open up like so. We have a lot of excess material on the sling for some body types. But for someone like me who's skinny, I am not going to be using the full extent of the webbing on the, this is going to be the side uh, that attaches to the rear of the weapon uh, because I want the adjuster to be on this side for my support arm to manipulate. So I already know right now based on my body type and based on where I want the pad to be positioned on my back, on my neck, uh, that I am not going to be using much of this excess at all. I'm going to weave the little thingy on and then what I highly recommend you do so I've got my tri-glide holding the webbing in place or holding the QD cup in place. Send your webbing back through the tri-glide. This will prevent it from ever coming loose because I have had on occasion uh, on other company slings and once on our sling where I did not double it through that with enough tension and you know it kind of loosening, it actually popped forward and I caught the rifle, didn't actually hit the deck, uh, but the sling did ultimately fall apart because I did not double back through the tri-glide. So double back through the tri-glide, and then what you can do is you can either tape all this excess back to the sling like so, or you can just chop it away just based on what you want to do. But now I have the QD cup ready to go on this side. Moving down to the support hand side of the weapon. Again, we have a lot of excess material. Quite a bit. I know, being a skinny guy, that I uh, don't need all of that. So we are going to, I loosen the sling all the way, and I'm going to send the tri-glide about halfway down. Now this is where you're going to want to play with the sling a little bit and just see kind of how much adjustment you really need or want. It's also going to be dependent on the weapon. If you're attaching the sling all the way to the end and you have a 16-inch rifle or a 20-inch armor-piercing M16 clone, um, you're going to want to have a much more uh, adjustment than a smaller gun like this Virtus where I'm attaching it you know, pr pretty close uh, to each other. So I'm going to run the tri-glide about halfway down. QD. Runs all the way down. And then again, doubling back through. This is how much adjustment I am going to have. It's not a lot, but it should be enough. But before I chop all this excess or tape it off or do whatever, we're going to go ahead and test this on the weapon. I want to show how the sling retention keeper, at least how we intended, is to be used. You can also wear them as a fashion accessory to show that you uh, like wearing things on your wrist. So normally you'd put this on before you attach your laser and your light. But as you can see, since it's shot cord, I can still get this on just fine over my end gall and my Surefire. You want to run this in front of your QD cup, not behind. And I'll show you why when I uh, put the sling on the rifle. So it's already fully loosened and it's pretty tight to the gun, so it should retain the sling pretty well. Just like on a rifle magazine, when you reload, you push-pull, or doing an administrative reload, we're going to do the exact same thing with the QD cups. When I put the cup into the rail, I'm going to pull, push-pull, and make sure it's actually seated. This is actually fairly tight. So this is it in the fully loosened position, right here. So I could probably loosen this sling a little bit, because then when I tighten it all the way, it is very snug to my body. Now you may want that. You may want it to be really snug when you actually go to loosen it. So if you put it on your back and then tighten it up, it's really snug like so. So this is where you're gonna wanna play with how much adjustment you want for your rifle. You know, are you someone that just wears it around your neck? Well, then you probably don't want a ton of, you know, adjustability where it's dangling down by your knees. And something like this is actually going to be just fine for everything that you're trying to do. 
As far as folding the sling up on the gun itself and utilizing the sling keeper, this is basically how it works. I tighten the sling all the way down usually. Sometimes, depending on how it is, it may, I may come out a little bit. I'm going to fold the sling up on itself. Actually, in this case, I'm going to loosen it a little bit. And I'm constantly pulling. So I'm pulling on this side outwards, pulling on this side inwards. Nice and tight. I then take my sling keeper. And it is positioned like so. If the sling were a little bit longer, it would be out here, which would be preferable. Disregard that. We'll just assume that's not even there. And with the sling in this configuration right here, I prefer attaching the sling on the uh, halfway on the rifle, upper receiver, lower receiver versus on the stock. The problem with stowing a sling on a stock, especially if it's on the side that your you know, cheek goes down on, is uh, I can't get a side picture because I have this huge bundle of sling in the way. But having the sling positioned here on the rifle away from the stock, I can still manipulate my rifle, manipulate my safety, manipulate my mag release, and actually run the gun just fine, even though I don't have the sling around my neck being worn um, you know, the way it needs to be used. And if you're using a, uh, a folding stock weapon, such as this Virtus, uh, I can fold the stock on this sling and I can still run the gun just like this for a faster ADS time. Uh, so that's why we like bundling our slings on the rifle versus on the stock. There's lots of different ways of doing it for stowing the sling. Uh, and then when it comes to actually deploying the sling, it's gonna be very simple. I'm just gonna grab anywhere on the sling, pull, and it's on. Swim through, pull to the rear, and I'm set. So that's how you set up the T-Rex arm sling onto a carbine. There's a lot of different attachments out there you can use to mount this to your, whether you need a clash hook or you wanna, you have an HK with like a little loop that you need to put a little, you know, uh, little paracord thingy through or whatever, or just HK clasp into. There's a lot of different methods for doing that. We have all those available at T-Rex arms. And uh, you can also set this, uh, the adjuster, you can actually flip it the opposite direction. So by pushing forward, you actually loosen. By pulling to the back, you actually tighten. Uh, versus right now, you push forward to tighten and you pull away to loosen, which is the traditional method that most adjustable slings are made in today. Hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching. So I was shooting 100 meters with this lower third Scalar Works Leap with an Aimpoint T2. On this particular target, I was holding about right here. And as you can see, the group could be tighter. And I was shooting this a little quickly. Uh, but my, you know, as far as my windage and where it is, I'm set. I then removed the optic from the gun, untwisted the Leap mount, you know, dropped it around, put it back onto the gun to see if it returned to zero. Held more center on this target. And as you can see, the windage uh, did not shift, it did not change. So is this optic going to work and return to zero if for whatever reason it comes off of the gun or comes loose and pops off? The answer is absolutely. We've got these for sale over at T-Rex Arms. It's our favorite M.2 mount out there. They're super lightweight, super durable, have a really good return to zero, and uh, they're on sale over at Trex Arms. Check them out.
The Surefire muzzle brake is particularly cool when you start running suppressors because the ports act as a sacrificial baffle. We've got these on sale over at T-Rex Arms for this Black Friday. So, we're here in one of the middle stages of ultra production. We have conveyor belts, not conveyor belts, but we've got these little belts running all through this entire part of the building, moving product from each step of the process. So what we have right here is the bottom belt is bringing in new holsters that need to be buffed. They need to have all the finishes clean, they need to have the holes green. Those are on this layer right here. When they are done being worked on by one of these guys right here, they're gonna set the bin on the top and that is gonna be transporting it to the cleaning station and then the bending station for uh, that particular uh, holster. So what we have right here, we'll check the date on this one. This was ordered on the 25th. So four days ago, I think it's the 29th right now, that holster got ordered and it's already chopped up and getting worked on. This is a Glock 17 Ragnarok in Ranger Green. Let's go follow this one right here. A bunch of Ragnarok ordered on the 25th. Not bad. We'll speed, we'll, we'll, we'll speed this along on its way. So this goes from here to the end. You have two cleaning stations right here. So then guys take from here, clean it out, and then when that's done, you put it on this conveyor belt, where it then takes it off to get bent, which is uh, these two stations on either side. So usually I think they let these kind of pile up. They let a, a bunch of holsters roll in to get clean, and then one of them pulls off from that station over there to actually clean, and then he can go back to it. So these are gonna sit here for probably a little bit. And as you can see, there's buffing dust from the wheels and just dirt and grime and kydex and all that stuff and that needs to be cleaned off before it goes on to getting bent. So this gets done, then this gets moved to here, and then... Stops right here-ish. And then we have these elaborate bending jigs for our... Uh, these are mainly for the sidecars. I don't believe we use these for the Ragnarok's. We use an older method for that. We have custom uh, machinery that gets used, that our engineer, our in-house engineer came up with, which is awesome. Uh, so we stick the holster and that in there and drop it, and it bends. We've got our, our really advanced flattening iron to heat up the Kydex. Look at that right there. It's really, really stiff. But so down here we have sidecars getting bent. So again, this is the uh, system we've got going on. How long do these have to be in for? 15 seconds? Oh, wow. That's it? Yep. Is there any sort of like air or like cooling going on or is it just air? Just cool, air cool. Uh, no cooling. That's right. Wow. That's pretty cool. So it's probably done about now? Yep. All one order, so that just got done. Got nice, and then it goes on the top one, right? Oh, hot. When was this ordered? Let's see. The 25th. That's super cool. And then, so it comes to here, and then you're like, well, what happens next? Well, we got to get the teeth, the little tooths cut out of this. So then these get loaded up on our special cut jig. Again, made it now. We've got it going over here on one batch. And uh, it's gonna go through. It's like a 10 minute process for uh, one run of holsters. So they're gonna load these up and then this robot is just gonna chop all those little notches out. And then those get quality control checks right here. You can see Mr. Stokes doing that right there. So he's sticking them in stamping them, making sure all the notches are perfect, screaming them out, perfection. 
shipments. So Black Friday shipments are coming through just constantly. Over there, they've got holsters. They said that all the invoices that are uh, on white paper, they use colors for different uh, days and stuff, is Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So they're cranking out holsters from Thursday. So they're, they're doing well over there. And over here, they're also doing well. Uh, this is all armor that is going out, ordered uh, around during Black Friday. Uh, these are more boxes. That one's full, bag, bag, bag box 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 this one's filling up from the belt they've got five shippers on the line um, they should have um, most of the orders done by the end of this week but there's some lead time because this is a month of sales basically in three days so uh, our, our same day shipping may not be happening right now or close to same day shipping but it's still impressive One seven. Not happening. <laughs> All right, so that's the one through ten drill, or the one, two, three, four drill, whatever you want to call it, where we start center, hit the left target, right target. Back to the center. So two alphas on the left. Should have five alphas. Center. Nice. Rattled those off pretty quick. Oh, and three alphas on the right. And that's at a time of 4.1 seconds. Now, this is actually, I'm actually really happy with this. This is running iron sights on this drill, moving multiple times between targets. And that is a very decent time. I'm shooting this in three something with like more fancy kitted out guns. Uh, but four seconds like this with an iron sighted rifle is not bad. I'm sure I could do it faster, give myself a couple Charlies and do it sub four, but uh, I'm pretty happy with that. It's not bad. This budget, ballistic advantage, 16 inch gun, Centurion rail, keeps it around 1100 bucks, a grand. It's nice. If you were on a budget, there's some really good chest rigs out there. If you're just looking for a way to carry a bunch of ammunition, to complement your rifle. This is an ATS chest rig. It was like 120 bucks. It has four integrated M4 mag pouches with pull tabs and then molly on each side, but it does have uh, built-in pockets inside the molly section here on each side. So this one fits my radio. This one can fit whatever else you could put in there. And then you can add your basic molly pouches uh, right on the front. Three rows of molly, so a three row GP pouch like this one from Eagle and you're good to go. So you don't have to necessarily have, you know, the, the fanciest, like coolest chest rig out there, even a Mayflower. Um, if you don't have a ton of money, you can get something like this. Four magazines that go with your gun, it's not bad. Plus it has the integrated uh, map pouch right here, like most chest rigs or all good chest rigs have. And then what I actually really like about this particular one is it has a generous amount of Velcro on the inside for attaching to your plate carrier and or uh, your little dangler pouches and whatever. Uh, and I've got a budget rifle here. This is a Ballistic Advantage 16 inch uh, with a Centurion handguard, arrow lower, iron sights. I do have a fancy trigger, I guess, but whatever. And uh, we're gonna see what this, what all this can do. Oh, yeah. 
yeah. Got the T-Rex back strap on here. Give me some stretchy, stretchy. Keep it a little more in place. All right, so first target I had a makeup. I uh, called this guy like way over here, but I uh, guess it's not as bad. Five Charlies, five Alpha, one Charlie. Four Alphas, neck, Charlie. That was from the kneeling. And then we've got three Alphas, two Charlies in the prone. Yeah, I felt one of these a little bit. This should have been all Alphas, no matter what. But uh, loading from this, not too bad. And uh, a bunch of the iron sight gun. So for the standards that I've been working on, you are probably familiar with the array of targets we have down there. It's three USBSA targets five yards apart. What I like to do, the main standard is uh, inside of 25 yards, you can do it at most ranges, indoor, outdoor, you know, nothing crazy. But I take the same three targets, I come back to 50, and this is where I focus on a little more marksmanship. So the first one is five rounds into body A zone in under five seconds. It's not too hard, not too difficult, but you do have to do it three times in a row. So having the three targets already set up, I have some efficiency. I can just shoot all three of them, then walk up, check all the hits. And then the next one, which is even more difficult, actually a lot more difficult, is two headshots from back here in under three seconds. Or what I'm trying to do is under two seconds. And yes, it is possible, but it's very difficult. And once again, we're gonna do it three times. So I'm gonna shoot all my bodies, and then I'm gonna, actually I'll shoot five on a body, reset, two into that head. Go to the next target, five into that body, and then two to the head. So I'll walk down and I'll have lots of data to look at, see how many times I've failed, because I will. I'm using a 16 inch ballistic advantage with iron sights, and my front sight post is basically covering the entire head. So we'll see how this goes. Five in the body first. Stand by. That actually felt pretty good, but I probably have a couple Charlies in there. 4.8, so right on the line at five seconds. Now, double headshots. I'm not gonna try to do this in two seconds with irons. I'm just gonna go for the hits. See how long it takes. That was good, that one, left shoulder. All right, middle target, so we five rounds. That was in a 3.6. 4.75, two to the head on the center. I think I have one neck, and then one's like right on the right side. Got exactly four and one. Five into the body. That one felt really iffy. <laughs> that felt really bad, five, one, six, and it was overtime. Two in the head. All right, now for the moment of truth, that was in a 3-2. So it's not gonna happen with irons, probably not in under two seconds. That's a little, be a little harsh. 
But this is the stuff I'm doing a lot of right now. It's not cool, but it is very helpful. All right, so I called five alphas. He's on the line. He's actually like 70% off the line, so normally I wouldn't count that. So four A's and a Charlie. Single head, one out. That's pretty common. I'll have like one in, one out. One in, one out. Yep, see? Yeah, I called that though. Neck, head. Uh, unless, maybe it was on that one. He's from here. He's probably from here actually. So one in, one out. So I failed across the board. These are, holy cow. Yeah, I said this felt iffy and it was 516. Uh, but my heads were good on him. So I have one completed at marksmanship from 50 yards in the head. And uh, the re all, failures across the board. I'm a failure. But uh, this is good stuff. That's not bad, uh, but very difficult. Especially with something like this. Hey, Charlie, 377. Go one more time, mill target. It's on that right side, Charlie. Well, right side A, Charlie line. Three, seven, six. All right. Headshots. Double head. Two, four, one. It's so kind of on the left side of the first target. Should be good. Two seven eight. Two ten. So these are the the marksmanship type drills that I've been doing a lot. So the standard that I'm looking at is from 50 yards into the head, two rounds, anywhere in the head doesn't have to be in the A box, in under three seconds. So I just did all those in under three. I'm trying to do under two though, but that's spicy, and I've only done it like twice. And not repeated, no, not and not repeated, not like three times in a row. And then uh, five to the body in under five seconds, which depending on the weapon that you're using is easy. Although in this case, I failed miserably because I was shooting it too fast. Um, that's not great. That's so why I shot one more time. One head. I think I called that one. I said off the left side. So these are in. He's good to go. Much better. Although I dropped it, Charlie, and then he's good here. So. Doable all day with this. And that was in a, that was actually in a 210, that last one on this guy. So uh, that's not bad, that's close to under two seconds. So that's pretty rad. And I was just putting the chevron in the entire head, because they have 100 meters zero, so it's kind of in the lower part of the chevron is my actual point of impact. The top of the chevron right here, ish. So that's running all three static systems on this rifle. I've got ACOG, I'm at 25 meters on these. Offset delta point on one of our offset mounts. And then my Wilcox RAID on high power, which I can see being overcast. So I've got five alphas with the D-Pro. I've got five alphas with the ACOG. I shot that pretty quick, should have held a little higher. And five alphas with the laser, which is probably the slowest of all five salvos. And uh, rightfully so, at this distance, as you're shooting in the laser, I mean, it was disappearing every time I shot off the target. And you gotta like find it back on the target versus your sight, which you can see exactly where it's going right after you shoot. Try it. If you have a bunch of different things on your gun, run a drill where you cycle through all of them and see which one is the weak link. Some of y'all love rifle build talks, so I figured I would run over my primary 10.3. So this is a custom gun that we made in-house a couple years ago, a few years ago. It has a Criterion 10.3 barrel, an arrow uh, lower, a full, you know, completed, you know, lower. It's just cheap, budget, works very well. 
And then we have a Voltor Murr upper, which has uh, been really nice. It actually pushes the forward assist a little far forward so that you can actually get in and grab the other side of the charging handle uh, if you need to, uh, or if you're running two fingers to clear a bolt override, something like that. It just kind of pushes everything further forward, which I really like. Uh, standard Magpul stock, although I switch around and use all kinds, and so it doesn't really matter. And then what I have on here is for the optic setup, which is honestly uh, one of the most, I don't want to say important parts of the rifle, but the way you like see targets and shoot them and get your hits is pretty important. Uh, I have the Trigicon ACOG TA31, so it's the standard chevron uh, reticle tape on top to uh, mitigate how bright the reticle is. I have that on an ADM QD mount, which I uh, actually really like, although the standard one's not bad either. An offset mount, so I have our, our offset mount, the T-Rex Arms one, with the riser plate installed with the D-Pro. This entire optic package, just for comparison, weighs 17.7 ounces. Uh, compared to like an EOTech with a magnifier or even an Aimpoint T2 on a tall mount with a magnifier, uh, this comes in lighter than those different optic setups. Um, so that's something that I really like. I was weighing stuff uh, recently on a stream, and I was actually pleasantly surprised that this right here was beating out a bunch of other setups. And the benefit to this over like a red dot with a magnifier is I have two separate optics. I have clear glass. This is actually four power, not three power. Uh, there's just a lot of benefits to this right here over like an aim point or an EOTech with a magnifier. But there are advantages with those. I'm not saying there isn't. Um, but I actually really like this setup right here. Uh, moving down, further down the gun, uh, I don't have backup irons because I have two different optics. Actually, I have three sighting systems on the gun technically, uh, although the laser you can barely use in the day. But this is a RAID X, I believe is what it's called. I can't even remember. It's the Wilcox fancy, expensive, high power laser. Um, on high power, it is visible, uh, more easily visible in the day, uh, but otherwise I don't really count on being able to see the Viz laser. I have the pressure pad for that, Velcroed to one side, and then I have my uh, ST07 Surefire uh, mounted to the back. So basically when I'm doing night vision stuff, uh, my hand is going to be like this on the gun. If I reload or do something, I'm back to here. If I'm doing white light, I know I'm just going to be breaking my thumb over the gun to be hitting the white light. So I have both buttons very separate, which I've started doing a lot more. I used to use the whole like double pressure pad thing. And uh, I know the argument is, oh, well, with training, it won't be a problem. Yes, but no. Um, all sorts of weird stuff can happen. Uh, wearing gloves, it's harder to tell like which button is what. So I actually prefer to go off of location as long as I'm not having to completely jack up my hand. Like if I had to go all the way under here to hit a laser or all the way to the front, that would be a problem. But in this case, it's thumb forward, thumb back, thumb forward, thumb back. And I know exactly which item I am getting on the gun as I'm you know, picking which one I need. And then I have a Surefire RC2. I've had this one for, I think four years or something like that. Uh, still going strong. Uh, it is probably a couple ounces heavier because of the carbon buildup. Uh, but this gun right here weighs about 10 pounds. I know it sounds like a lot, but for a gun with a suppressor, a laser, a, a big light, uh, multiple optics and everything, uh, it's not too bad. And uh, I've been using this now for a few years and uh, it's money. It's really nice. I like it a lot. Oh yeah, and then I have a Geisley trigger and a bad lover. I forgot, I forgot about all that because I'm like, eh, whatever. Radiant charging handle, the SD one. What else did I forget? T-Rex sling, put grip tape here, but it's all worn away. I think that's it. All right, so this is the Knight's Upper that I got recently, the CQB Mod 2, it's an 11.5. Shoots nice. Is it worth $4,000? Absolutely not. Is it worth what Knight sells them for? Probably, but due to supply and demand, people want to pay through the nose for these things, and uh, they fluctuate in price about as much as Bitcoin. So, uh, but is it a nice rifle? Absolutely. Knight's was kind enough to uh, hook us up with this uh, used can of theirs. This is the uh, PRT. CQB mini tan suppressor thing, uh, PRT is what it's called. So the way this works, to put it on, and I know a lot of you guys are waiting to buy these and I can understand why, it's pretty cool. Little notch right here, notch on your muzzle device. And we're not gonna dechamber the rifle because I like to live dangerously. And then you take the collar and you thread it downwards. 
And they probably say, don't let it ratchet, kind of like a Surefire. I'm just gonna let it ratchet. And what it does is it's like pushing everything and all the bearings in and it's just a really nice lockup, really nice fitment. I bet the, the repeatability of the suppressor is really good. We're gonna do some experiments with that. So the cans on there haven't changed anything. Injection's good. Not bad, but here's the big test. Cause this isn't like as quiet as like a full size suppressor, obviously. And this isn't gonna do justice to the microphone. So a mini suppressor, 11.5 barrel, no ear pro, 55 grain. Oh crap, this is my good ammo. Son of a gun. I just shot a bunch of expensive hollow point boat tail. That, that's okay, we'll keep going, because anything for the video. Uh, I, th I thought it felt a little strange. So, this is my defense ammo, so my home defense ammo through this gun, and uh, we'll see how loud it is. That's actually not too bad. I felt like it was louder the other day. So then, ear pro back on. That's not bad. That's really not bad. You, there is still the crack of the sonic barrier being broken, Well, there it goes. I remember how much money that is. Oh, you wanna you wanna see Chad? Yeah. It's not bad. It's actually better than I thought. I came out the other day and shot this, and with Ear Pro on, I was like, oh man, this thing is still pretty loud. Um, but that's actually that's not too bad. Would I want to shoot this out Ear Pro all the time? And will I train without Ear Pro? Absolutely not. That's a stupid thing to do if you have a suppressor. You should still wear Ear Pro, unless you're shooting like subsonic through in a blackout or something that's not breaking the sonic uh, barrier. And you're getting that crack. Uh, you should still be wearing Ear Pro. There's no reason to sacrifice your hearing. Uh, just for fun, unless you're just a moron. But uh, that's not bad. If I had to jump out and shoot an animal on the side of the road with one of these suckers, not a problem at all. Not going to have any uh, issue with my hearing. So a uh, very cool suppressor from Knights. It is very expensive. We paid a lot of money for it. And um, I'm sure they're going to cost a lot of money when they come out. And uh, you pay for quality. Um, so yeah, pretty rad. There goes all my fancy ammo. All right. So a three position drill with the Acro P2 on a Glock 19 with a TLR7 Alpha mounted to an old Adam slide. We've got two Charlies, four Alphas, nice little group. We have, I suck, two Alphas, four Charlies, and then over here we've got five Alphas and one Charlie. And that was in a time of, I think that might be right, it's recording 20 shots, but I didn't fire 20 times. I fired six by times three, 18, but that might be right. May have hit my jacket or something. 18 is 462. Not sure. It's all A's. Not the best grip. So this is the Acro P2. Fun fact, it's basically an Acro P1. It's just got better battery life, but it's same uh, size, uh, weight. It might be off a, a little bit. I think they lightened it slightly using the polymer battery cap. But it's pretty much the same thing. It's not wildly different. Um, I'm not needing to shoot, you know, 50,000 rounds with this to know how it's different from a P1. It's pretty much the same thing. It's a little little mailbox you drop onto your, your gun that has an enclosed emitter, high quality. Uh, the P2 is a major improvement to the P1 simply because of the battery life. Um, but that was just a couple a little uh, build drills up close. Recoil management with the P2 with any sort of like T1 or, or like or this site, you are going to have, unfortunately, because of science and physics, a little bit more recoil than a lighter weight optic or no optic at all because you're adding weight up high on the slide. Now this is not bad. I used to run the T1 on Glocks quite a bit with the Unity slides. That's what this is right here. And those did recoil quite a bit um, compared to obviously a pistol that doesn't have that weight up here you know, far away from your hand. So if you were to take this optic and move it up here, science, leverage, and you know, all that good stuff, you're gonna create more recoil, right? Because you're dabbling in more physics and stuff. 
Uh, is this bad? No, it's not. Is it more recoil than an RMR? Yes, it is. Is it more recoil than iron sights? Yes, it is. Uh, but you could still run it pretty fast, and uh, it's pretty dope. Let's shoot uh, on all three of these. So this is gonna be two, two. So we'll shoot a total of 12 rounds. So I do have six in the gun, slide lock reload. So we'll start on this guy. One of those. All right. So I checked one of the guys on uh, that guy. will be on one side. So A's on him, four A's. Two Alphas, two Charlies. Yep, and this is the one I chucked. I felt it, it was the, the first string. One Delta, two Alphas, one Charlie. So, and that was in a time of not, not horrible, uh, 702 uh, with a reload from concealment with the acro. And then let's try this. Seven yard JJ drill, two in the head, from compressed ready in under one second. I don't have enough ammo, but I flubbed that one horribly. Second shot was right here. And actually, no, it was like right here. And that was in an 8.8. It is doable. I just didn't do it there. So as some of you guys know, or possibly all of you since we've been posting them quite a bit, we recently acquired a couple old Remington Defense RSAS rifles. Uh, normally they have an 18 inch barrel, but I thought, man, how cool would it be if we just butchered one of our RSASs and turned it into a 14.5? Look how sick this thing is. It's nice and just compact and small. And uh, so we've been shooting this a little bit, but uh, kind of the, the thing that I've been thinking for this gun is this is, you know, our dedicated one to six or even a one to eight DMR rifle. And uh, it just kind of makes sense to have a shorter barrel for that kind of magnification. And then uh, we have the suppressor on there. Obviously that can come right off. And uh, we've been shooting this out to 600, 500, no problems. Although we have had some ammo issues with some various cheap ammo. And uh, this thing's pretty cool, but it's definitely one of a kind because the RSAS, at least uh, to my knowledge, uh, was never made with a shorter barrel length. Uh, so we sent this down to JP, who originally worked on this gun with Remington, and they hooked us up. Uh, we paid for it. And, okay, disclaimer, they didn't give it to us for free, uh, but they hooked us up with a new barrel uh, for this rifle that'd be a little bit shorter. And uh, it's, it's nice. You think the RSAS in Tarkov is nice the way it is? Just imagine if you could shorten the barrel. So Nikita, if you're watching this, uh, this gun right here, this configuration is uh, a real Chad Slayer. It's pretty rad. Oh, the last one did not feel good. Nine, six, four. This is the T-Rex Eagle Active Shooter Response Sling Bag. Yes, I know that title is uh, quite a mouthful, but what this product is is pretty simple. It's a, so a small bag with a single strap, a waist strap for stabilization to help support your rifle, your pistol, yourself, 
could be medical gear, communications, whatever it happens to be. So what I have right here is a small bag that has two rifle mag pouches on either side, a small pistol pouch, multi-tool or flashlight pouch on the front of that, and then a larger medical pouch, which can have cat tourniquets, other medical equipment, or you can simply drop one of our ITRKs, uh, the larger or the smaller one, zip it up and call it a day. There's a pull tab that you can use to help open the pouch if need be. And then on the inside of the pouch itself, there is a chest rig style uh, GP pouch, map pouch that can hold all kinds of different things. So basically, what is the premise of this pouch? Well, the way that we're using it here at T-Rex Arms is this rides in our vehicles along with a rifle or goes into our clothing bag on a trip, something like that. So I can really easily grab my rifle, grab this little satchel and have ammunition, medical gear, whatever else I think I might want or need to go with the gun. So I don't necessarily have to travel with a, a full chest rig or even a full set of body armor with all the equipment on that. I can just take this little sucker, hang it up on the seat of my car. It can sit in the floorboards and give me a little bit of everything and putting it on is pretty fast. We have these in gray, ranger green and black. Eagle makes these in multi-cam and I think a couple other colors like coyote. Um, although uh, personally speaking, I'm, I'm not sure what the benefit of that is. Uh, we're using a product like this in a situation where you actually need camouflage. Uh, this is actually uh, very much camouflage in an urban environment wearing the clothes that I'm wearing right now versus if I was wearing a coyote on top of this uh, downtown Nashville, uh, that would not be very camouflage or multi-cam for that matter. So let's actually show what kind of uh, what kind of equipment I can actually fit in this. So the rifle mag pouch, because some of you are going to ask, does it fit AK mags? 545. The answer is yes, it does. In fact, the rifle mag pouch technically will fit two 30 round stain ag magazines. It's a double mag pouch. Now I haven't been using it uh, for that, but does the pouch actually work for that? Yes. So this can support four rifle magazines, kind of like a sort of a rifle bandolier to you know complement your slick plate carrier or whatever. Uh, but that's not how I've been using it. I have one rifle mag on either side, and then I have a pistol mag and usually a flashlight and then my medical gear inside. Now, one of the cool things about this pouch or uh, this, this sling bag, I should say, is it's a pretty effective way of uh, grabbing a radio real quick and having something all rigged up. So what I've done to this one right here is I have a radio in the back pouch because it's less accessible. So the ammunition stays in the front, radio in the back. And I've run the cable and taped it off along the shoulder strap. And then I fashioned a small little area with tape that the clip of the PTT can clip into. So then when I go to put this on, I can really quickly have communications. So if you're a first responder, you're a firefighter, you're a cop or it's an active shooting you know, type of situation, which is obviously what the name of this product is you know, originally uh, based around that kind of incident. Uh, this is a really fast way of quickly throwing on a radio if it's not something that you already carry. So pretty cool. The other thing that uh, you can do with this pouch that I think is very nifty is it has a uh, chest rig style expandable map pouch. You don't just have to put maps in this. Uh, so there's a couple things you can do. The smaller size of DACA pouch will actually fit inside of this. You kind of have to, uh, kind of have to kind of push it in there. It's not a perfect fit, but as you can see, that fits in there just fine. So then you have some waterproof ability of whatever documents or whatever you want to throw in there. You can also do other things like one of our chem light holders with uh, chem lights uh, and batteries, drop that in there, you can put your gloves in there, Ziploc bag with writing, uh, utensils and or a notebook, headlamp and compass. That can all go in there as well. And again, it can be in a waterproof bag of some sort. So I can have all that in addition to everything else. And then you could have maps and all the normal stuff that people put in there. So if this is a product that is uh, something that it's sort of a sort of a hybrid between something like a ready rig, a chest rig, uh, and then going with something like a plate carrier. Uh, it's very inexpensive. This is actually something that I would consider uh, using in a rifle class. You know, going to a rifle class or even teaching a rifle class, I just want to throw something on to have, you know, my medical and my magazines in a, you know, pretty easy way to use for not a lot of money. Uh, this thing does that. Um, now, is this going to be as effective as a dedicated chest rig for running around doing stuff in all day and, you know, rocking around in? Absolutely not. That's not what this was originally designed for. Uh, this was originally designed for those sort of spur of the moment type of situations or just the convenience of having some extra gear to go with your rifle uh, if the need requires. Uh, now, there is one other thing that I do want to mention. If you want to upgrade the strap 
the stabilization strap that goes around your waist, uh, which, which is already great. It can be adjusted very easily. But if you want to upgrade that to be, uh, you know, a little more stabilization, a little more stretchiness, our back strap is compatible. All you have to do is remove their original strap that is included. Take our back strip that is not included. Attach that. And you're good to go. Another tip and something that I've been doing, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not necessarily wanting to run this or I'm anticipating running this, uh, what I actually do is loop a knot, go ahead and buckle it. So now that's kind of out of the way. And then all I do is sling this and it is going to flop around a little more, but then I don't have to worry about real quickly trying to put this thing on. I could just quickly sling it and have some stuff, push it out of the way shoot, when I need my magazines, I can bring it to the front, push it back to the back, and I'm set. So if this is a product that may complement your first rifle or rifles you already have, or just give you a little bit more convenience compared to other equipment out there, definitely check it out. And if you have any other questions for us, go ahead and email us at team at t-rex-arms.com. Stand by. 0.49. Single headshot, high ready, stand by. 0.74. 180 turn, or excuse me, 90 degree turn, one headshot, stand by. 1.10, 90 degree turn, stand by. 1.41, 180, turn, five rounds body. Dot oh two, very good. Five far left. This will be double feed, transition to pistol, five far left. That's it. Copy. Are you ready? Ready. Stand by.
go ahead and write down below 1C. And then three Charlies on this one. Nine point four. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, but it was just like a second. Yeah, it, took a, it took some time. Yeah, but <laughs> honestly, it'll probably make up for it at multiple points. Uh, Five, six, seven, three. Thanks. Uh, one. One, two, three, four, five. That is well it's out. well out. So what you just watched is one of the rifle standards that we're working on that we're gonna be publishing over at T-Rex Arms. This will be happening in the near future. We'll have a few different uh, variations and versions and also be explaining why the strings of fire are the way they are. And then we will be demonstrating them with a wide variety of equipment, rifles, gear, old school kind of gear and then of course high speed cool stuff so if you want to check those out definitely stay tuned over at our website and hope you enjoyed this video Some of you will recognize this rifle, and if you do, we can be friends. This is a Modern Warfare 2 clone. Uh, this is a, what I have here is a Mega Arms FDE lower grip stock as per the proper clone. An EOTech EXPS2, or it's the, uh, the XPS2, the XPS3. And then I have the old school arms rail. Uh, this thing's pretty cool because you can throw it onto a gun that has the uh, the delta ring, you can just, it's basically a drop-in rail that attaches to the upper receiver that gives you uh, more or less some free float capability. It is big, bulky, and kind of heavy, and not the most uh, uh, ergonomic, we'll just say. Uh, but this gun actually shoots really good. Uh, we just filmed a little YouTube video, and the kit that we are also using is pretty old school. Uh, this is a, this is a plate carrier that is made nowadays, but is a larger Eagle MMAC with old school pouches on them. You can find these on eBay, the, S the SBC, um, the Eagle, Tan, early GWAT uh, mag pouches. You can find those for nothing on eBay. So I've got those everywhere, radio pouches, uh, LBT double pistol for the M9, some weird leg rig thing. Don't ask why, it, it, you know, like, it's kind of cool, but d don't ask. And then a Safari Land for the M9 with the old Insight M3X. So we're running some more traditional equipment and showing people that it can still be run. And, uh, but this one right here, this is the real, the real cat's meow, as they say. If you are someone who's been using placards as your chest rig option, and now you're looking into buying an actual chest rig and you're going to eBay, which is my favorite place to buy stuff because there's stuff that's discontinued, stuff that's not made anymore, and just you can get stuff at a good deal. I wanna talk about one chest rig in particular that you're gonna see surfacing on there pretty often and just this overall style of chest rig. So this is a Eagle fill in the blank model number. They have tons of letters and names, but essentially what you have with this chest rig is four magazine pouches in the front, Molly on the sides, zipper, and it's usually an H harness. And you're gonna see chest rigs from LBT, Eagle, and there's another company that I'm not thinking of right now who's making chest rigs in that same style. Now, this is sort of an older school kind of a loadout. There's not a lot of people making chest rigs in this format right here anymore, but you can find lots of them on eBay. And I do like them for a few reasons. So this guy right here, 
I've got the four mag pouches. They're flapped and they're buckled, which is something you don't see a whole lot anymore. There's three rows of Molly on each side. So there's room to fit a two row radio pouch, a one row something, multi-tool pouch, you know, whatever it is. And then this is a Blue Force Gear GP pouch that can fit just all kinds of crap you wanna put in there. Now, typically speaking on the inside or on the back side of these older school chest rigs, you have map pockets. And in this case, because this is zippered down the center, I have two different map pockets. So on this side, I can have my, you know, uh, maps that I go get custom made and printed off online, my compasses, I can throw other crap in there provided it is flat because this is sitting directly against my body. On this other side, what I found, and this is pretty uh, nifty actually, is one of these little uh, mini DACA pouches fits right inside. So it can keep all of your batteries and everything else waterproof from your sweat and everything off of your body. And as far as comfort goes, it's not too bad. Now, another thing to uh, take into consideration, especially if you're a skinny guy like me, a lot of these chest rigs, especially this one that I got, uh, the H harness and the just the overall harness itself is massive. It's huge. Like the H was down here at like the tightest that I could get. It just didn't work very well. So what I did is I went ahead and retrofitted it into an X harness. So I have some shock cord to kind of keep it together here at the top. And then I just moved the attachments over here. And then I took the H and kind of wrapped it around and taped it. So if I want to use it again, I can. It's just Velcro. Uh, so if you are buying older chest rigs online, be prepared to make some adjustments and modification if you want to uh, modernize it or just make it fit you a little bit better. Uh, then I added the uh, T-Rex Arms back strap uh, onto the back. So I removed the one that comes with that. So basically what, what I have is a four mag chest rig with more stuffs. That is after adding these pouches, more of a standalone rig with the weight going all the way. You know, it's not all centered in the front of my body. It's actually like distributed a little more effectively. Backstrap could be a little bit tighter. This is basically what you're, uh, you're looking at. If you want to get out of it really fast, there's the zipper in the front. Not a lot of people are making zipper chest rigs anymore. Uh, there's a couple companies that sold do. I think First Spear has a, they've got one that's like all blank Molly and stuff. Um, but the zippers allow you to, you know, take it off fairly easily and or put it on fairly easily. And it is going to look something like this right here. So as far as chest rigs, if you are looking for something that is a little larger, I think I bought this for $170, something like that on eBay. Uh, then with the pouches and everything on there, it's probably at like 240, uh, maybe 250 bucks. Um, this is something that you can get if you're willing to shop around a little bit, snoop around, and also um, do a little bit of DIYing yourself. And uh, there's some pretty cool stuff on eBay. So check it out. If you're shopping around on eBay for chest rigs, which I've said before, it's my favorite place to go to buy things, especially last year when everyone else was out of stock, but eBay had all kinds of cool stuff. This is a old Diamondback Battle Lab chest rig. This is like 2000, I wanna say it's 2006 to like 2008, somewhere in there, uh, early 2000s. And this was one of the first like little bitty, tiny chest rig kind of options out there. And I uh, found this one on eBay. I think it was like $140, something like that. I was bidding against a dude, I won. And uh, so this is the kind of thing you can go and get, even though it's older, it's the kind of thing you can get for not a lot of money on eBay versus going and trying to buy like the latest and greatest, like hype beast, crazy chest rig stuff out there. So what this is, is this is a four mag um, mini chest rig. It's actually pretty small, all things considered. Uh, radio pouch is dedicated here in the front. Uh, two small uh, tool or pistol pouches attached to the radio. A longer sort of multi-tool, uh, you know, extendo clip, you know, pouch right here that's flapped. And then there's Molly on the front, which in this case, this guy has three, I want to say these are Paraclete, three GP or magazine flat pouches. So I could run three more magazines or all my other stuff, my batteries, my medical, you know, my whatevers. Um, the straps on this are not great. They're not, you know, padded or super comfortable or anything like that. Uh, there's a lot of excess that I haven't trimmed yet as far as setting this up to me. The buckles are not at all swift clip. This is way before swift clip or chasm buckles. So if you are buying older chest rigs, just know that uh, the tabs here on the side are going to be pretty hard uh, to retrofit to an actual like traditional buckle. If you want to use something like our back strap or you want to clip it into a plate carrier or whatever, uh, you may not be able to do that with these older, larger buckles. Uh, so this is basically what this looks like. So it is an X harness.
Then the strap comes around, which I actually think I've got this one adjusted pretty well. This should be a little higher, but we're going to put this on with a plate carrier as well. I think I loosen it slightly. We're going to do this with a, a plate carrier and show you kind of what that looks like. This is actually pretty small though, uh, compared for, for a four mag chest rig. Uh, they dumped the sides. You know, there's not a bunch of molly over here, over here, uh, but this is basically what it looks like. So I can have all my rubbish here in the front, whatever that happens to be. I can have my radio, my four magazines. The other thing to understand about these older chest rigs though is uh, most of these were designed with steel mags in mind, not P mags. This is probably the worst chest rig that I've played with uh, trying to insert a P mag uh, just with how tight, because you can see how small this thing is, how tight they sewed everything. Uh, so these are all steel mags, because the P mag is not really going to work with this rig. Uh, they have this uh, this crazy webbing uh, along the sides, and you just can't fit all the ridges and everything on a P mag into one of these. So if you are buying retro, like vintage, early 2000s G watt type gear, that's something to understand. So this rig is going to have to have steel mags. Inserting this is probably going to be a pain. Nope, I got it. That's pretty good. Uh, they also have a rubbery material, a non-slip material inside the mag pouches as well. Uh, so again, if you're combining that with the polymer, not great. Uh, but that's what this looks like, just like this. And now let's try it on top of, and I want to show you guys kind of what it looks like on top of a plate carrier. So let's say I've got my, you know, $100, $140 eBay chest rig. And then I have my $190 AC one, because then I got my plates in it, so that could be that could be anything, right? What, what I have in there, and then I take this guy, I'm gonna have to loosen this, I think, maybe not. Send this around. This is what it looks like. It actually feels pretty good. The back strap is going down and actually touching my back and is not touching the plate carrier. Um, but as you can see, this isn't bad. Now this does not have Velcro underneath to adhere to my plate carrier. Uh, there's some Velcro back here uh, for the radio to you know, set the, the little tab on top to retain it. Um, but this is what something can look like if you are on a budget and you're willing to go buy some different stuff and kind of mishmash it together, um, you can get something like this. The straps are just fine running over the top of the AC-1 and uh, everything's actually in place. It's actually pretty dope and it's pretty small considering all, all of what you're getting. It's not like running all the way back to here or anything. So I can still get to my cummerbund and uh, it's actually, it's actually kind of rad. It's better than I thought it'd be. So yeah, old chest rig on top of a new minimalist carrier. This is probably one of the most expensive chest rigs you can buy right now. If you're looking for something that isn't a placard or something that you're running as a chest rig. This is the Cry AVS detachable chest rig. Now, normally this can be used with your AVS uh, plate carrier, your massive, you know, direct action, you know, whatever. And the format for it are four double mag pouches in the front, two large GP pouches on the sides and some internal stuff going on. But they also designed this to work as a chest rig once you add the yoke, yoke uh, to the actual chest rig. So it's basically a enhanced load bearing uh, H harness, X harness kind of a thing. So I'm gonna show you guys roughly how this is put on. This is zippered in the front. So it is easiest uh, to use the zippers. So one side goes in, okay, geez. I'm already all tangled up in it. Yeah. There we go, just like that, like a little vest. And then we find our zippers. Zippers first. Uh, zipper, it zips from the top. Then we take the, there's this this front plate right here that for your ATAC and your, your, uh, your flags and your IED panels and stuff like that. But you can also hold, there's a strapping back here that can actually hold one armor plate which is kind of fun. Uh, so then I'm gonna take this little guy, I'm gonna route him through here. So as you can see, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a system to get into. Buckle that there, and then take the chest strap, then buckle that, and there, we're done. We got our chest rig, our, our chest rig all set up. Um, it's actually pretty cool, but the problem is the detachable chest rig itself is like $450. 
And then this guy right here is 150 bucks. So you're looking at $600 to set this up. Um, there's there's no way you're gonna be changing any of the pouches. It's all built in, it's all sewn together. Not necessarily a problem. Uh, there are these pistol pockets on the inside. I have a Glock right here, as Cry intended. There's another one on this side for those of you who are lefties. Uh, but this is basically what you've got going on. I have a very small a T Rex back strap back here uh, to function as the uh, the piece to kind of hold it all together uh, back there. And uh, this is what it looks like. And it's huge and it's giant. Uh, but it does allow you to carry quite a bit of equipment if you're willing to spend the money. It has this sucker right here, which is pretty cool. Most chest rigs don't have something like this built in. There's a couple people now that are now uh, making them. So if you do want something that's all like attackable and all that good stuff, um, you've got it. Uh, to remove the chest rig, undo that, zipper, button. There might be an easier way to take this off. Uh, this is the easiest way that I found so far. Uh, but on the inside of the ABS detachable chest rig, or whatever they call it, uh, you'll see that they have this plate pocket right here that will hold a standard sappy plate. And then you can adjust this uh, the, this portion right here for the height of the plate and you know set it all up. And then if you want to actually fold the front, sort of front plate of all that molly and stuff away, you can actually tuck that into there and kind of get rid of it. Uh, but it doesn't appear that this part is actually detachable. It is permanently kind of part of the rig. Uh, so I believe you could attach this um, you could take the front part of the chest rig and attach that into an ABS pack and then have it still buckle down here. And then you can sort of run a plate in the ABS pack. It's not great, but you can. And then run a plate in the chest rig and then have a plate carrier using a backpack and a chest rig. So kind of cool. Yes, is it as optimal as a plate carrier? No, in my opinion, it's not. Uh, there's the pistol pocket right there uh, set up. There's another one on this side. How useful are they? You tell me. I probably wouldn't use it, but I could find something. It is open on the bottom, so I guess you could run a suppressed pistol. That would that would actually, you know what? I take that back. If you're running a suppressed pistol with this rig, that makes a lot of sense um, because uh, then it doesn't matter what length suppressor is. You can have that right here and then have all of your stuff. That could be kind of cool if you're running a suppressor. Uh, but this chest rig here, it's one of the more sort of uh, Gucci options out there. It's more like a, a, a harness, a chest rig harness uh, for all of the uh, capability and weight it has. And then as you can see, the yolk, 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 uh, is quite uh, built as uh, I guess it should be. A drag handle, don't know if I would actually wanna be drugged by that, but there is a drag handle on there. You could set the height of the chest rig with Velcro right here. Uh, there's uh, tabs for your one wrap, for your PTTs and your hydration and all that good stuff. And uh, so yeah, pretty interesting chest rig. I will probably not be using it a whole lot. And uh, this one actually came from uh, the set of Suicide Squad, which is fun. Um, some of the, I guess the SEAL team in that movie were using these. So uh, so yeah, there's that. The Cry ABS chest rig and harness as one unit for around 600 bucks. Before minimalist plate carriers were a thing or turned into a big thing, there were a number of companies that were already making them in the early 2000s. And this is one of those companies that was making some little minimalist ones at the time. This one's a little bit more modernized with the uh, Hank material and some other stuff like that. Uh, but this is the LBT uh, ULW, I think is what it's called. Uh, it's their ultra low vis uh, plate carrier. And basically the format for it is you have, and this is pretty much most of the low vis plate carriers on the market, the old ones and, and the current ones. You have an elastic cummerbund because it's comfortable and it's slim. It's just gonna Velcro straight into the rear. The shoulder pads on this particular plate carrier actually aren't built into the carrier. They are, I'll remove the flag patch. I'll put it back on here in a minute. But you actually adjust the height of the carrier by moving these. Now that can be great, but at the same time, it can create some, uh, some issues in that the <laughs> front plate, you know, pocket uh, is not actually permanently attached uh, to the rear pocket. So you can get some of this sort of a weird, you know, stuff going on as you're trying to put the rig on because it's not attached here at the top. It's attached uh, anywhere on the rig, you know, based on, you know, how tight you actually want the setup to be. The belt, the, uh, the plate uh, cummerbund thingy is going to Velcro on the front like any other like normal plate carrier nowadays or most of the plate carriers out there. And then if I do want to run some form of ID, I am just going to be Velcroing that straight to the front on all of that. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on, show you guys how low vis it is. And because of how this plate carrier works, it's actually easier to 
dump the cummerbund on both sides. See that? That's what happens with this style of play character. Not necessarily bad, but uh, it is definitely a, a thing. And I picked this guy up for, these are on eBay. I picked this one up on eBay for like $80 or something. These are pretty cheap. They're cheap, but they don't have a lot of capability. You're not gonna run a ton of ammo off of it or anything, and that's not what it was intended for. So this is what it looks like. I have size small sappy plates on this guy. It's absolutely tiny. It is only the size of the plate, and uh, it's not bad. And it's pretty comfortable. The uh, shoulder straps, this is why this is all like low vis. Uh, they're super skinny, so they won't print through your, you know, shirts and stuff like that, which is pretty nice. Um, but are you going to put a bunch of, you know, ammo and gear and radios and stuff on this? Uh, the answer is no, probably not. You are just going to run this as is with belt, pistol, bag, whatever. Uh, but there are some really cool uh, ultra low vis plate carriers out there, such as this one. Uh, if that is something that you're looking for. Do I prefer having something like the AC-1 that does the same thing, but also gives me a little more capability? A little bulkier in the shoulders. Yes, I would rather have that. But if you need something that's even more low vis, like as possible, that gives you hard plate, you know, the ability to run hard plates, uh, this is one of those options out there. LBT still makes these. You can also find them on eBay. And uh, it's pretty cool. It's actually pretty rad. Uh, the cover bond is also a double layer. So it is sturdy. I've seen some companies try to get away with just running uh, one one uh, thickness of elastic, and that's not it's not great. Kind of moves all over the place. Uh, but they're doing a double, which is great. You're gonna velcro that to the front, put all your stuff on on top, and you're set. Everyone's familiar with placards for plate carriers. Whether you're running something that clips into chasm buckles or you're running something like the S-Tac placard that we have on our website with the cummerbund simply velcroing on top to secure the magazines to you while you're using them. Now I have become, over the past, oh geez, I don't know, uh, year or so, I've become a little more interested in adapting full chest rigs to the front of my slick armor. Now you can obviously wear a chest rig over your slick armor with the harness attached, the normal H harness, you know, X harness, whatever. That works pretty well. But if you want to remove some of that unnecessary webbing, then you use the chasm buckles. So on this particular chest rig, this is from ATS. It's a nice little one, the slim line. It has chasm compatible buckles. I had to bolt cutter off the, uh, the male chasm buckles here on the side to add female uh, in order to get to this product, but uh, more on that later. Or you can run with another one of our favorites, the Mayflower Velocity UW Gen 4 something rather big name. Uh, holds four magazines, two GP pouches on the side, which you could load up with more ammo, and a bunch of stuff on the front. So, how do we adapt the chest rig to something like the AC-1 or another plate carrier on the market? Well, first off, we're going to rip off our existing placard, the S-TAC. We have the buckles in place. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start with the slim line. I'm going to remove the Velcro on the back. This is great. This. This amount of Velcro that they have back here to attach to a plate carrier is awesome. The, the Velocity one only has a small panel, which kind of sucks. It works, it does the same thing. It just flops on the bottom and stuff. This is great. This is a lot of lovely real estate. We're going to take the buckles. Buckle. Usually it's easier to do this with the Velcro in place. Something to think about. All right, that's Velcroed to the back. Now the problem with mounting a chest rig to a plate carrier like this is you're going to have all this flop on the, the wings of it, the sides of it, whether you've got your radio, your GP pouches, your medical. Uh, in this case, I have a uh, expandable pocket on the inside of the chest rig. I can put a radio in uh, or medical or a water bottle, and then I have multi-tools on the exterior. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our Y-strap adapter for our back strap, these little guys right here, and these are going to grab both ends of the chest rig, top and bottom, and pull them tight into the side of the plate carrier. We're going to open the rear flap of our AC-1, and I highly recommend if you're if you're going with this method of, of equipment, I recommend you have a plate carrier that has a closable flap to keep the back strap secured. So, just like that, this ain't going nowhere now. We're going to go ahead and permanently attach one side. And this may need to be tightened down quite a bit more. Eh, maybe not. Clip in top and bottom like so. Boom. 
actually going to move this more to the center. Keep that Velcroed. And then, and this is where you may have to adjust the back strap underneath the uh, rear flap to fit properly. Bring the cummerbund around, bring the Y adapter, clip the bottom buckle, top buckle, and as you can see, that's pulling this whole thing tight along the top and the bottom uh, versus running a, the normal chest rig back strap to only the top or only the bottom where one side is then going to flop around and whatnot. So as you can see, all this is being pulled tight into the chest rig. I would uh, optimally tighten up the back strap a little bit more, but this is what the Y-strap adapter can do uh, to attaching a chest rig to your uh, plate carrier. So I've got four mags, a little bit more than the traditional three that all the placards have out there. Got some stuff here, got some stuff here. I still have my elastic cummerbund. My radio is attached to that, so I can add something else to here. So I can really increase my uh, the equipment that I can carry on this plate carrier pretty easily with just a couple little attachments. So if you're interested in running a chest rig on your plate carrier, such as this Mayflower, which is another one of my favorites, holds a little bit more than this one right here. It's also twice as expensive. Um, definitely check out our Y-strap adapter. You'll just be running it underneath the back, pa the back panel for the AC-1, and that's gonna keep everything nice and tight to the body. All 12, it's 2C, and one over here. Seventy-four, same time. All on target. Two, one D, three C. Oh no! That was already there. All on target. Five C, one D. All floating to the left. All on target. Two Charlie.
scored. What's going on with us? Um, it's uh. Movement. Forward grip with our left hand. It's because we suck. No, oh, that would be it. No, we're not gripping with our left hand right now. Taking your rig off, if you're using a combination of elastic cummerbund and our Y-strap backstrap adapter to keep the chest ring tight to the body, it's pretty simple. We're gonna detach from one side. So I pull out my chest rig, cummerbund. So one side will be open. This side will remain shut. And it's literally as easy as that. I keep one side constantly affixed just makes everything a little easier. And then when I go to put it back on, elastic cover bundle go first, Y strap second, and I'm done. Fourteen, forty-eight. Fourteen, what did I guess? Thirteen? Same time. Pretty much. One early. One. One. Three charge so. Okay, they thought. Fourteen sixty-eight. It's wobbly. <laughs> really? Yeah. One Charlie. Yeah, we're good. Mm -hmm. So we're at the 50, using the same three targets we were just shooting. This is uh, two headshots from lower high ready. We're gonna do each of them, individual uh, time standards, and then you add it all up for your accommodative. The best though is two headshots under two seconds. Perfect, which is freaking hard. Um, you can run magnification or not. Uh, I'm gonna run my first one on 1X. I'll and then I'll, I'll do 3X, then I'll do 6X. Stand by. Oof, that follow up was nasty. I think we're good. No, 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 we're good. These are both in. On 6X. <laughs> no, 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 no. The follow up was perfect. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was here. And then one was like a pie on 1X. Oh, that's uh, one was low. It was probably. Maybe both of them. That did not oh. break. Yeah. So that's a mic. Ah. It didn't quite break it. Well, but no magnification. That's not bad. I'll, I'll take it. Bad. Yeah, I'm consistently high. I know that this was high. This was starting with it. Yep. And I called this too. I felt rushed after I threw that magnifier over it. Nothing. I sent them both high. I know. What a shame. Two, four, two. One high left, uh, one left. Three, seven, four. Two, 
two five. Sorry, Chad. Two five four. Those both felt good. Not gonna say it's the can. I like You're this. High. I like this column. I agree. Oh wait. I like this column, but those are high. One, two, three. Yeah, like your four, headshots five. are good. Those are good. That's the hardest. One. And you did that in two five. You're under three. I got mine no, in under three. Yeah. There's like two three somewhere. I have one out or no two out. So same. Oh wait. Two. Do you think you threw one? I think that's from here. And uh, I. Oh okay. I think it was right here. I felt my optic is kind of. Yeah. Is that optic hard to work with? At um. Yards with against this? this dark berm, yeah. yeah. Against that with the, into the shadow, yeah. It's... So over the past year, you've probably noticed that we're very interested in chest rigs, or at least very interested in helping people buy chest rigs to complement whatever plate carrier they have. Because last year and the year before, that was really the year of the plate carrier, and I think now we're going to be moving into more people wanting better ways of carrying gear and stuff, either with a plate carrier or without. So this is an Eagle chest rig that I picked up on eBay for $130. I went and sniped it last week, and I'm wearing this on top of an AC-1. Now this is one of my favorite like gear configurations or recommendations to people right now because instead of having one large plate carrier like an old Eagle or an AVS or something that's just fully kitted to the gills, where you can only use that you know, the load bearing capability or the, the, the load bearing gear capability while wearing the armor. I have the ability to wear this, this chest rig with my armor, chest rig by itself or armor by itself in like a covert little biz, whatever fashion. So I have the ability to do both and I really like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this off and kind of show you what's going on. But all I had to do to this chest rig to kind of get it to work is retrofit, because I really like our back strap, obviously, because it's got some stretch to it. Uh, retrofit a buckle to one of the pieces of molly actually on this pouch, but I could have also done it on the molly on the uh, chest rig itself. I actually moved it up a little bit because I was planning on wearing this with a plate carrier, so that keeps the strap actually like on the carrier itself. And then one buckle here, and I'm set. So I kind of modernized the chest rig a little bit, uh, put away the old strap, the old buckle, and I'm good to go. Now this chest rig is particularly based because these are double rifle mag pouches. So this guy will hold eight rifle magazines as opposed to the standard three or even four. Um, so I've got two, two, and two. Radio in this one, chem, light. I can have batteries, headlamp, flashlight, multi-tool, two pistol mags. Uh, this, for whatever reason, came with these two cheapo Condor pouches on the sides, which I'll probably get rid of. But at the end of the day, it's a pouch. You can hold things. That's pretty rad. That's pretty cool. Um, so you can have your, medic, your, you know, your medical, uh, your additional batteries. Um, you could run water here, still have four magazines. So it gives you a lot of options. And then if you want to have body armor, that's when you have something like this that's slick that you can wear the chest rig on top of. Because I'll tell you right now, wearing a chest rig on top of a, uh, like a larger plate carrier, not as conducive. Um, that's where having like a little slick vest like this that's you know a little bit more minimal um, is nice. But then if I want to wear this chest rig without the armor, for whatever reason, Make sure I get the X right. Back strap I'll need to tighten up. In fact, uh, it probably needs to be quite a bit tighter. Oh, actually no, I think we'll be good. Now I can run around with the chest rig on its own without the armor. So I have lots of options with this particular setup right here. And this was not expensive at all. You can get the AC-1 for $190, and then whatever armor you want to go in there. And then you can go find older style chest rigs like this on eBay for anywhere from 100 to 200 bucks. Like this is a pretty hard to beat setup. It gives you a lot of options. You're not you know, set with just one. Um, you can also carry a lot more gear than some of the more popular placards converted into chest rigs, which I've never been a fan of, and I still am not. Uh, something like this just rides a lot better. Um, especially with something like the back strap that has a little bit of stretch to it. So if you are looking for sort of a, uh, a one kit does all, which doesn't actually exist, but you know, if you want to try to get close to that, um, I think this right here is going to do that for you. Um, otherwise you may have to buy two different plate carriers uh, and plus a chest rig, plus a placard, and that starts to get pretty expensive. So if you're on a budget, this is something to consider.
Two Alphas, two Charlie. Four Alphas, Charlie. Mike, four Alphas. Okay. All right. I just know it. I know. I know. I went there. I know. It was out. Oh my gosh! I suck. That's what this tells me. Uh, Eleven. One out. One out. Out. Oh. Well, two technically. Um. And this is where I missed. It was just over here. If you're rocking a strange or unique pistol, something that maybe isn't supported by modern holster companies, you know, such as T-Rex Arms or, you know, other companies out there, uh, or even, you know, old, old Safari Land holsters just don't exist for it. I have a Surefire adapter on here with a X300 Ultra. Uh, you can't really get a holster of this configuration. But there is a holster out there that can serve your needs, provided you run an X300. This is our the new version of the Ragnarok SD. This thing is sick. They updated it, made it a little better, made it harder to like tip your pistol forward. It's more secure in the holster. The one before was already really good, but they made it even better. And as you can see, with this rather unconventional pistol by today's standards, um, it's good to go. Yep. So, clip that into my QLS on my belt. Uh, this is normally the belt that I use for my Glock 34 Ragnarok. It's running Glock stuff, but uh, it draws just like an ordinary holster. Holsters like one too. You want to index on the light first, obviously. Slide on in. As far as like, let's go ahead and unload the pistol. Do a verification. All right, so with a lot of force, without a suppressor, but everything else, it's not going anywhere. Full sprints running all around. For a open front holster, it is not bad. Especially if you're running something unconventional and weird, such as this guy. Check it out, especially if you're running a suppressor. This gun just moves so much. Felt a little better, gripped a little tighter. My double action shot. There, it's high, it's high. I know what we're gonna do, we're gonna fix that. I'm gonna go back to 25. You look fine, subpar at best. Uh, three A's. Nice. Check it. One Delta. One Charlie. One Delta. One Charlie. Where's your other one? One, two, three, four. Might have thrown it. Okay. I was just calling. This guy, I should run, honestly should slow down and run the ACOG on the move. Delta, two Charlie, Delta Alpha. Oh, Delta.
Just high. High. Hit! Hit. Definitely be better. Wasn't pulling the stock into my shoulder bone. Alright, so that's the one, two, three, four drill using our new Beretta sidecar with the M9A3, which is actually my first time shooting it. So uh, I did some test rounds earlier and then this is my first like drill. Uh, so we have an Alpha Charlie on this side. Double action, first shot, it was probably this guy. I, I generally pull my, for whatever reason, my double action shot's a little high. And then we have two Alphas right here. And that was in a 524, not great, but not ghastly, not horrible, with a gun that I never trained with. So, yeah. So M9 sidecars are now available. They will obviously fit the new M9A3 and A4 models. But if you're running a more traditional Bruce Willis-esque original M9, or even like the M9A1, uh, that will fit as well. You are gonna need to tighten the screws a little bit more because this is molded around having the Picatinny rail on the A1, the A3, and whatnot. So if you're running a old school John McClane uh, M9, uh, you're gonna you're gonna need to tighten this down a little bit, but it will accept new and older M9s, which is great. And then if you decide, you know what, I want to add some extra spice to my gun, I want to make it uh, the size of a microwave and pretend like a Mojo, then you can throw an X300 on here and you can get the X300 uh, Beretta sidecar, and you are gonna be squared away and good to go. Uh, again, uh, retention is adjustable here at the trigger guard. Uh, this has an X300 UA which uh, the B fits a little better typically in holsters than the A model will. And plus this is wobbling around a little bit on this gun. So uh, I should slap a B on there. But uh, as you can see, fits anyway. Got my extra mag. You can take any of the standard sidecar attachments and accessories, rifle mag, subgun mag. Just imagine, you could have M9 traditional with an MP5 mag carrier for the true John McClane experience. So. These are available now if you are someone who runs an M9 or you just want to toy around with one uh, or maybe you're shooting USPSA with one now that they're like in and cool, uh, definitely check out the sidecar. So I've got a pretty basic rifle here. Uh, well, I say basic in that it's not super modernized, but this is essentially a Colt 6920 with a Centurion free float rail added. So it's still got that nice classic FSP. We've got a Surefire Mini on here because I'm, uh, I'm testing something out. And then I have an EOTech EXPS3 and the new G45 Magnifier 5X. Uh, still playing with it. It's pretty cool. But uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's the greatest thing you know ever yet. Uh, but what we're doing right now is from this vehicle, we are engaging two rounds, two hits on steel. So it's not just one hit and then move on. Like we have to get two repeated hits. On this piece of steel here at about 200 meters. Move to the front of the vehicle, brace on it as best as we can, 
and then engage another piece of C-zone steel, so it's very small, it's actually smaller, reduced C-zone, it's not even the size of a C-zone, at 300. Then we have a larger one at like 350, but we're not gonna shoot that because it's, it's massive. And uh, we're gonna do this a couple times, and we're gonna see what happens. ALG trigger, just a pretty basic gun, and we're gonna be running this magnifier. Let's go. That's on instant. Why do I always grab the wrong timer? That's what I want to know. All right, so not too bad. One for one on the closer steel. Shooting suppressed, timer's not showing up, but that's good. That means this gun's pretty quiet. 14.5 of the little shorty suppressor. Still pretty wieldy. Not bad, let's do it again. Stand by. really bad trigger management not too bad it is pretty cool not gonna lie but we're gonna have to try it out to 500 you know because one X is 100 meters so they say dreadful. I suck. <laughs> Flat mag pouches. <laughs> Didn't see the second target well enough. Three alphas. I also shot at the exact same speed, which in this case worked. Oh, well it actually worked all across the board. It did not feel very good though. I'm gonna count that as a failure. That was a 395 all A's, but uh, didn't feel good. It did not, it was not good. That was pretty good. Uh, didn't, didn't see the third shot there. Uh, looked at these good, looked at him good, A's, 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 A's. but uh, didn't see the third, but all right, it's a 433, yeah, that's not bad, not bad, but it could, it could be better. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, running my carry gun, because, you know, that's the thing I do sometimes, and a sidecar, two ways on him, and that was on uh, the 114, not great, two Charlies that really suck, two A's, two A's on him, but we're only working like 
five yards to get that reload in. But I had my reload done, like, about here. All with the sidecar. And a five something. Although you don't care about the time, you'll say it sped up anyway. Grip with the left hand was not great. But that's a double build drill from the sidecar. That's an out. That's a Charlie. That's on the line. Decently happy with that. And a 456. So the first six rounds, I haven't done this in a while. 206, so outside of two from concealment. So I suck. And then uh, a 15 reload, not great. Uh, twos, twos, one eights, one nines. But seven yards, I'll take it. It could always use work, but I don't shoot build drills all the time. Like some people. That's what happens when you don't shoot pistol for months. You lose your edge. All right, paper. Let's see if these were at least okay. A's. Took my time though. Woo. All floating right, so moving right. Two A's Charlie. Two A's Charlie. <coughs> Two A's Charlie on the line. Like four makeups on that guy. <laughs> 50 yards, 30, 90. 91, but you guys don't care because this will sit sped up using a sidecar for my EDC gun. Two Charlies on the left, Delta on the left, two A's. Looks like that's an 838. May not have recorded one shot though. It held low. Uh, oh yeah, no, I was actually gonna swap. Held low on that. Magnifier. You took that was in an 868. All right. Let's check it out. It was in an 864, so about the same time. So what we're doing is we're shooting standing at 100 meters. Now I'm shooting three C zone, well three USPSA targets. And something I've been thinking quite a bit about is when people are running like marksmanship drills at 150, what's more important? Drilling all A's in a slow time or getting quality hits, decent hits in a fast amount of time? Now I think it's fairly subjective. I don't think one is neither necessarily better than the other. But what I like about this is we're gonna do hit factor scoring. So the amount of points I generate with my hits, one Delta, three Charlie, five A, gets divided by my time, and that will determine if I suck. So if I shoot this really fast and have a couple Charlies, that may be better than shooting it really slow and having all A's. So we're gonna do this a lot more this year with different guns. So ACOG first, looks like uh, the entire thing is high. Um, may have, I called two left, which is probably these. And that was in a, I can't remember the time standard, but what I shot that in. I could have definitely gone faster. We have a mic, unless that's, that's not two, that's one. So we have a mic pro probably up here. This is EOTech Unmagnified. 
disregard the three uh, nine mil rounds. We've got four alphas and a headshot, which will count for this. Normally I don't count heads unless I aim for them, but based on what this is, we'll count it. So that's some pretty good points. Uh, a Bravo, that's a Charlie now. So that's like, that's three. So that's, uh, what's that, 23 divided by eight. Uh, magnifier, magnifier is not zero to the optic though. Um, two ways, the windage is, it sh there shouldn't be issues uh, uh, this great. That's all me sucking. So a Charlie, a Delta, two A's, and an out. So what I can learn from this is I need to take my time. Maybe I need to think about how my optics are zeroed or not zeroed, or my suppressor not being zeroed to that gun. I used a different suppressor originally. Uh, a Mini, I think. No, it was a different RC2. So like those are not gonna pair up exactly, uh, but the 100 meter is great. And then I'm gonna be running this and dividing my hits, my points by my time, instead of just doing this. Cause yeah, I can do that if I just take forever, but that also means I suck. So which do you think is more important? Going all A zones at 100 meters or maybe shooting a little faster, having a couple Charlies, you know, combat effective as they say, which would be a higher level of skill for someone if they're striving for marksmanship? That's the question. And y'all can comment below. No, that sounded dumb saying that, but you get the point. Feel pretty good about that. Held low. 638 standing. Healing. I hate kneeling. I should honestly go to here, recoil into my leg. Be better. Uh, no time. Definitely zero to your suppressor. I zeroed this to a different RC2 and uh, I held here. Huh. Okay. That was standing. This was kneeling a little better, although scattered. That's my furthest point. That's horrible. In, in, in body, but this is prone. Okay, that's a little, that's a little better. <laughs> So maybe, I, no, I held here. You know what? I think it's just my standing. I think, I think it's just my standing. I think I just suck at 100 meters standing. But we'll fix that. We'll fix that. So that means this is 23 points divided by 672. What's 23 divided by 6? It's like 3.8 hit back. Second to last was out. It's like left, maybe left delta. Kind of doubt it. A 613. Kind of favored right edge. I don't like that either. Kneeling just sucks, okay? Like, let's, uh, I prefer standing. Eight, five, four. Yeah, see. We'll see if the hits are better, but. Seven, one, nine. Dang. I held. I felt like I held here. So I had one out that I called three high. The kneeling, yeah, it's all high. I think that's me raise healing the gun upwards as I'm because my prone. That that was my uh, I think I said that was my second to last. Or,
So I've got this rifle that LMT sent me a while ago, and I haven't had a ton of time to shoot it because we have so many guns that we have to shoot for stuff. Um, I want to say this is a 12 and a half, and what I have on here is the battery-powered ACOG, which I think is a, a, a perfect setup for a short-barreled gun. You know, if you're shooting a 14.5 or 16 out to 500, 600 meters or whatever, you may want a little more magnification. But if this is a 300 meter and end gun, or a 400 meter and end gun, then a 4X makes a lot of sense. And I like ACOGs for how light they are, how durable they are, and uh, the glass clarity and the light transmission. It's pretty hard to beat uh, with most of the 1 to 6s on the market. So I feel like this combination right here is pretty legit. We have C-Zone steel out to 500. We're gonna take shots from uh, first one's two, the next one's like 300, the next one's it's a large target, it's at like 350, and then we'll go straight to the 500 and see what happens with this little short gun. Got a little bit of wind, uh, but shouldn't be too much of an issue. Winchester 55 grain, and we'll just see what happens. But this right here, short barrel, a little less magnification, but enough to do PID and get solid hits. Uh, it's, it's a nice combination. So, let's see, we're not like prone, bipodded bags, all that good stuff. We're just gonna seat clamp off of this wood barrier. So, a close target, 200 meters. Hit. Hit. 300. All right, nice, Hit. Just right. Hit. Big boy. Yeah. Long range. So big boy, not a problem. 500. That's a hit. Yeah. That's a load. Hit. That's left. So two hits. I'm out. But for a short barreled gun, not bad. If I was running like a 14.5 or 16, I'd want to, I'd put a one to six or something on there, one to eight, or even one of the maybe newer one to tens. But if you're running a short barrel gun that you're running up close anyway, or you're putting a suppressor and a laser on, I think it's a, a strong contender. Plus you can literally drop it on its head and you know, it'll be all right. So something to think about, something to consider. But the real question is, what is the purpose of your gun? What is the purpose of your carbine? What are you trying to do with it? Maybe you have a dedicated close range gun and then a 14.5 for your this stuff. And that's obviously perfectly reasonable. Um, but it is something to think about as this is a 300, 400 meter gun. Arguably maybe more depending on what ammo you're using. But most people say shorter barrels are going to be uh, not the maximum distance for 5.56 as far as lethality. And that does make sense. So hope that's helpful. Uh, let me know if you agree or disagree. And I might or not care. I might care or not care if you do.